A Gambling Man Written by David Baldacci Read by Eduardo Ballerini and Brittany Presley To Tricia Jackson, a superb publisher and editor, a wonderful person, and one of my dear friends. Chapter One with a new decade looming, Aloysius Archer was on a creaky bus headed west to California to seek as much of a life as someone like him could reasonably expect. A roof over his head, three squares a day, a pint of decent liquor every now and then, and a steady supply of his lucky strikes to keep his mouth supple and amused. And a job. Actually, more of a profession. He needed that right now. It was like seeking water while in a desert. You just required it and didn't care how you got it. Otherwise, he'd be a chump, and there was no future in that. He took off his hat and swiped at his short, dark hair before resettling the fedora into place. Hell, maybe I am shooting for the moon after all, but why not? Archer wasn't yet thirty. After fighting in the Second World War, he'd spent time in prison for a crime of which he was essentially innocent, though the law hadn't recognized such nuance and stuck him behind bars anyway. However, he would have gladly pled guilty to a charge of gross stupidity. It had involved a woman, and Archer just seemed to lose all of his common sense when they were around. He was a little over six-one, and his frame had been hardened first by the army and then by prison, where the strong didn't necessarily survive, but such an attribute certainly improved your chances. He had a serviceable brain, quick enough wits, and a work ethic deep enough to carve a good life somewhere given the chance. Archer was hoping to find that opportunity in a town on the water in California, where he was eager to start his new phase in life under the tutelage of a veteran private eye named Willie Dash. But first he had to get there. And these days, nothing was easy, particularly long-distance travel across a country that was so big it never seemed to end. He looked out of the bus's grimy window and eyed the street-spanning metal sign they were passing under. Reno, the biggest little city in the world. He had no idea what that meant, but it sounded intriguing. They pulled into the bus terminal, and he grabbed from the overhead rack his large brand-new leather satchel. He had on a two-piece tan wool pinstripe suit with a patterned green single Windsor knotted tie, fronting a starched white shirt and topped by his crown-dented fedora with a brown band. Everything else he owned in the world was in the satchel. It wasn't much, but it was a lot more than he'd had when the prison doors had opened not that long ago. He got a recommendation on a place to stay the night from a gal behind the bus counter with blonde hair that wrapped around her neck like a naughty mink stole and mischievous blue eyes to match. She had a curvaceous figure that reminded him of the photo of a swimsuit-clad Ava Gardner he had kept in his helmet during the war. After telling her he was headed to California, she handed him a map, along with a recommendation for where to grab his dinner. My name's Ginger, she said with a broad smile. Maybe I'll see you around town later. He doffed his hat to her, returned the smile, and trudged on, his grin fading to a grimace. He didn't care if she was Ginger Rogers— he was keeping his distance, naughty hair and eyes be damned. You look lost, soldier, said the voice. Archer was outside the depot now, fully immersed in the delicious heat that seeped up from the pavement and gave him a hug. The speaker was a man in his late sixties, straight as a rake, thin as a lathe, with tumbleweed white hair and a fluffy mustache that dipped nearly to his chin. He had on a dark suit that needed a good sponging and a creased black hat with a soiled burgundy band. A silver watch chain spanned his dappled white vest, which covered a sunken chest and belly. Archer put his satchel down on the pavement, pulled a half-full pack of Lucky Strikes from his pocket, struck a match in the bottom of his shoe, and lit the end of the cigarette. He waved the spent match like a sparkler and tossed it down. The man looked so lustfully at his smoke that Archer slid one out and offered it to him. He accepted with gratitude on his features and used a dented chrome lighter to do the honors. They puffed for a bit, each squinting at the other through the spawned, mingled fog of twin luckies. Just in town, replied Archer with a bit of a shiver 
as the sun began its descent after a hard day's labor, and the heat shriveled down into the pavement like a receding flame. The man eyed both the satchel and the bus depot behind and nodded. Can see that. And I'm not lost. Just going to my hotel. Didn't mean geographically. More metaphorically. You sound educated. Or are you just fortunate with how words spill out of your mouth? Time fills your head up if you allow it. Some don't. They just put a lid on and end their life as they begin it. Ignorant as babies. He put out a shaky, thinly veined hand with dark spots here and there. I'm Robert Howells, but my friends and some of my enemies call me Bobby H. And you are? Archer shook his head but said, Why do you want to know? Just making small talk, son. Don't get jumpy on me. I go by Archer. Your first time in Reno? Asked Howells. Archer puffed on his smoke and nodded slowly. Just passing through. On to California, San Fran, Los Angeles. That's where Hollywood is. Most beautiful women in the world. Streets paved with gold. And the water tastes like wine. And none of that is true. Not a bit. Well, maybe the gals. But they ain't free, son. And there goes all my standard conversation right out the window. Fact is, I am heading to California. But it's a place north of Los Angeles according to the Rand McNally. You have a certain look the camera might find interesting. Maybe I'm staring at the next Gary Cooper? I have no interest in being the next Gary Cooper or looking into cameras. I'm not saying I can't act, because I pretty much do every time I open my mouth. What is your ambition, then? Archer finished his smoke and patted it dead on the pavement with the heel of his right wingtip. No offense, Bobby H., but I don't know you and trouble with strangers is not something I'm casting about for. Howells frowned. You seem closer to my age, at least in your lack of adventurous nature. I'll take that as a compliment. Do you know why they call Reno the biggest little city in the world? Archer shook his head. It's because you can get whatever New York or Philadelphia or Boston or even Los Angeles can provide. And what do you think I want? What do most young men want after a war? You fought, I take it? That's nearly five years gone by now. But it was a big war with long legs. We won't be forgetting it any time soon. So what do I want? Archer asked again. A good time with no duties appurtenant thereto. Appurtenant? Now you sound like a lawyer. They run second to dead last in popularity with me to undertakers and it's a long way up from there. Do you wish a good time with no consequences? Archer wondered if the old man was drunk or doped or both. I never assumed there was such a thing. In Reno there is? Well, good for Reno. And what do you get out of telling me that? You don't believe in generosity for generosity's sake? And I don't believe in Santa or pennies from heaven either, ever since age seven. For a young man, you seem old and gray in spirit. I'm getting older every minute I'm standing here gabbing with you. The passion of youth has been smote clean from you, and that's a damn shame, son. Archer lit another lucky and eyed the men, awaiting his next move. It was at least passing the time in the biggest little city on earth. Okay, I can understand your cynicism, but let me make another observation. One that has personal advantages to me. Archer flashed a grin. Now we're getting somewhere. I know you had it in you. Howells fingered his chin. You look like a man able to take care of himself. That doesn't tell me anything I don't already know. Here it is, then. Can you protect others? Asked Howells. Who are we talking about here? We are talking about me. And why do you need protection? asked Archer. I have enemies, as I said. And why do you have enemies? Some folks have them, unfortunately, and I'm one of those folks. So what do you say? I have no interest in making your enemies my enemies, so you have a good day. Archer tipped his hat, turned, and walked off with his satchel. Howells called after him. You would desert an old man in need, soldier? 
Over his shoulder, Archer said, Just wait for a fellow to fall off a truck and he's your man, Bobby H. Chapter 2 In his hotel room, which looked like a shower stall with half-hearted ambition, Archer ditched his hat on the bed, tucked his satchel in the narrow closet with two feeble hangers dangling from the wooden rod, and sat in the one chair by the one window. He parted the faded and frayed curtains and stared out at Reno. It just looked average, maybe a little below that, in fact. Yet maybe it punched above its weight, like he always tried to do. He smoked another Lucky and took a drink from the flask he carried in his jacket pocket. Archer didn't need beautiful women, watery wine, or golden boulevards. He just desired a steady paycheck, something interesting to do with his time, and the small slice of self-respect that came with both. The rye whiskey went down slow and burned deliciously along the way. Thus fortified, he took out the letter typed on sandpaper stationery with the name Willie Dash, Very Private Investigations, imprinted at the top and giving an address and a five-digit phone number in Baytown, California. Included with the letter was the man's business card, stiff and serious-looking, with the same address and telephone information as the letter. A tiny magnifying glass rode right under the business name. Archer liked the effect. He hoped he liked the man behind it. More to the point, he hoped Willie Dash liked him. The missive was in response to one Archer had written to Dash at the advice of Irving Shaw, a state police detective Archer had met while in a place called Poca City, where Archer had served his parole. Shaw and Dash were old friends, and Shaw believed Archer had the makings of a gumshoe. He thought Dash might be a good mentor for him. Archer had mentioned Shaw in the letter because he hoped it would move Dash to at least write back. Not only had Dash written back, but he'd suggested that Archer come to Baytown and see what might be possible. He had promised Archer no job, just the opportunity to seek one, depending on how Dash viewed things. Archer didn't need false promises or mealy-mouthed platitudes. He just needed a fair shot. He put the letter and business card back in his jacket pocket, gazed out the window again, and noted that it was nearing the dinner hour. He had passed clusters of eateries along the way here, and one had stood out to him because it had also been the establishment Naughty Ginger had told him about. He grabbed his hat, pocketed his hefty room key, which could double as a blunt instrument if need be, and set out to fill his time and his belly. It was a short walk to the Dancing Birds Café. The place was tucked away down a side street off Reno's main drag. The broad windows were canopied by red and green striped awnings. The door was solid oak, with a brass knocker barnacled to the wood, and a flickering gas lantern hung on the wall to the right of the door. Archer took a moment to light up a lucky off the open flame. Breathing in the methane reminded him of the war, where if you weren't sucking foul odors like cordite into your lungs, you'd think you were either dead or someone had upped and taken the war elsewhere. He opened the door and surveyed the place. Seven in the evening on the dot, and it was packed as tight as a passenger ship's steerage class. Only these people were better dressed and drinking niftier booze. Waiters in black bow ties and short white jackets seemed to hop, skip, and jump in frenetic furtherance of their duties. Archer looked for the dancing birds, but saw no evidence of winged creatures performing the jitterbug. Either the place was misnamed, or he was in for a real surprise at some point. At the far end of the room was a raised stage with a curtain, like one would see at a theater. As Archer stood there, hat in hand, the curtains parted and out stepped four long-limbed platinum blondes, dressed so skimpily they looked ready to hop into bed for something other than sleep. Each of them held a very large and very fake bird feather in front of them. A short tubby man in a penguin suit waddled on stage and over to a microphone the size of two meaty fists resting on a stand. With deliberate dramatics, he announced that the four ladies were the eponymous dancing birds— and would be performing for the entertainment of the patrons now either eating or, in the case of half the tables that Archer could see, drinking their dinners. About the time the ladies started to sing and hoof it across the wooden stage while twirling their feathers and twitching their hips, a bow-tied gent came up and told Archer there was room for him if he didn't mind sharing a table. Works for me, Archer said amiably. 
he was led to a table that was nestled right next to the stage, where a man in his fifties sat. He was short and well-fed, and his calm, regal expression and sharply focused eyes told Archer that he was a man used to giving orders and seeing them obeyed, which was a decent gig if you could get it and then hold on to it. The tux handed Archer a stiff menu with the food items written in free-flowing calligraphy, took his order for three fingers of whiskey and one of water, and departed. Archer hung his fedora on the seat back and nodded to the other man. Thanks for the accommodation, mister, he said. He nodded back but didn't look at Archer. He kept his gaze on the birds. When Archer's drink came, the man turned and eyed the whiskey. Good choice. It's one of the best they serve. You have knowledge of the bar here? In a way, I own the place. Max Shiner. He raised a flute of champagne and clinked it against the whiskey glass. Nice to meet you, Mr. Shiner. My name's Archer. And thanks a second time for the table spot, then. Wondered why you had such a good seat for the show. You like the dancing birds? He said, returning his gaze to the stage. Archer gave a long look at the bird on the end, who responded with a hike of her eyebrows, the lift of a long fishnet stockinged leg and a dance kick, and a come-hither smile before she tapped-tapped to the other end of the stage with the rest of the feathered flock. Let me just say, how could a breathing man not? You just in town? Shiner asked. Why do I look it? I know most of the regulars. Passing through. Bus out tomorrow. Where to? West of here, he said vaguely, not wanting to offer anything more. California, then? Shiner said. Maybe. Well, son, any farther west and you'd be drinking the Pacific. Suppose so, replied Archer, as he took a sip of the whiskey. He picked up the menu. Recommend anything? The steak and the asparagus. They both come from near here. Get the Bernays sauce. You know what that is? We'll find out. Archer gave that order to the waiter when he next came by and got a finger of whiskey added to what he had left. So how long have you owned this place? Long enough. I was born in Reno. Most are from someplace else, at least now. Great transition after the war, you see. I guess I'm one of them replied Archer. Where in California? I got contacts in case you're looking for work. Thanks, but I think I got something lined up. The Golden State is growing all right. Why people like you are rushing to get there. Me, I'm more than content with this piece of the pie. Who's she? asked Archer, indicating the bird who had given him the eye. Liberty Callahan, one of my best. Sweet gal. He pointed a finger at Archer. No ideas, son. She wants to get into acting. Don't think she'll be here long, much to my regret. I'm just passing through, like I said. I've got no ideas about her or any other lady. Shiner leaned forward, his look intense and probing. You like to gamble? My whole life's been a gamble. I mean in a casino. Archer shook his head. Shiner drew a fist of cash from his pocket and peeled off fifty dollars in sawbucks. You take this with my compliments and go try your luck at the wheelhouse. It's my place. You give out folding money to all the folks passing by? said Archer. If you do, you might want to stop before you run out. Shiner leaned in more so Archer could smell the champagne on the men's breath and Old Spice cologne on the ruddy cheeks. Little something you need to know about casinos, young fella. No matter what the game, the casinos have the edge. With blackjack and roulette, it's a little less. With craps and slots, a little more. But there's no game where the house doesn't have the advantage. My job is to get folks into my place, even if I have to front them a bit. In the long run, it pays off for me. Well, with that warning, aren't you defeating your purpose of recruitment? Shiner laughed. You forget the element of human nature. I give you a little seed money, and you'll pay that back and more on top in no time. Never got the point of gambling. Life's uncertain enough as it is. Gambling will be here long after I'm dead and buried, and you too. People are born with weaknesses and they pass them on. Sort of like Darwinism, only the stupid survive. I might try your place, but I'll do it with my own coin, thanks. You sure? 
sure as I'm sitting here with a man who owns a casino. Shiner put the cash away and lit up a short, thin cigar and blew wobbly rings to the high plastered ceiling. You surprise me, Archer. I've done that fifty dollar bit more times than I can remember, and you're the first to turn it down. So what about all those casinos in Las Vegas? Don't they give you competition? Shiner waved this concern away. In twenty years it'll be a ghost town, and no one will even remember the name Las Vegas. You mark my words. His steak and asparagus came, and Archer ate and washed it down with another two fingers. Can I at least comp your meal, Archer? What do I have to do in return? Just go to my casino. Two blocks over to the west. You can't miss it. Archer laid down a dollar for his meal and drinks. So you're not going to the wheelhouse then? said Shiner in a disappointed tone. No, I am. Just on my terms instead of yours. Action doesn't start up till around ten. You'll want the full picture. As he left, Archer gave Liberty Callahan a tip of his hat as she was singing a solo while reclining on a baby grand piano that had been wheeled on stage. She hit him with a dazzling smile and then kept right on singing without missing a beat. Her voice sounded awfully good to Archer. She waved bye-bye with her fake feather as he left the nest. Archer had to admit he liked the lady's style. Chapter 3 The wheelhouse was located in a building about as big as an aircraft carrier, but with nicer furniture, no portholes, and enough booze to launch her. Inside, an army of gamblers was looking to win big, although almost all would lose what they had brought, plus what they hadn't brought. Archer didn't need Shiner to tell him the odds favored the house. Somebody had to pay for the liquor, the neon, and the ladies, and the chubby old man who owned it all and liked his champagne and fifty-dollar suckers. Pretty much every game of chance invented was being played in the main room, as cocktail waitresses in black stockings and low-cut blouses made their rounds with drinks, smokes, and the occasional teasing look that hinted at additional services available after hours for those few with any cash left. The bar set against one wall was packed, because the liquor was half price, or so said the sign overhead. Drunk people no doubt increased the casino's odds even more, figured Archer. As Ten struck on his timepiece, he checked his hat and strode across the main floor to the cashier booths. He had never gambled in a casino, but Archer had gambled. First in prison, and then in private games, where the odds were a little better than at this place, the booze came out of flasks or thimbles masquerading as shot glasses, and the only ladies present were housewives coming to drag their no-account hubbies home, while they still had twin nickels to their names. He paid for ten bucks' worth of chips, then ambled over to a craps table, and from a distance studied the bets on the board until the table opened up for new action, like the jaws of a prowling gator. He continued to watch three guys crap out after two tosses each. Then two more rollers in the wings fell out, one passing out drunk, the other blowing his whole stake on the last throw of the dice. A man at the rail turned and saw Archer. He beckoned for Archer to join him. After Archer did, the man said, Listen up, son. This here fellow about to throw has been hot three nights in a row. Archer looked down at the gent speaking. He was small and around sixty, with fine white hair and a pair of rimless specks worn low on his squat red-veined nose. He was encased in a seersucker suit with a snazzy blue bow tie and two-tone lace-up shoes. His nose and flushed face stamped him as a man who liked his drink more than he liked just about anything else. Is that right? said Archer. Yes, sir, that boy can roll. He held out a flabby hand. Roy Dixon. Archer. They shook hands as the stick man behind the casino's table bank called for fresh bets. The new shooter stepped up to one end of the table, shaking out his arms and undoing kinks in his neck, like he was about to enter a boxing ring and not the green felt of a craps table that might be the most complicated betting game ever devised. Archer thought he could even see the guy's eyes roll back in his head for a second before he shook it all clear and got ready to either do the house damage or get grisly mauled by a pair of dice weighing an ounce. The two base dealers handled all the chip traffic, while the seated boxman 
a burly man wearing a green visor and a sour expression, watched all of this like his life and all those he knew and loved depended on his not missing anything. Okay, son, let's make some money, said Dixon, who made his bet on the pass line. How? said Archer. Hey, you! Archer looked up to see one of the base dealers drilling him with a stare. The button's off, pal. Got a new shooter coming up. No point made. You stand by the rail, you got to bet. That's prime real estate, buddy. Didn't your mom ever teach you that? Everyone laughed, and more than a few gave Archer patronizing looks. He placed some chips next to Dixon's on the pass line. Thank you, sonny boy. Now don't you feel all better inside? said the dealer. Dixon leaned over and whispered to Archer, He's gonna roll seven on his come-out roll. How do you know that? Shit, cause he always does. The stick man presented the shooter, a tall, thin man with curly brown hair and wearing a two-piece beige suit with a wrinkled white shirt and no belt, with five dice. He picked his deuce and handed the trio back to the stick man, who dumped them in his shakeout bowl. Dice out, no more bets allowed announced the stick man. The shooter blew on the dice and rattled them once in his right hand. Throw with one hand only, and both dice have to hit the back wall, instructed the stick man. The shooter looked at him incredulously. How you think I don't know that? How long I've been throwing here, Benny? Just saying, was Benny's only reply. The shooter let fly, and the dice bounced off the far U wall of the table. The stick man announced, We got a big red, natural seven. Pass line wins. No pass goes down. Dixon said, What did I tell you? We just doubled our money. Their chips doubled, and Archer looked intrigued as the dealers worked the payoffs and oversaw new bets. Now what? asked Archer. He's going to make his point on this next roll. Dixon set his chips down on certain betting squares, and Archer followed suit. A few moments later, Shooter rolls at ten, announced Benny. Point is made, folks. The bets were posted again, and the shooter was handed the dice. They banged off the far end of the table and came to rest. Little Joe on the front row, bellowed Benny. Hard four. Archer looked at the twin twos staring up from the faces of the dice. Then he looked at his pile of chips growing. He and Dixon bet again. Box cars called out Benny as double sixes stood up after careening off the wall. Twelve craps, come away triple. What does that mean? asked Archer. The wheelhouse pays triple the field on boxcars, Dixon said, looking down with relish at his now towers of chips. Hey, pal, shouldn't we quit while we're ahead? said Archer. What the hell's the point of that? countered Dixon. Archer took some of his chips off, while Dixon did not. The next roll was another winner, and Dixon grinned at Archer. You're too timid, son. First rule of craps, you ride a hot shooter all the way to the very end. Archer glanced at the shooter. A cigarette dangled from his lips. A line of sweat rode on his brow, and his eyes spoke of too much booze, drugs, and maybe overconfidence. If ever a man looked done in and done out, this was the hombre, Archer thought. He lifted all his chips off the edge of the fabric and slid out his reserve chips from the slots in the table and took a step back as the boxman eyed him with contempt. Running out on a hot shooter, bub? Archer just stared at him. The boxman added with a sneer, And go find your mommy. It's time for your bottle of milk, Junior. Dixon moved every single one of his chips forward onto new bets on the pass line in Cumfield a second before Benny handed the dice to the shooter. As Archer walked away, a huge groan went up from the table as Benny gleefully called out, Seven out! The next sound was a stick coming down and raking away all the chips that had bet on the shooter continuing to roll. The house had come roaring back, and the lives of the bettors gathered round came careening down to earth like a doomed plane. Archer looked back to see Dixon staring at the spot where all his chips used to be. The king had lost his kingdom, as they all eventually did. I better go find that bottle of milk, Archer said to himself. Chapter Four Hey! Hey, you! 
Archer looked over and saw the woman waving enthusiastically at him. It was Liberty Callahan, of the Dancing Birds troupe, sitting at the roulette table. She had changed out of her stage outfit and lost her condor-sized feather. While her sparkly dress was tight, her welcoming smile, promising skittish fun with few rules, was even more appealing to Archer. And yet when he more soberly took in her toothy smile and frisky appearance, Archer saw in it prison guards itching to bust his head, chain gangs to nowhere, and food that was not food at all. That was what had happened to him the last time a gal had called out to him like that. A sob story, a poorly planned escape from her tyrannical father, the arrival of the police, a change in heart by the gal after her old man put the screws to her, but the result that Archer had donated a few years of his life to busting up rocks and seeing the world through the narrow width of prison cell bars. Still, he ordered a highball from the bar and took a seat next to her. He just couldn't seem to help himself. He was an internal optimist. Or just stupid. I'm Liberty Callahan. I'm Archer. She shot him a curious look. <laughs> That's a funny name. It's my surname. What's your given name? Not one I give out. Her features went slack and put out, but Archer didn't feel unduly bothered by this. Any first meeting was a nifty place to lay out the ground rules, and his new universal ground rules were to take no one into his confidence and to listen more and talk less. Suit yourself, Archer. She turned to play with her little stack of chips. He said, Mr. Shiner pointed you out to me back at the cafe. Told me your name, too. She eyed him cautiously. That's right. You were at his table. Archer eyed the wheel and the dealer standing in the notch cut out of the elongated table, while the gamblers sipped on drinks and conspired on their future bets. He heard all sorts of talk coming in one ear about this method and that superstition, coupled with that infallible telltale sign of where a spinning ball would come to rest in a bowl full of colored numbers in slots that were spinning the other way. People had colorful chips in hand that looked very different from the ones Archer had been using at the craps table. The table had a sign that said minimum and maximum bets differentiated between inside and outside bets. Archer had no idea what any of that meant. He told me you want to get into acting, said Archer. Her smile emerged once more, showing every tooth in her arsenal, including a jacketed porcelain crown in the back that was so white it looked nearly pewter in the shadowy cave of her mouth. She nodded, her smile deepening. People calling out your name and wanting your autograph, your picture in the newspapers, somebody else driving you around and you travel with your own maid. It all sure sounds swell. So yeah, I want to try my hand at it. Stupid, maybe. Long shot, sure. But why not me, right? So what are you going to do about it? Asked Archer evenly. Hey, hey, called out the dealer. He was beady-eyed and thick at the waist, but with a steady hand in which the little ball already rested. You got a seat, you got a bed. Sorry, said Callahan. She quickly put a chip on ten black. Archer pulled out some of his crap chips. The dealer shook his head. No, no, you need to use roulette chips here, Sonny. Let me see what you got there. Archer pulled out all of his chips and showed them to the dealer. The man eyed him with interest as he totaled them up scooped them away, and placed a stack of colorful chips in front of Archer. Okay, what do you want each to be worth? Excuse me, said Archer. The dealer told him what his crap chips had been worth. But you get to pick how much each of these chips are worth while not going over the total value of the chips you just turned in. Why so complicated? It's not complicated, it's roulette. Everybody at the table has a different color chip. They tell me what they're worth, and I keep that in my head. What's complicated? Archer glanced over the chips and gave the man a number. Thanks, genius, the dealer said, as he placed a like-colored chip atop the rail by the wheel and then placed a number marker on it that coincided with the chip value Archer had given him. The dealer grinned at Archer. Memories are iffy. Marker chips make it easy. Yeah, I can see that, genius. He put a chip on ten black next to Callahan's. The ball was dropped and the wheel spun by the dealer. People kept betting until the ball was about to drop, and then the dealer called out, No more bets. Seconds later, Archer and Callahan lost their chips. 
because the ball decided twenty-one red all the way on the other side was a much more comfortable resting place than ten black. Callahan took a sip of her cocktail and said, I'm going to Hollywood. That's what you do if you want to be in the movie business, Archer. Ain't you heard of that place? I don't go to many movies. Never saw the point. They're not real. Well, that is the point. If you say so. Life is crap, Archer. You go to the movies to get away from that for a little bit. Get some pixie dust thrown on you for a precious two hours. And when the two hours are up and the pixie dust falls off, your life is still crap. Boy, it must be fun walking in your shoes, she observed. But then you go back to the movies for more pixie dust, right? Yeah, so? Archer said, so you're an addict. Might as well be smoking reefer. Movies are about making money and putting butts in seats. No butts in the seat, no autographs, no maids, and no newspaper pics. She frowned. Thanks for popping the one dream I have. Archer sipped his highball and tapped a finger against the tabletop. We all have dreams. Point is, what are you going to do about it? Just going to the place doesn't seem like enough. I'll bet it's chock full of people wanting to do the same thing as you. I know that. I need to take some classes and work on how I walk and how I talk. They can already walk and talk, and dance, too, and sing. I'm witness to that. You do it pretty swell, in fact. Surprisingly, her frown deepened at this compliment. But there's a lot more to acting than that. You have to have what they call the it factor. The camera has to love you. It has to capture something in you that maybe even you don't see. That's how a star is made. Heard that a bunch of actors fought in the war. Hank Fonda, Clark Gable, lots. Oh, poor Clark Gable. Wasn't it awful what happened to his wife, Carol Lombard? Said Callahan. That plane crash after she was out promoting war bonds? Her mom was with her, but didn't like to fly. She wanted to take the train back. Lombard wanted to take a plane to get back to Gable faster. They said she and her mom flipped a coin. Her mom lost, and they took the plane. And it flew right into a mountain. Yeah, I heard about that while I was overseas. Damn shame. So you fought? Archer shrugged. Sure, like most everybody else. I worked in a factory making bombs. Dangerous work. Callahan took a moment to pull a camel from a pack she slid from her purse. She held out the smoke for Archer to light, which he did, using a box of matches he took from a stack next to a green glass ashtray overflowing with smoked butts. The air was thick with so much smoke, Archer thought a fog had materialized inside. She cupped his hand with hers as he lit the camel. She glanced up at him as their skin touched, but he wasn't looking at her, with good reason. He waved the match dead and plunked it with the other wreckage into the ashtray. Then he sat back and watched her smoke. She did it well. She said, One girl I knew at the factory got killed in an accident, and I lost a brother and a cousin in the war. One in Germany and one in France. They're buried over there. I want to make enough money to go see their graves and put flowers on them. She added, her expression growing even more somber, but her eyes lifted to his. You lose anyone in the war? Just almost myself. Right, she said, apparently disappointed by this. So Hollywood, then, prompted Archer. Your dream? Yes, and don't give me a hard time about it, she added in a pouty voice that Archer didn't much care for. Women, he'd found, did that to move men one way or another. The dealer suddenly barked, Hey, lovebirds, you gonna bet or you gonna give up your seats? Because that's the choice you gotta make. And do it before I die of old age, will ya? Callahan looked at the man with an expression that gave Archer pause. It was akin to a snake sizing up its next meal. He didn't like it, but he could understand it. With a slow, methodical, full-of-meaning motion, she pushed her remaining chips onto twenty-two black. You sure about that, honey? Just that one bet? Said the dealer, giving her an eye back as though to evaluate her mental acuity. Turning to Archer, she said, It's the year I was born, 1922, and I like black better than red. Always have. Archer slid all of his roulette chips next to hers. She jerked so violently her camel came close to hitting her in the eye. 
Archer, that's too many chips for a single ride on the wheel. Soften the blow with other bets on white, black, even odd. Don't be a dummy. Spread the risk. Ladies talking smart, said the dealer. Archer finished his highball and sensed the others at the table watching him, wondering whether he was mad, rich, just stupid, or all three. Thing is, I didn't earn it. I just followed a guy over at the craps table and got out before I lost it all. For me, it's free money. Ain't no such thing, buddy, barked the dealer. Archer eyed him. You in the business of not taking bets, buddy? The man chuckled, and spittle ran down his chin. He didn't bother to wipe it away. Your funeral, pal. So just to be clear, you're doing a straight-up bet on 22 black, with no outside odd or even red or black column bets? How about some inside splits, corners, street, double street? Last chance, amigo. If I knew what any of that meant, I'd answer you, said Archer. But all I know is if that little ball drops on 22 black, we win. You know the odds? asked the dealer nervously. Archer glanced around the bull. He got thirty-six numbers. Then he noted the zero and double-zero slots that were in green felt rather than red or black. What are those numbers? he asked. The dealer grinned. That's where the house gets its advantage, pal. Didn't you know? You mean it doesn't count for the odds? The grin deepened. Nope, just two more numbers to add to the thrill. See, that's what advantage means. So thirty-six minus one means the odds are longer than the road from heaven to hell, and the payoff is thirty-five to one, although the wheel has thirty-seven opportunities to lose. You're picking it up real fast, partner, said the dealer, eyeing the big stack of chips on twenty-two black. His eyebrow twitched, and a sweat bubble sprouted over this twitch like a mushroom after a hard rain. Like taking candy from a baby, he said. But there was no spirit behind it. So you gonna spin the wheel and drop the ball, or do I have time for a smoke break? asked Archer. Callahan gripped Archer's hand under the table and gave him a pointed smile that showed all teeth and the jacketed crown that now looked more white than pewter. The dealer looked around the table and then glanced to the ceiling and muttered something Archer couldn't hear. The wheel was spun. The dealer sent the ivory ball spinning in the opposite direction, and Archer and Callahan waited for what seemed an eternity for the game to do what it was designed to do. The bona fide absurdity of the endeavor was not lost on Archer. He watched a dozen reasonable-looking adults eyeing a little ball like it was the most important thing they would ever witness in their entire lives. It's a damn miracle we won the war and aren't speaking German. No more bets, barked the dealer. A moment later, Callahan shrieked. Oh, my God! as the ball dropped into the slot for twenty-two black. She threw her arms around Archer and kissed him on the lips, almost knocking him out of his seat. Damn, said the dealer, shaking his head. How much did we win? asked Archer quietly. I mean in money, not wafers. The dealer eyed the bets and then the markers and said mournfully, Little over four grand for you, two hundred and eighty bucks for the lady. Holy Jesus, exclaimed Callahan. We'll cash out now, said Archer, giving the dealer a dead stare. The man slowly counted out a number of regular casino chips. He slid a small pile to Callahan and a far larger stack to Archer. Archer took his stacks of chips, split them evenly, and handed one stack to Callahan. What are you doing? she said, bug-eyed. You won those, not me. I just followed your bet, Liberty. I would have won nothing except for you, so a fifty-fifty split seems fair. He lit a lucky strike and eyed the dealer through the mist. After all, it was free money. Do you? I mean, are you? Oh, Archer! She kissed him again, this time on the cheek and not with as much fury, so he held firm in his seat. The dealer said, Hey, look, the night's young. You folks sure you won't let me try to win some of that back? My boss ain't gonna be happy with me. Archer flipped him a fifty-dollar chip. He might still be unhappy, but you won't be, amigo. The man caught the chip and looked surprised. Didn't figure you for a class act. My mistake, buddy. I think you figured me just right, but four grand can bring class to any bum. 
After Archer and Callahan reclaimed their hats from the hat check girl, they turned chips into dollars at the cashier's desk, and Archer carefully folded the money over and put it through a slit in his hat's lining. Callahan's stash disappeared into her purse. How about a drink? She said. To celebrate? On me? Not here. They water everything down. I know a place. He studied her for so long she finally said, What? Works for me. What took you so long? The guy usually does the asking, not the girl. Well, I'm the other way around, Archer. You hang around me long enough, you'll figure that out. Maybe I will, or maybe I won't. But let's go get that drink. He added with a measure of calm, bordering on ambivalence. You're a strange bird. Most folks, after winning all that, would be sort of giddy. I don't think I have any giddy left. Chapter 5 It's right down this street, said Callahan, as they turned off the strip. A friend told me it used to be a speakeasy back when they had prohibition. Callahan slipped her arm inside his. Isn't life just grand sometimes, Archer? I mean, five minutes ago, we had nothing, really. And now look at us. Archer wasn't sure what to make of her move on him, but he let the lady stay right where she was, even as her soft hip bumped his. He could figure that out later if need be. It took guts what you did back there, betting all those chips. Doesn't seem anything like that. I suppose you'd feel that way. I mean, after fighting in a war. I guess so, he said. You want to talk about it? No. You sure? She asked, glancing at him. Yes. How come? It might make you feel better. I don't need to feel better. And the guys who didn't come back can't talk about it, so what gives me the right? The lucky stiff shouldn't write the histories or tell the stories. Okay, okay, Archer. Don't bite my head off for caring. They took a few more steps when Archer said, What was that? Sounds like a fight or something, said Callahan, looking startled. But they have lots of those around here. No business of ours. She tightened the grip on his arm. Next, they heard a man calling out in fear, Please, don't. Archer said, That sounds like... What? Let me just see something. He pulled free from her and hustled down the street. Archer! She hurried after him, holding onto her hat as she did so. Damn it! I don't like to run with heels on! Archer reached an alley and turned down it. He ran toward the noise and eventually saw three burly men surrounding another man, far frailer and older, like hyenas circling prey. Robert Howells was just picking himself up off the ground. His lip was split and his cheek was bruised, and his crumpled hat was lying off to the side. His concave chest was heaving as he held up his hands futilely in a defensive measure as the younger and larger men bore down on him. The blood leached down his face and made a spot on his shirt like a crimson teardrop. You boys having fun at an old man's expense? said Archer, as his hand slipped into his pocket and wrapped around something he was probably going to need. The three men turned around. They were all bigger and beefier than Archer, and not one of them carried a friendly expression. Archer advanced on them and pointed at Howells. You feel good about that? Something to write home to Mom about? If you got one? The biggest and meanest looking of the trio took a few steps toward Archer. This ain't your business, buddy, so shut your trap. Just turn around and keep moving if you know what's good for you. You get one warning, and that's it. Bobby H., come on over here, said Archer. The other two men put out their thick arms to bar the old man from moving. Look here, I don't want to do this the hard way, said the big man. He held up a fist as large as a bowling ball. You beat it now, or this is the last thing you'll see until you wake up. All you have to do is let him go, said Archer. Then you don't get hurt. The men just gazed stupidly back at him, as though wondering whether Archer was simple-minded or thought way too much of himself. Do you got a death wish, bub? For added emphasis and to let Archer see things as clear as possible, the man took out a blackjack and slapped it against an open palm. One of the other thugs drew out a switchblade and made a slashing motion with it. 
He grinned and made another slash. Archer didn't bother to watch the performance. His immediate focus was on the blackjack. I was about to ask you the same thing, said Archer, still marching toward the big man. So just turn around and get out of here. Last war— Archer pushed off the balls of his feet, which separated him from the pavement. With his wingtips rising about six inches off the surface, he moved in a graceful arc. As he leaped, he rotated his arm back, his elbow making a V, pointing in the opposite direction from which he was heading. As Archer made his descent, his hand, now a mean fist, came forward. Archer leaned his weight into it, thereby accelerating the blow about to be delivered. His fist struck the man so hard in the chin on a downward slope that the man's upper jaw jammed into his lower. Two of his teeth were ejected by this collision and landed on the ground along with a stream of blood. A split second later, their owner joined them, face down and lights out. Archer came to rest on the ground, his knuckles cracked and bleeding, and the stinger flowing all the way to his rotator. You couldn't hurt another man in that way without hurting yourself, he knew but he would take the pain he was feeling over the one the big man would endure when he awoke. The knife man lunged at Archer, making attacking motions with his blade. Archer waited for a few seconds as he sized him up until the man drew close enough. Then he lashed out, gripped the man's wrist holding the knife, and used his foot to hook his opponent's ankle, while at the same time he pushed his foe backward. The man fell, but he did so without the blade, since Archer had twisted it free with a violent downward tug on the man's wrist. Archer closed the blade and threw it behind him. He didn't like knife fights for the most part, and would rather finish this skirmish with his fists. The man regained his balance and flew at Archer, only to collapse backward from a shot directly to his nose that had painfully moved it about an inch closer to his face. He had less room to breathe now, but air was the least of his concerns at present. Like his friend, he collapsed on the pavement for an involuntary nap after Archer's haymaker. The third man, taking no chances, had drawn a snub-nosed Colt thirty-two with oak grips from his jacket pocket. He pointed the barrel at Archer, and took no pains to conceal his delight at what he was about to do. It took something to kill a man at close distance and with your own hands. It took only an index finger and not a shred of nerve to do the same with a gun. The shot made Archer flinch, because the sound of gunfire just did that to a man. But it hadn't come from the snub-nosed. He looked back to see Callahan standing there holding a nickel-plated Smith & Wesson thirty-eight Special. She had fired the shot into the air, but now had her gun pointed at the other man's chest. Drop the piece, or I drop you, she said, her features set like a slab of pretty granite. And I don't miss, mister. The man eyed her up and down, a slick smile creeping onto his lips. I ain't worried about no girl pulling no trigger on me. Her response was to place a shot through the top inch of his pork pie hat, neatly blowing it off his head. He cried out, dropped his gun, and knelt down, blubbering like a baby. Then stop worrying, said Callahan calmly, holding the gun as expertly as the best-trained soldiers Archer had seen. Unless you want the next slug drilling your balls, which one do you love the least? Still whimpering, the man instinctively covered his crotch. Come over here, Bobby H., said Archer again as he grabbed the thirty-two, slipping it into his waistband. He also picked up the knife and put it in his jacket pocket. Howells snatched up his hat, spat on the big man lying at his feet, and tottered over to Archer. They all three hustled out of the alley and back to the main street. What was that about? said Archer. Why were they giving you the business? Howells turned to the side and spit blood, and possibly part of his inner lip, out of his mouth. I told you I got enemies, Archer. It's why I wanted you to help me, son. You know this piece of work? said Callahan, who had put a revolver back in her purse as casually as though it were merely her lipstick and powder. He shook his head. We don't even qualify as acquaintances. And how come you have a gun? She gave him an illustrative eye roll. I'm a good-looking, young dancer, and I live in Reno. What else do you need to know, choir boy? Let's get you cleaned up, said Archer to Howells. The old man was trying to wipe the blood off his face, but he just made a mess of it. 
The bar we're going to has a washroom, said Callahan. If he can make it that far. I'll make it, said Howells. But only because I sure as hell need a drink. Okay, but you can buy, said Callahan. Why's that, said a startled Howells. We just saved your bacon is why, you old geezer. Don't be simple. Well, okay, said Howells doubtfully. But my funds are limited at the moment. Great, she said spitefully. Howells turned to Archer. And who is your charming friend, Archer? Hey, bub, I'm right here, she said. Archer doesn't have to speak for me. And the name's Liberty Callahan. I'm sure it is, said a bug-eyed Howells. She turned to Archer. Hey, how'd you knock those two guys out with one punch anyways? Archer held up the set of aluminum knuckles he'd earlier pulled from his pocket. I always keep these around for emergencies. Is that legal? She asked. You could get in trouble. I figure if you can carry a gun, I can carry these. She cracked a smile. I'm starting to like you, Archer. Hell, what took you so long? Chapter 6 Archer helped Howells clean up in the men's washroom, and then they joined Callahan at the bar, after he dumped both the snub-nose and the knife in the waste can. They didn't want to be near any windows, in case the three guys came looking for them, although Archer was of the opinion that at least two of them would need a doctor when they came to, and the third a change of undershorts after Callahan's antics with her thirty-eight. Archer ordered a bourbon straight up, Callahan a Tom Collins, and Howells a sidecar. Go heavy on the brandy and triple sec, hun, the old man told the waitress, a tired-looking woman in her forties with a Dutch boy haircut and a way of looking at you that made you feel like a heel even if you weren't one. I got serious troubles, he added by way of explanation. Tell it to somebody who cares, hun, she said before walking off. So give it to us straight, Bobby H., said Archer. Why were those guys giving you the heavy lifting? I, I, uh, got a little gambling debt issue. Then maybe you should stop gambling, said Callahan. That ever occur to you, genius? Howells looked down at the shiny surface of the bar. I tried, but it didn't go too well. How much do you owe, said Archer? Eighteen hundred and fifty dollars. Eighteen hundred and fifty dollars? exclaimed Callahan. Are you that bad a gambler or what? Every better loses if he plays long enough, Missy. Can you find that kind of dough? asked Archer. I have no, what you would call, liquid assets. But I have a car, a mighty fine one. I'm loath to part with it, but I'm more loath to part with my life. What kind of car? asked Callahan. A Delahaye. What's that? said Callahan. Like a Ford? It is nothing like a Ford, said Howells indignantly as he tapped his fingers against the mahogany bar. It is a work of art. It's French-made, truly one of the most beautiful cars ever conceived. Indeed, only five of this model were ever built. How come? Was it no good? asked Callahan. No, a little thing called World War II intervened, retorted Howells in a bristling tone. It is in every respect a spectacular example of automotive genius. How'd you get your mitts on something like that? asked Archer suspiciously. Your story isn't adding up to me. You're going to have to fill in the holes. I didn't get my mitts on it. My son did. He left it to me when he passed away last year. Sorry to hear that. He must have been a young guy. He was. You're not supposed to bury your children. Howells added somberly, staring at his hands. Callahan and Archer exchanged a sympathetic glance. How'd your son get the car? Archer asked quietly, after a few moments of silence. There has to be a story in there worth telling, he added encouragingly. He, like you, fought in the war, and did so bravely. Okay, but I didn't get a car in the bargain, said Archer. What did he do? Why should I tell you anything? replied Howells sharply. Archer took out the aluminum knuckles and placed them between himself and Howells. Because a few minutes ago I made your enemies my enemies, 
That's at least worth a little information, friend. Howells eyed the knuckles and nodded, his expression now contrite. Near the end of the conflict, my boy saved the life of a French soldier who was the son of one of the Delahaye Company owners. As a gesture of thanks, they shipped the car here. It's a 1939 model, but it's never really been driven and looks brand new. It was actually built for a wealthy Englishman and was supposed to be delivered in early 1940. For obvious reasons, it was never shipped out to him. How did your son die? asked Archer. He, too, had gambling debts. You mean they killed him over that? said Archer. That can happen, Callahan said knowingly, drawing a meaningful glance from Archer. He rubbed at one of his swollen fingers and stretched out his stiff arm. Go on, Bobby H. Don't stop now, he said. It's just getting good. He left the car to me. It was really all he had. How come the folks he owed money to didn't try to get it? They didn't know he had it. They don't know I have it. You mean he never drove it? said Callahan. Never. It's an unforgettable-looking automobile. If they had seen him in it, well, he wouldn't have had it long. Same goes for me. Plus, I don't even know how to drive a car. Where is it? asked Archer. Outside of town, in a safe place. Why? Well, looks like you're going to have to sell it. Like you said, you're more loath to part with your life than with the car. Their drinks came, and they each lighted up cigarettes and drank their spirits with enthusiasm. Through a sheen of smoke, Archer eyed Howells. And you'll need to make a decision fast. We saved you tonight, but I at least won't be here tomorrow to do the same. And saving you is not my job. We all have problems. There's no one I know with enough money to buy it. How much you asking? said Archer. Don't be crazy, said Callahan sharply. Why do you need a car like that? I'm just asking, replied Archer, whittling down his lucky and his bourbon. No harm in that. What would you do with a car like that? asked Howells cautiously. Archer didn't answer right away as he blew lazy smoke rings to the filthy ceiling. Maybe drive it to California. California? Callahan snapped. Is that where you're headed? Why didn't you tell me that before? He tilted his gaze at her. Before what? We just met. But I told you that's where I'm going. Well, hell, you two can go out west together, said Howells, smiling happily as if Archer and Callahan had just exchanged marriage vows. Don't tell me what to do, said Callahan. And I barely know, Archer. I can't drive all the way to California with someone I barely know. Well, the same goes for me, replied Archer particularly a gal with a gun. What are you going out to California for? Howells asked her. To get into pictures. What else? Well, once you see the Delahaye, you may change your mind about not wanting to drive out there with Archer in it. Why? Because you'll arrive in style. You'll be in all the newspapers. But I'm not going to Hollywood, said Archer. Oh, hell, son, California is California. Do you want to see it or not? What do you say? Archer asked Callahan. She mulled over this. Hmm, it can't hurt to look. But how about one more round of drinks first? Suggested Howells. Only if you're buying, said Archer. I busted a knuckle for you. That's enough without you attacking my wallet, too. Well, I will, on the condition that you buy the car. Archer sat back on his stool. How do we get out to this place? Got a buddy who can give us a lift in the back of his truck. Howells checked his watch. He gets off work in about ten minutes. The back of his truck? exclaimed Callahan. Well, you can sit in the front. Me and Archer can ride in the back. Callahan threw down money for the booze. But let's just keep it to the one round, then, in case Archer doesn't buy the damn car. Chapter 7 the friend's pickup truck was a rambling ancient mess of a Plymouth, held together by wire, tape, and probably prayer by the gent driving it. That gent was a burly fellow dressed in blue overalls, dusty brogans, and a dirty tan snap-brim hat with a fat cigar stuck in the red band. Howells didn't provide a name for the man, and the man didn't volunteer one. Howells' friend ogled Callahan as he held open the rusted passenger door for her. 
She tucked herself primly inside the cab and wouldn't look at him. The lady didn't need a magnifying glass to discern the man's primal desire. Archer noted that Callahan kept a firm hand on her clutch purse, in which the thirty-eight lay like a coiled rattler. Archer hefted Howells into the back, where he sat next to a passel of tools. Archer rode higher up in the truck bed's side panel. He buttoned up his jacket and turned up his collar because the air had gone cool. As they headed west, the sky was clear, and the stars were stitched to the dark fabric in random patterns of elegance. They were moving at too brisk a pace for Archer to light up a cigarette, so he just watched the dirt pass by. The land was flat, the vegetation uninteresting and the occasional animal unremarkable. Not much out this way, Archer commented after a few miles. Men came here for gold a long time ago. Now it's just a stop on the way to somewhere else, unless you're enamored of desert land. I like the water. You grew up on the ocean? No, but I took a long boat ride home, and it was the sweetest ride I've ever had. Smooth, was it? No, we actually went through a hurricane. Thought we were going to sink for about three straight days, guys puking and praying all over the place. I'd settled on the fact that I was going to drown right then and there in the old Atlantic. So why the hell do you like the water, then? I survived the war, and that boat was taking me home. It affects a man. I can see that, said Howells thoughtfully. I fought in the First World War. I'm hoping there won't be a third. So California, eh? Archer shrugged. Good a place as any, I reckon. I wish I'd done more moving about when I was young. You from here, then? Not exactly, but I call it home now, for better or worse. If you pay those boys off, who's to say you won't get back into debt, and you won't have another car to sell? You make a fair point, Archer, but right now I don't see another option. Archer shrugged. It's your funeral, and any man who can't see that deserves what he gets. That's a hard line, friend, Howells replied, frowning. No, that's life, and you've seen more of it than me, so you should know better. The truck rolled on until they reached an unwieldy conglomeration of buildings. A gas station, an automobile repair garage, and a small bungalow that looked like someone had let the air out. Out front was parked a big sparkling blue Buick and a smaller dented Ford two-door. Martin Jeff in mechanical splendor. What is this setup? asked Archer as he helped Howells down. My buddy's place, like I told you. He has the garage and the filling station, and he lives in that little house there. Your buddy have a name? asked Callahan, who had gotten out of the cab before the man had stopped the truck fully, probably so he couldn't hurry around and try to see up her skirt like he had when she'd gotten in. Howells pointed to the sign above the garage. It read, Lester's Auto Repair. Lester's had this place a long time. The truck shot back onto the road and disappeared quickly from view. Why's your friend in such a hurry? asked Archer. Lester doesn't like Calvin, and if Lester doesn't like you, you know it. Archer eyed the fleeing Plymouth and then glanced at Howells. So how do we get back to town then, Bobby H.? Howells considered this dilemma and said, Well, that's a pickle for sure. The door to the bungalow opened at Howell's knocking. In the doorway stood the largest human being Archer had ever seen. At about six feet eight, his body was so thick it needed every inch the doorway provided. Archer figured him for three hundred fifty or more pounds, if he weighed an ounce. He looked like a statue whose sculptor had gotten carried away. Holy Lord, whispered Callahan. Is that one man or two? Dunno, said Archer. But either way... Don't make him or them mad. Howells threw up a hand and said, Howdy there, Lester. Lester did not seem pleased to see him, or any of them, thought Archer. It looked like he would prefer to snap their necks like chickens, and then pluck and cook them for dinner. Lester had curly dark hair and a crooked nose that seemed to go on and on. His lips were thick, and his teeth were relative to the size of his wide mouth. He wore a stained, sleeveless undershirt that showed off thick, broad shoulders, arm muscles that seemed too weighty for the bones they were attached to, and matted black chest hair with a fabric dipped low. His stiff dungarees, while enormous, strained to contain his legs. 
His feet were surprisingly small for his huge frame. His nails were thick with grease, and the smell of gasoline shrouded the man like wrapping paper around a present. A big one. A cigarette was stuck behind one ear like a pale, severed finger lingering. He looked them over one by one and said nothing. Callahan took a subtle sniff and wrinkled her nose, taking a step back to allow the man some space and her lungs some reprieve. Lester once more ran his gaze up and down Archer and Callahan before turning to Howells. It's late for a visit, Pops. What are you here for? His voice was low, like rumbling thunder. It didn't quite match his girth, but it still made Archer notice his words with particular care. Came to see the car. He looked at Archer. Got a prospective buyer in Archer here. Lester turned once more to Archer. His gaze went from the hat to the feet and then came back up like an elevator car and stopped at the floor containing Archer's eyes. He doesn't look like he can afford it. My well, looks can be deceiving, said Archer. Lester did not appear to take too kindly to this mild rebuke. He took a few steps toward Archer before Howells said, So is it in the garage, then? Lester snapped a glare at him that in the dim light seemed ferocious somehow. Where else, Pops? Under the cover like always. Well, let's get to it, said Howells hastily. Don't want to waste what's left of your night, Lester. To Archer the old man seemed uneasy at having to deal with the giant and that uneasiness transferred to Archer like a virus. Lester took them to the garage, pulled a key from his pocket, unlocked a massive padlock, and slid open the doors with outward thrusts of his two-by-four arms. Inside they saw automobiles and pickup trucks and various stages of disassembly. Large rolling toolboxes stood next to some of these vehicles. Single bulb work lights were strung from the exposed rafters. The smell of grease was predominant, but barely winning out over the odor of burned nicotine. Archer saw a Maxwell House coffee can full of cigarette butts. He next eyed a fifty-gallon drum marked gasoline with a hose and nozzle attached, and he wondered how the man had not managed to blow or burn himself up. Business looks good, noted Archer in a friendly tone. He really did not want to have to try his luck with the aluminum knuckles against a man the size of this one. He doubted he could reach Lester's chin to see if— Despite his size, it was made of glass. Looks can be deceiving. Lester was the only one to smile at his little joke, and it was a weak, grim effort. In a separate room behind another set of locked slider doors was a vehicle, draped with a brown canvas tarp. Lester flicked on a light and glanced at Howells, who nodded. Archer stood next to Callahan, who had reached out and clutched his arm, as though what was about to be revealed was a wild animal— instead of something you drove on the road. Lester grabbed one end of the tarp and with one tug pulled it free of what was underneath. Damn, Damn, Archer and Callahan said collectively. Howells stepped forward and rubbed the silver trim on the side of the blood-red car, which also had a red convertible top that was now set in the down position. Folks, feast your eyes on a 1939 Delahaye Model 165. Figonian Falashi Convertible Cabriolet. Callahan gushed. It... it looks like it's floating on air. Archer eyed the long hood, which ended in a shiny grill that ran from top to bottom on the front of the vehicle like a knight's metal vestments. Its front and rear fenders looked like waves crashing on a beach and enormous teardrop-shaped pearls, respectively. There were slashes of chrome trim on the sides and running along the bottom of the chassis. It rode so low that he could see only the bare bottoms of the white wall tires. It looks more like a dream than a car, said Archer quietly. Lester said, It ain't no dream, buddy. This baby weighs 3,000 pounds, has a 12-cylinder all-aluminum 4.5-liter engine, triple overhead cam, three downdraft Solex carburetors, and a four-speed transmission with a top speed of around 115 miles an hour. Holy hell, said Callahan. Just the car you want if you're robbing a bank. This comment made Howells and Archer exchange a startled look. Fagonian Falashi, said Archer. Lester replied, Fagonian Falashi were the designers of the car. Delahaye was an engineer, 
and he didn't have an in-house body shop. He built the mechanics of the car and left the body design to coach builders, like Fagoni and Falashi. They make really pretty cars. They're Italians. Howells said, So what say you, Archer? Archer pointed at the front seat. Well, for starters, the steering wheel's on the wrong side. No, the steering wheel is on the right side, for the simple fact that it was built for an Englishman. And that is where a steering wheel is located over there, said Howells. I'm not English, said Archer. And I'm over here, not there. So do you want it or not, said Howells. I can't decide on buying a car I haven't driven. Fair enough. Lester, a key? Lester slipped a key off a hook on the wall and held it out to Archer. Have you ever driven anything like this? Hell, I've never seen anything like this, pal. What a sheltered life I've led. You want me to drive it out of the garage for you so you won't bang nothing up? Archer reached out and took the key from him. I got it. Lester held his hand up without the key for longer than was necessary. For a moment, Archer thought the hand would change to a fist and be swung at him. With his free hand, he felt for the aluminum knuckles in his pocket. He would have preferred a howitzer. But Lester shrugged, lowered his arm, and said, You break it, you bought it, mister. Let's go, Liberty, said Archer. What? Me? I don't see anybody else named Liberty hanging around. They climbed into the car, and Lester pushed the other door open, providing a wide space for the Delahaye to roll through. Archer put the key in the ignition and turned it. Then he hit the starter button, and the car purred to life with suppressed power. Ah, <sighs> sounds like a lion yawning, said Callahan. Howells grinned. This beast hasn't been out of its cage. It needs to run free. Archer worked the clutch and put the car in gear using the tiny gear shift that was mounted on the steering column. The steering wheel was the same color as the car. It was like he was holding a circle of fire in his hands. He was relieved that there was no grinding sound as he geared up, and they pulled through the opening. They passed the other humbled cars, which seemed to bow to the Delahaye like a pride to its king. As they rolled through the double doors, Archer turned on the headlights. They overcame the darkness with stunning visibility. Howells and Lester followed them out. Which way should we go? Archer asked. Well, first things first. Move over, gal, said Howells to Callahan. What? said Callahan, staring up wide-eyed at the old man. You think I'm gonna let you ride off into the night all by your lonesome and the most beautiful car ever built before giving me a dime for it? I'm no car thief, said Archer. Glad you think so. I'm not convinced myself. I can ride with them, said Lester. Hell, Lester, said Howells. I don't think you would fit in there if it was just you. Callahan slid over tight to Archer, and Howells climbed into the car, crowding the other two. Now go west, young man, he said, pointing to the left. That way. Archer pulled onto the road and pressed down the gas. Howells pursed his lips. Come on, Archer, let it rip. Archer mashed the pedal down. The acceleration was immediate, popping their heads back and exhilaratingly so. My goodness, exclaimed Callahan. If this car was a man, I think I'd propose. Chapter 8 So how much are you asking for it? Archer said as they spun around a tight curve in the road before reaching a long straightaway. Howells scratched his cheek, then smoothed down both ends of his white mustache. Like I said, there's only five known 165s around, and a fellow in Beverly Hills, California, just bought one for $12,000. Christ almighty, yelled Callahan. In her agitation, she hit Archer's arm, and he nearly drove the car off the road and into some cacti. Archer quickly righted the vehicle and slowed. He looked down at his hands holding the wheel of a $12,000 car. That amount of money was unimaginable to someone like him. It was far more than a house cost. To his mind, it was far more than anything should cost. I don't have $12,000, Bobby H. I don't know anyone who does besides Rockefeller, and I don't know him. Well, I didn't say that's what I was asking for it. I was just conveying some information to lend you some perspective. Well, you'd have to lend me the twelve grand, too. You said your gambling debts were eighteen hundred fifty dollars, Callahan reminded him. 
Well, yes, but I can't let it go for just that. I'm many things, but an idiot is not one of them. Then I'm not your man. Now hold on, Archer. I'm in a bit of a dilemma, obviously, so let's just have a discussion on what might be possible. Well, twelve thousand dollars will never be possible. Callahan said, Let's hear the man out. Okay, but that's going to have to wait, said Archer as he glanced in the mirror. Why? asked Callahan. Because we have company, and they're coming fast. Both Howells and Callahan shot looks behind them to see a pair of headlights, coming with alarming velocity toward them. Hold on to whatever you need to, said Archer calmly. Then he asked for everything the Delahaye had to give by pushing the pedal all the way to the floor, and the loveliest car in the world responded with the heart of a champion. They shot far ahead of the chase vehicle, which Archer had seen in the moonlight was a big-butted two-tone Buick with a long hood and white wall tires. It wasn't the Buick that had been parked in front of Lester's place, so Archer doubted it was the giant back there. The car receded so fast into the darkness that for a moment Archer imagined he might be on a plane about to take off. Yet no car or plane could outrun a bullet. Archer cut the wheel to the right and then the left as shots flew past them. Callahan shrieked and fell sideways onto Archer's lap as Howells dove to the floorboard. Archer draped one hand over the doorframe and used that as a fulcrum to keep himself rigidly in place as he continued to steer the car in evasive maneuvers. The Delahaye executed every one of these movements with surprising agility for such a heavy car. Aren't you scared? said Callahan, lifting her head and looking up at him as he nimbly whipped the car through a hail of bullets. Sure I am. But I got used to people shooting at me in the War Liberty, he said. And if he gets so scared he can't do something about it, then you probably deserve to die. A bullet glanced off the metal post supporting the windscreen, dinging it. Son of a bitch, screamed Howells, rising up and looking back at the Buick. They put a mark on this car. That's, that's like wiping varnish over the Mona Lisa. It's, it's blasphemy is what it is. If you say so replied Archer. And while it rides nice, it's a little heavy in the turns, Bobby H. You might want to check the front alignment. That's crap, Archer, roared Howells. You're a Philistine who doesn't know how to dance with a queen. Archer cut the wheel to the right, slid into a turn, and said when they came back out on the straightaway, So really, how much do you want for this thing? You want to negotiate now? screamed Callahan, as the Buick appeared behind them and commenced firing again. Well, unless Bobby H. has enemies other than the ones he owes the gambling debts to, then I'm thinking that's them back there. That means they know he has the car now. So how much? Howells said sharply. I can see you're looking to exploit my current situation with your newfound leverage. Wouldn't you? What did you say you could afford again? I didn't. But if you were to ask, I'd say the amount of your debt, 1850. I told you I couldn't take anything close to that. But that would pay off the boys back there, pointed out Callahan, who had now risen and sat with her head below the seat top, her long legs bent, her shoes off, and her feet pressed against the dashboard. This position had allowed her dress to float all the way up to the very tops of her stockinged thighs, and under any other conditions, Archer would have been mesmerized by the view. But not now. I need to do better than that, said Howells, shaking his head. As I intimated earlier, I'm probably going to be back in debt soon. I need a cushion to allow for that. You can see that, surely. And you also said you wanted to have a discussion on what might be possible, noted Archer. Only I haven't seen that discussion yet. And I'm thinking time is running short, unless the Delahaye has wings. Before Howells could respond, Archer downshifted, slammed into a tight turn, and came out high on the curve, then upshifted and laid the pedal to the floor. The Delahaye wound up like a rocket. The landscape was going by so fast that everything was a blur. If another car was up ahead, they were all dead. Lester was wrong, said Archer. How so? asked Howells. In answer, Archer pointed to the speed gauge in the red metal dashboard. We're doing a hundred and twenty-one. Callahan closed her eyes and made the sign of the cross. So how about those discussions? prompted Archer. Howells took a look behind him, swallowed nervously, clutched the edge of the windscreen tightly, and said, 
I can take the 1850 as a start, but there's got to be more down the road. How exactly does that work? asked Archer. When you get to where you're going and get yourself all set up, you send me a hundred dollars a month. Archer shook his head. That's steep. I might not even make that much. Well, I'm a betting man, Archer, as you know, and I'm betting on you to do just fine out there in California. But for how long do I make the monthly payments? Oh, let's say six years, and I like you, so I'm not even going to charge you interest over that time. Well, I'm starting to like you, too. So let's say one year, and I'll allow you to continue not charging me interest. Howells said, Three years, Archer. It's still quite a steal for you. You'll be driving this car as an old man. Two years for a total of 4250 And if I can pay it all off early, I will. You have my word. Jesus H. Roosevelt Christ! screamed Callahan, as more bullets whizzed by them. Okay, that's a deal, said Howells. Archer eyed the mirror. Great. Liberty, take your gun out of your purse. Why? Because I want to make it useful out here. There was a sense of urgency in his voice that compelled Callahan to do just as he asked. She held out the Smith & Wesson. Now what? Do you want me to start shooting? No, I need you to take the wheel. What? How? Put your hands on the wheel. I'll slide under you, and you go over me. I'll keep my foot on the gas as long as I can. Soon as you're in place, you mash it to the floor. Archer, I don't think I can do this. I wouldn't be asking unless I knew you could. And Bobby H. can't drive. Oh, Lord, help me. The Lord helps those who help themselves, interjected Howells in a knowing manner. Oh, shut up, you old fool. You got us into this, and I doubt very seriously you of all people know anything about the Lord. Archer said, go up, now. Callahan put her hands in the wheel, took a deep breath, then arched her back and slid to the right, while Archer sunk low and edged to the left. A moment later, Archer dropped into the middle of the seat, and she into the driver's. Floor it, he called out as he gripped the thirty-eight, turned around in the seat so he was facing backward, and lined up his shot through the revolver's iron sights. Archer turned to Callahan. On the count of three, start to ease off the gas until you get it down to around sixty. But you said— Just do it, Liberty. She gave him a sulky look and waited. One, two— Three. The Delahaye slowed to a hundred, and then eighty, and then stuck at sixty, as Callahan eyed the speed gauge. We're there, she said. The Buick was now catching up fast. Archer aimed, but didn't fire. Wait for it. Wait for it. He placed two quick shots into the grill and followed those with one each in the front tires. When he pulled the trigger again, the hammer banged empty. He was out of bullets but he didn't need any more. Steam immediately started pouring out of the Buick's radiator, covering the windshield in a thick fog. The blown-out front tires wobbled madly, and finally rubber separated from the metal rims, and the treads went spinning off into the darkness. The Buick ended up crashed in a ditch, while the Delahaye roared triumphantly on. Nice shooting there, Archer, complimented Howells. Archer sat forward in his seat and looked at Callahan. You okay to drive? Yes, but I'm sure as hell not going as fast as you did. Okay, the three of us are staying together until the government building opens and we can get the title to the car transferred all official. I got a room, said Bobby H. And I'm sure those boys back there know it too, replied Archer. So that's out. We can stay at my place, said Callahan, drawing surprised looks from both men. Well, it's got two rooms. One of you can sleep on the couch, the other the floor. I'll be in the bedroom. Howells looked at Archer with a pained expression. I got me a real bad back, son. Real bad. Of course you do, said Archer, as the Delahaye roared on. Chapter 9 They had to go up the fire escape to Callahan's place because the landlady was, in Callahan's words, an old battle-axe determined not to let young women have any fun, and that obviously included no men staying the night. They had parked the car in a lean-to attached to a garage behind Callahan's building. Archer had found a cover in the trunk 
and thrown that over the Delahaye. As she led them into a room via the fire escape and then a window, she said, looking at Howells, Now, she probably wouldn't mind you, but Archer is definitely a no-no. Howells seemed to swell up with indignity. I may not be as young as I once was, and who among us is, but I'm still a man who can appreciate female beauty when it is so obviously presented to me. Well, thanks for the compliment, I guess responded Callahan, giving Archer a funny look. Howells took the couch, which was lumpy but serviceable. He took off his hat and coat and shoes, revealing toeless socks, and then promptly fell asleep, his soft snores settling over Archer and Callahan as they watched him. Exciting times must have exhausted him, noted Archer, holding his hat and peering down at the man. Callahan shook her head. I'm not ready for bed. I'm a night owl. What are you ready for? asked Archer. A drink. Afraid my flask is almost empty. I've got a bottle and two glasses hidden away under my bed. Old Fitz Kentucky bourbon work for you? It's sweet, not rye. I like pretty much any grain that's been liquefied. They sat on the fire escape as they sipped their drinks. So, California, huh? said Callahan. Yep. What's out there for you? A private eye named Willie Dash. I'm hoping he'll take me under his wing and teach me the business. So you want to be what? A gumshoe like Humphrey Bogart? Bogey just pretends to be a gumshoe. I want to be one for real. Taking pictures of married men and women cheating? Running down lousy deadbeats for money? Poking into people's secrets? That's your idea of a job. Must be, said Archer bluntly. Because I haven't thought of another one. She cocked her head and appraised him carefully. You could be in the pictures, Archer. Sure, you're rough around the edges, and you're definitely not Cary Grant, but you're all right. And you're tall, and you have broad shoulders, and you got a nice voice. Funny those are exactly the requirements for a private eye. Stop teasing and pour me another drink. He did so, then helped himself to another finger of old fits and settled back against the hard metal of the fire escape. After the wild ride in the Delahaye, it felt good not to be moving or shot at. So you got any family hereabouts? He asked. No, because I'm not from here. Where, then? None of your business. He gave her a bemused look. I thought we were getting along okay. I don't like talking about myself all that much. And I told you where I worked during the war and about my brother and cousin. Hell, that's pretty much my life story. What about you? Where are you coming from? Little town called Poca City, nearly 1,500 miles due east of here. That's one long trip. And my butt and back felt every mile. Never heard of Poca City. I wouldn't recommend you going there and finding out for yourself. You had a bad time there? You could say that, Archer replied evenly. And what were you doing there? Just passing through. He paused, took a drink, and said, so, the car. What would you say to driving west with me? I don't know. How far is this place from Hollywood? They're both in Southern California, but there's a bus to Hollywood from where I'm headed. She eyed him nervously. You looked real good with that gun back there. Everybody looks good with a gun, until they get shot by somebody else with a bigger gun or better aim. I don't necessarily mean that as a compliment. You're no criminal, are you? I mean... You haven't been to prison, right? Do I look like I've been in prison? I don't know. I've never met any ex-cons before. You telling me in a place like Reno there are no ex-cons? I'm sure there are. I've just never met any. That you know of, you mean. They wouldn't exactly come out and tell you. Does that include you, Archer? Archer almost winced at how neatly she'd played him on that one. He finished one more finger of the old fits before answering her. Truth is, I served three years. Got out early for good behavior. Spent my parole time in Poca City. Only reason I was there. Now I'm done with my parole. I'm as free as any other man. What were you in for? If you only spent three years in the slammer, it couldn't have been too bad. She added, hopefully. I didn't hurt anybody and I didn't steal a dime. And I was innocent, by the way. But I guess they all say that. I guess they do. It... 
It was actually about a gal in another car. Her father's. She wanted to get away from him. Start life fresh somewhere. Well, my father's long since dead, but sounds like my situation. It didn't turn out the way I thought it would, for either of us. Did you love her? No, he said sharply. There was nothing like that. Okay, Archer, don't get sore. Maybe I was just trying to be a hero. You know, save the gal. I was just asking, because with a guy and a gal, it usually is about love, or lust, or a combo of the two. He eyed her curiously. You sound like you know all about it. You think you're the only one life's dumped on? I got my bruises, too. Maybe they don't show as well as yours, is all. And I never got to play the hero. So were you the damsel in distress? She finished her drink. I don't recall getting saved one time. Quite the opposite. He put his empty glass down. So I suppose you're riding with me to California's out, then. What makes you say that? He looked up at her in some surprise. I'm an ex-con, whether I deserve it or not. But you gave me half your winnings at roulette when you didn't have to. And I saw how you were with the old guy. You defended him from those thugs when you didn't have to. They could have killed you, and you didn't even really know him. And you saved our lives tonight with a nifty piece of driving and shooting. And you're going to buy a car you don't really need to help that old man from getting killed. And... And what? And we're sitting out here all alone, and you haven't made one move on me. Now, I can tell you that has never happened to me before. At least since my breasts came in. Archer actually blushed at this last remark. She added... And you get embarrassed when a girl says breasts. That makes you all right in my book, Archer. Funny the things you learn along the way. So, California? I can be ready to go after you get the car squared away. What about the dancing birds? What about Mr. Shiner? Oh, they've got lots of gals waiting to take my place. And Mr. Shiner knows I want to go to Hollywood. I'll write him a note in the morning and get it to him. It'll be okay. Archer nodded. Well, I guess we better get some sleep then. Long day tomorrow. I guess so. She leaned over and kissed him on the cheek. What was that for? Just for being a nice guy. There aren't that many out there, least from where I'm sitting. She eyed the window. I've got carpet in my bedroom, if you want to sleep on the floor. Might be easier on you. He eyed her long legs, the curve of her hips and bosom, the hair bouncing off her graceful shoulders, and best of all, the woman's warm, tender smile. For a lot of reasons, and I'm not saying they're all good ones, I'll sleep next to the snoring old man. Are you sure? No, but it might actually be harder, not easier on me if I took you up on your offer. Her smile deepened. Just confirmed everything I've been saying about you, Archer. Yeah, well, good night. Good night. She climbed in one window, and he the adjacent one. And neither one got much sleep at all. Chapter 10 The next morning, with all the paperwork done, Howells shook Archer's hand on the steps of the government building. Well, good luck to you, said Howells, as he folded the cash and put it away in his billfold. And good luck to you, too, Bobby H. But if I were you, I'd get out of town while you still can. Reno isn't a good place for you. You can do better and live longer somewhere else. You might be right about that, Archer. In fact, I'm certain of it. Archer read the man's face like a telegram form. But you're staying? Yes, I am. It's principle, sort of. Convoluted and perhaps nonsensical to some, if not most. But principle all the same. He twirled the ends of his mustache, as though putting an exclamation point at the end of his words. Like I said before, it's your funeral, Bobby H., and I don't mean that metaphorically. I mean six feet under, just like for everybody else. Howell's face crinkled at this remark. You're a good man, Archer. Take care out there in California. What I've heard of the Golden State, there might be danger there as well. There's danger everywhere, if you take the time to look for it, and sometimes even if you don't. By the way, where do I send the payments? Howells took a card from his pocket and passed it across. This address will find me. 
Archer studied the card. It had a street address and read, Robert Howells, care of Reno City Jail, to be held until picked up. So do you live at the jail? Is that where the room you mentioned is? A truly remarkable notion, Archer. Which isn't exactly a no. Archer slid the card into his jacket. You're a strange one you are, Bobby H. So will the beautiful and vivacious Liberty Callahan be making the journey with you? A long trip is better with some companionship. And companionship of a beautiful young woman trumps all other companions of my acquaintance. If you say so. Howells patted his breast pocket and said, Nice doing business with you, Archer. On that, Howells walked off with his head held cockily high and his pocket chock full of money that Archer was sure the man would not use to pay off the debt, but rather lose at gambling. He might be dead before the sun rose the next morning. Archer had already gotten his bag from the hotel and placed it in the trunk of the Delahaye. He hoofed it back to Callahan's building to find her carrying two suitcases down the front steps. She was in her traveling outfit, complete with a hat that had a bird clinging to the side like a barnacle to a hull. He helped her with the bags and closed up the trunk. Then he pulled out the car key and slipped into the right-hand drive seat of the Delahaye while Callahan took up a perch on the left. This is going to take some practice, noted Archer as he put the key in the ignition, turned it, and then thumbed the starter button. The Delahaye roared to breathless life. What's that? she asked. Driving on the wrong side of a car. They headed out of town. People on the streets turned to stare at the ride. It does draw attention, observed Callahan. Yeah, I'm actually not too thrilled about that right now. Too late for that thinking, Archer. Hey, do you even know which way to go? Looked at my nickel map this morning. We basically keep driving west, then we turn south for a bit, then we turn west again, and we stop right before we plunge into the Pacific. Ah, uh, this is so exciting, Archer. Don't you think? Sure, I can barely keep my teeth from chattering. New lives for us both. You a Seamus and me a movie star. I think you have the harder road. Do people shoot at Seamuses? If they do, I got some practice with that last night. She took the thirty-eight special from her purse. Don't worry. I reloaded last night. He shot her a curious glance. You never carry an empty gun around, Archer. What would be the point? Can't argue with that logic. How long will it take us to get there? We'll never make it to where we're going in one day, not even in this rocket ship. We'll have to stop for the night. Archer glanced at the woman in time to see her let slip an anticipatory smile at his remark. He tossed this one around in his brain for a few moments and came away with several possibilities one of which intrigued him, and the others of which bothered him, with at least one of those putting the fear of God in him. He glanced at the dinged metal post, the only blemish on an otherwise pristinely beautiful piece of art, at least according to Howells. Next he focused on the road, but in his head other things commanded his attention. This was the start of a new life for him, or at the very least, the potential of a new life. What if he screwed it up? What if California and his dream of becoming a P.I. came to nothing? Then what would he do? He'd be out there without a dime to his name, in a car he couldn't afford to make the payments on, without the prospects of anything getting better. You look nervous, said Callahan. Archer glanced over to see her staring at him with an earnest look. But then she smiled, which he liked better than earnest. She patted his hand. If it makes you feel any better, Archer... I'm scared, too. Who says I'm scared? You didn't have to say it. I can see it. But we're young. So what if we got a bum ride so far in life? We're looking for something better. So why not take our shot? Easy to say. Hell, Archer, if it were easy, everybody would be fat and happy. Chapter 11 They drove due south toward Carson City and soon passed an enormous body of water. Now that's a sight for sore eyes, said Callahan, considering we're in the middle of a desert. Lake Tahoe, said Archer, as the Delahaye whizzed past it on State Route 27. How do you know that? Read a travel brochure. She eyed the dashboard. 
Does this thing have a radio? Afraid not, said Archer. 1939 apparently was a long time ago. I like George Burns and Gracie Allen. They make me laugh. And they seem to really love each other, even though they're married. Well, that's sort of the point, isn't it? What you don't know could fill a library, Archer. What I don't get is how come on this show Gracie always outsmarts George. Well, they just like to keep it realistic. They crossed into California and then dog-legged southwest before entering the Sierra Nevada mountains. As the ground rose swiftly around them, Callahan clutched the edge of her seat. You okay? asked Archer. I didn't know we had to go through mountains to get there. You ever been to California before? Never. You? When I was in the Army, trained at Fort Ord and then at Camp San Luis Obispo. As they passed close to the edge of a long drop, she closed her eyes and said, Well, I prefer flatland. Well, with the right hand to drive in the direction we're going, I'm the one close to the edge, not you. I'm close enough, thank you very much. They drove past slopes full of chaparral, flatter lands of grass savannas, stands of big-leaf maples and white alders, thick, rugged, live black and blue oaks, and armies of coulter pines. What the hell kind of tree is that? asked Callahan. They were passing what looked to be a whole forest of them. They seemed to reach to the stars, and an army column, complete with armor, could have ridden through an opening in one broad trunk. Giant sequoias, biggest trees there are. We came up here to train a few times, ended up just staring at those suckers for about an hour. They started upward again with jarring swiftness, and Callahan clamped her eyes shut. How'd you end up in Reno? asked Archer trying to draw her mind away from the ascending elevation. She slowly opened her eyes. After the war, I wasn't sure what to do. My brother was dead, and my parents both died before the war started. The factory I worked in closed down, and with all the boys coming back from fighting, there weren't any jobs left for the women. Those who were married went back to their homes and husbands, those who came back anyway. I worked at a diner in Tennessee for a bit, then decided to just pull up stakes, and totally change the direction of my life. So you headed west? Yes, like a lot of people. She eyed him with a heavy-lidded look. Like you. And the stint at the Dancing Birds Cafe? I got to Reno and was wandering around town, checking things out when I literally bumped into Mr. Shiner. I guess he liked the looks of me. I started out working as the hostess, prancing around in my tight little gown getting my butt pinched and my boobs felt up and taking dollar tips from the gents for the privilege. Then I became a waitress. The tips were better, and the ass pinchers had a tougher angle to work with. But I couldn't see a future in it. I was practicing my dancing and singing the whole time, though, you see. Out in Hollywood, the girls have to be able to do lots of things. I read about that in magazines. If I can sing and dance, I can get parts. Bit parts, sure. But then people get to know you, and your roles get bigger. That's how it works. And if you're lucky enough and work hard enough, you get to be a star. Sounds like you gave this a lot of thought, replied Archer. You have to give it thought when you're changing your whole life. Archer considered this. I'm not sure I gave my course change a lot of thinking. It was sort of a spur-of-the-moment thing. Oh, I couldn't afford to do that, Archer. This is my last chance at something big. Why? You're still young? In the movie business, I'm getting close to middle age. I need to get going before the only parts left to me are playing the heroine's spinster aunt. Mm-hmm. Archer checked the mirror. She noticed this and said, You don't think we're being followed. Never can be too careful. They passed over the San Joaquin River and watched the rushing water below. It was the fourth such river they'd crossed. It seemed to Archer that California was a very well-hydrated state. It grew dark as they continued heading south through the San Joaquin Valley, which was flat and filled with plants of every description, and all lush and green. So, are we done with the mountains? asked Callahan, looking relieved. This place is pretty level. Valleys usually are, but no, we're not. We have to go through the Diablo Range next, noted Archer. Then is that it for the mountains? No, there's a whole mess of coastal ranges north to south. 
After Diablo, we cross the Santa Lucia range to get to Baytown, which is where I'm going. Lots of Spanish names in California, she said suspiciously. Well, they did discover it first. Where are we stopping for the night? She asked as she lit up a cigarette and nervously blew smoke to her side of the car. There's a place called Colinga in Fresno County. Route 198 will take us there. Never heard of Colinga. Neither have I, but it's a place to stop. Do we go through the Diablo Mountains to get there? No, it's still pretty much in the valley. It's farmland, mostly level. How much farther after Colinga to Baytown? On these sorts of roads, I'm not sure. We cross the Diablos, head for the coast, and then go south for a way, cross the Santa Lucias, and then go straight for the Pacific. It'd be good if we could make it in one trip, but I'm getting pretty tired, and it's another three hours just to call Inca. Then why don't you pull over and rest your eyes, at least? I don't want us running off a cliff because you're beat. He found a rest area on the side of the road that had a small picnic table and an old rusted charcoal grill. They sat at the table with their coats wrapped around them, since the sinking sun had brought drastically cooler temps, and the winds funneled down the valley had picked up. Callahan had brought a paper sack of sandwiches, and they ate one each and split a fat pickle. As they smoked their cigarettes, and Callahan took a pull on Archer's flask, he said, We'll need to gas up again. We can do that in Colinga, and maybe we can get a cup of coffee. Or a slug of gin. Right. Then we're good until we get to Baytown. And you can be a private eye, said Callahan. Or die trying. Archer glanced over at her. And you can go to Hollywood and be a movie star. And ditto. She looked over at the Delahaye admiringly. Nice ride so far. Except for the mountains, you mean? I'm getting used to them, actually. I can learn to accept pretty much anything. That's real good, lady. Because you're going to have to. They looked up to see three men standing there. Chapter 12 Archer stared over at the trio of intruders. One guy was small, but he stood in front of the other two. He was clearly the leader. Archer sized up the pair as the necessary muscle on a mission of this kind. They were built like pickup trucks, and their expressions betrayed as much intellect as an exhaust pipe. The little fellow was dapperly dressed in a beige serge suit with two-toned shoes, black and gray, toe to heel, and a white felt hat with a black band and ribbon. The hair Archer could see around the temples was slick, just like the facial features. The eyes were dulled ball bearings. His waistcoat was dark gray and matched the shoe color. His tie was dark red and knotted in the double Windsor style. He had a straight line of mustache above a thin, chapped top lip. It looked waxed. He looked waxed. The pair of strong arms was outfitted in forty-six long pinstripes that still looked squeezed by their bulk. Tweedledee held a forty-five loosely at the side of his hammy thigh. His partner in crime cradled a far more menacing Remington side-by-side sawed-off shotgun in his hands like a newborn. They both had matching fedoras, light blue with black bands, and no ribbons thereon. The boss took a step forward, and the big boys did likewise. The menace in their features was palpable. Archer rose from the picnic table while Callahan remained in her seat, staring at the men. Hello, fellas, you lost, said Archer by way of greeting. He pointed to his right. The Pacific's that way, at least I think. The little man snickered, and then apparently thought better of it, and his features turned nasty. We know exactly where we are. If anybody's lost, it's you two. He aimed a finger at Archer, and then Callahan for emphasis that wasn't needed. The shotgun and the forty-five did that just fine. We know where we are and where we're going said Archer. Tweedledee's twin brought the sawed-off up and leveled it at Archer's belly. Archer wasn't prepared to fight a Remington with his bare hands. He couldn't outrun Buckshot, and assuming the fetal position seemed like a lousy idea, too. The fact is, Mac, you ain't going anywhere, said the little man. Archer glanced at Callahan to see her gaze still holding on the three men. She seemed concerned but not desperate. Archer didn't quite know how to read that. Is there something you want? asked Archer, his gaze now swiveling between the little man and the Remington. The night air was suddenly thick with the choking smells of the eucalyptus trees, 
and the chaparral seemed to close upon them like a band of hungry wolves. If Archer dared close his eyes, he could be back in the European theater, on the outskirts of another village, the names of which he could never pronounce. He would be creeping along, he and two buddies, M1s in hand, sig packs in their pockets, dog tags dangling from quivering necks, equal parts hope and dread in their hearts, just wanting to finish the mission of the moment and get back to safety, if there was any to be had in the middle of a world war. The dapper fellow pointed to the Delahaye. Archer followed the finger. You want the car? What a smart guy you are. There was no joviality behind the remark, only stark insult. Archer eyed the muscle. There was nothing behind their eyes. They were here to dispose of a nuance. Two nuances. You've been following us, right? Ever since you left Reno. Wasn't that hard. Roads like this. You can only go one way. Probably why you never eyed us. Reno, really? Yeah, really. You happen to know somebody named Robert Howells? The man grinned. He was the one who told us you were heading to California. This was after we roughed him up a little. Made it easy to follow you. It was one of my guys who put the ding in that car last night. And you ruined my Buick, pal. You owe me for that. I'm here to collect. Okay, but why do you want the car? Howells was going to pay you off with the money he got for it. Yeah, the thing is, he owed me a lot more than he got from you. How do you know how much he got from me? The man pulled out a wad of cash. Because as soon as he left you, I took it from him and counted it. He owes another six grand. I figure the car will make up the difference. He didn't mention knowing you that much. If he did, I'm surprised he let the car go for what I gave him. The thing is, old Bobby H. must have forgot to add in the interest. At a hundred percent a day, it adds up quick. Yeah, I bet. And where is Howells now? asked Archer, his face starting to tingle. The man gave him a forced grin. You ain't that stupid, are you? You didn't have to kill him, you know. I don't remember asking for your opinion. Callahan broke the silence. If you take the car, how the hell do we get out of here? Archer couldn't believe the woman was serious with her question, and when he looked over at her, he could tell by her expression that she wasn't. Maybe she was stalling for time, allowing Archer to come up with a plan. What a disappointment he would be for her. That won't be a problem for you, said the little man. Well, I don't find that acceptable, said Callahan. Archer almost laughed at this comment, but when he looked at her, the thought of humor faded. The little man seemed to want to say something, but the words stalled in his throat. He just shrugged, lit a half-smoked cigarillo, and contemplated the dirt for a few moments. Take the car, said Archer, and we can walk to where we're going. The muzzle of the cigarillo came up and pointed in Archer's direction. Like the Remington, it seemed a direct threat to his personal well-being. Archer added, We don't know you from Adam. You'll be long gone before we reach a telephone box or a cop. Why make two bodies if you don't have to? Stealing a car is one thing. The other is something else. The gas chamber at San Quentin is a shitty way to kick it. Smoke curled off the end of the cigarillo and lifted to the sky, like a fragment of a memory gone to heaven. Archer looked up at the sky, and when his gaze came back down, the little man was staring dead at him. No can do, pal. I never did like loose ends. Archer felt his adrenaline actually ease for some reason. This unusual physiological reaction in the face of danger came from his fighting in the war. If you wanted to live, you had to remain calm. He moved to his left, drawing the attention and angle of attack of the thugs. Don't try to run, said the little man. It won't matter, and you'll just embarrass yourself, Mac. I don't remember asking for your opinion, said Archer. And just so you know, the outer killing range on a sawed-off is about six feet. I'm double that. He eyed the forty-five. And in the dark, that revolver is bumping against the wall of accuracy at ten feet. He took a long stride backward. And now I'm at fifteen feet. Son, don't end your time looking like a fool, said the little man somberly. Have some self-respect and let's get this over with nice and clean. Archer moved in a slow curve, and they curved with him. Sawed off, perhaps sensing a loss of control of the situation, took a few quick strides forward. Still not enough, said Archer. 
The buckshot will sting, but it won't kill. He didn't really believe this, but then he didn't have to. Now forty-five moved forward, joining his twin along the line of attack. The little man, sensing the end coming, took a step back, burned off the remnants of his smoke, and dropped it to the dirt. The orange embers winked dead in the darkness like a miniature sun burrowing into the horizon. Now just hold still, said Forty-Five, his voice surprisingly high-pitched for such a big larynx. He took aim with the revolver, but Archer could see his dominant arm shaking like a twig in a breeze. Forty-Five clearly wanted to be big and tough, but maybe he was just big. Archer kept moving for two more strides, turning the men's attention even more fully to him. What they hadn't foreseen was that his movements had put their backs to Callahan. They seemed to have forgotten all about the woman. That was about to change, but not exactly in the way Archer intended. Callahan fired, and her thirty-eighth round hit sawed off right in the shoulder plate. He grunted once as the slug penetrated first skin, then tendon, then severed bone, and plowed right through an intersection of blood vessels. He groped around, pawing with his free hand at the entry wound and screaming in pain. His hat came off and landed in the pool of blood now avalanching from him, for the shot had split a fat artery right in two. Snot blew out of his nose in his rage and fear and pain. He threw up whatever he'd last eaten and drunk, fouling the air. A urine stain emerged around his zipper as the shock of the rounds hitting him overcame his ability to hold this bodily function in check. His fingers lost their strength, and the Remington hit the hard dirt. The impact with the ground must have sprung its filed-down hair triggers, because the twin barrels of the sawed-off boomed sideways and caught forty-five at both ankles, with hundreds of pebbles of angry buckshot at a distance of about seven inches, severing that part of his body as neat as a bone saw, and miraculously leaving him upright. At that range, the sawed-off wasn't a gun, it was a bomb. The big man looked down and saw that his black wingtips and the feet in them were resting next to him instead of under him. He was suddenly three inches shorter and standing on twin shattered bone tips, and his mind didn't seem able to cope with this because he made no sound. He toppled sideways but fired his gun, maybe as a knee-jerk reaction. He killed a eucalyptus tree next to Archer. Forty-five commenced dying as he lay on the ground, probably not knowing who or what had killed him. Archer watched as the man turned to him, his hemorrhaging eye an inch above the forest floor. The man blinked once, then shock took over. He convulsed once, then again, and the eye closed, and the man died quick and silent. Archer knew that pulling the trigger and killing a man was easy. What was hard— was everything leading up to that point, and everything coming after it. Archer turned to Sawdoff. He, too, had left this life in a dark, burgundy spread of blood that the dirt did not seem to want, because it lay on top of the ground like water in a pool. Don't, the voice barked out. Archer turned to see Callahan, now pointing her Smith and Wesson at the little man, who, dazed by the sudden elimination of his comrades, had pulled a twenty-two Derringer from his waistcoat, was pointing it around, though Archer could tell the fellow had no firm idea of an actual target. Don't do it, Callahan said. Her voice was assured, in command, with an ice-in-the-veins sort of rhythm. It was like a dagger needling your ribs before it went in for the kill. Archer looked at her. Unlike forty-five, there wasn't a twitch in her gun hand. The Smith and Wesson was held as sure and steady as a foot-round oak branch in still air. Callahan's features looked like the mountain peaks they'd passed, chiseled, foreboding, impenetrable. The last one got to Archer the most, confounding him. The little man dropped the Derringer and backed away from it, his hands palm up in front of him, as though that would matter against the thirty-eight. Okay, okay, he said, a line of sweat glistening around the whiskers above his lip. Don't do nothing crazy, lady. You mean, kill you? Like you were going to kill us? So who's crazy? Please, lady, he moaned. Don't please me, she retorted. It's a little late for that. Archer said, It's over, Liberty. Just let him go. She spoke without looking at him. 
And let him do what? Keep following us? Tell somebody else what happened? I killed a man, Archer. In self-defense. I shot him in the back. I'm your witness to what happened. The little man said, He's talking sense, and all the fight's gone right out of me. Wish I'd never come up here. I'll take my money and go. You got my word, honest to God. Too late to be talking about God, snapped Callahan. Just wait a minute, said Archer. You can't trust guys like this, Archer. They say one thing and do another. She took closer aim with her revolver. And he confessed to killing Bobby H. Archer stepped forward, blocking her sightline. Killing a man in self-defense is one thing. This is something else. And I'm no saint, but I can't be party to something else. So you might as well shoot me first and then him, because I can't let that go. I like you, Archer, but I'm not sure I like you that much. Well, keep this in mind. We have more mountains to go over. You want to drive it alone? Go ahead. This did what apparently her conscience could not. She lowered her gun. Pick up his piece and the shotgun and the revolver. Archer did as she asked, holding the trio of weapons so their barrels pointed to the dirt. Where's your car? Callahan asked the little man. Around the bend back there. Show us. He led them around a curve in the road. It was a wonder they hadn't heard the engine, but the wind up here was loud, funneled between the peaks. It was a Chrysler sedan painted an ugly green with the biggest chrome bumper Archer had ever seen. It was large enough for him to take a nap on. You got a spare tire? asked Callahan. Of course, replied the man. She shot out the Chrysler's right front tire, and the air hissed out as the rubber fell flat. She lowered her gun, studied what she'd done, and said, I still want to shoot him. I know, said Archer, drawing a sharp look from her. But I say we get back in the car and keep going. I'll go along with that plan, for now. She eyed the man, who looked like a fellow who thought he was still on death row. You follow us? Archer won't save you next time. You go back to where you came from and stay there, and you keep your mouth shut. She lifted her thirty-eight and took aim at a spot between his ball-bearing eyes. The man backed away. Yes, ma'am. One more thing, said Archer. He walked over to the man and drilled him so hard in the face with his fist that the fellow was lifted off his feet and slammed against the side of the car before crumpling to the dirt. That was for Bobby H. If I ever see you again, I'll be the last thing you ever see. The man sat on the ground holding his broken nose and sobbing in pain. Callahan turned and walked back to the delay. Let's go, Archer. Archer stood there for a bit until she was almost out of sight. Then he did just as she said. Chapter 13 The Delahay prowled through the valley like a muscular river drilling through rock. Archer had placed the weapons they'd taken in the trunk. Both he and Callahan were visibly shaken by what had happened. Archer's mind was going a million miles an hour, and Callahan looked pale and distraught. I guess you think I'm a bad person, Callahan said quietly finally breaking the silence after about twenty-five minutes of nothing but the French car's purr. I don't think anything one way or another. Girls have to know how to take care of themselves, Archer. At least this girl does. You think that just applies to guys? No, but maybe I assume, just like all other guys. Assume what? That gunplay is for the men. Clearly I'm wrong about that. Fact is, my daddy taught me to shoot starting when I was eight years old. I could barely hold the deer rifle. He taught you well. I was not an easy shot tonight with the bad light and distance. He was as big as a barn. If I'd missed that lug, I'd need glasses. And the other guy died from an accident, so that had nothing to do with me. Archer downshifted as the road began to curve sharply. They put up the car's top because the temperature had dropped and the wind was pushing the cold into them like a railroad spike between the ribs. How about the little man, then? You are going to shoot him in cold blood. Maybe I was bluffing. Don't think so. She lit up a camel and blew a puff of angry smoke at him. How the hell do you know? How the hell do you know anything about me? I've seen you gamble. You don't have a poker face. She gave him a sideways glance that Archer, who was doing the same to her, felt to his toes. He wasn't sure how to properly read the situation. 
mainly because he'd never met a woman like Callahan before. So is that my fault or hers? With an exhale of camel smoke, followed by a brush at her hair with a shaky index finger, she said, Do we have to tell anybody about it? I think there might be trouble if we don't. She cranked her window down and flicked her camel away. It caught a shaft of wind and glanced off an oak before sinking into the asphalt. She cranked the glass back up. Archer continued. Now we have to think this through. They're going to find the bodies. It was at a picnic area. Folks are going to stop there just like we did. They're going to unwrap their sandwiches, take out the potato salad, pour coffee out of the thermos, and then look around and start puking. Maybe the other guy will get rid of the bodies, she said. Why would he do that? He's got exposure too, Archer. He's a criminal, not us. We were just protecting ourselves. Archer shook his head. I told Howells to get the hell out of Reno. And now he's dead. She shot him a look. So I say, we forget it happened. And if anybody asks, we don't know anything. Two murderers are dead. So what? They got what they deserved. He glanced at her purse. Well, no matter what, you might want to do something with the Smith & Wesson, then. Why? Because you're slugs in the man's back, that's why. They can match bullets. And speaking of, we need to get rid of the guns in the trunk. She started to bite at a nail painted bright green until it bled as she thought about this. Are we still stopping at Kalinga? Right now I feel like I'm never going to close my eyes again. But we need gas, and I need some coffee. And staying someplace feels like the right thing to do. We both can sort of calm down. Can I have a pull on your flask? He worked it free from his pocket and passed it across. She took a healthy swallow, sucked her lips inward in satisfaction, and recapped the flask. That's better. You want a shot? She asked, holding it out. I've had enough shots for today, thanks. He pointed to the river rushing parallel to the road. That's a good spot to dump them. Okay, Archer, go ahead. But not my gun. We might need it in case that guy comes after us again. He got out, grabbed the shotgun, Derringer, and forty-five from the trunk, walked down to the riverbank, and tossed them all in. He watched them float for a few moments in the strong current, and then they were gone, like fog in the heat of a rising sun. He walked to the car, got back on the road, and sped up. You feel better? She asked. Yeah. How about you? In a tone he had not heard her use before, she said, I... I killed a man back there, Archer. I... I'm not sure I'll ever feel right again. He saw her hands suddenly start to shake, and the muscles around her throat tense. Sweat bubbles rose up on her forehead. He quickly pulled off the road, leaned over, and opened the door. Go ahead, do it out there, quick. She jumped out and ran behind a tree, and he could hear her being violently sick. She came back a couple minutes later rubbing at her mouth. Then she got into the car and shut the door. You okay? She nodded but still looked unwell. Sometimes there's a delayed reaction, like your mind can't wrap itself around something right away. Yeah. They were going to kill us, Liberty, like you said. She pressed her face against the cool glass, closed her eyes, and exhaled a long breath. Yeah. Now just shut up and drive. Chapter 14 Kolinga wasn't a thriving metropolis, nor was it the one-horse town Archer thought it was going to be. Liberty eyed the welcome sign. Where'd they get the name Kolinga? Is it Spanish? He pointed to his right. There's a railroad spur over there, and those are loaded coal cars, so maybe there's your answer. It was nearly ten o'clock, and the town seemed to be sound asleep, with no one out and most of the buildings closed up. I don't know if we can get gas or coffee now, or we might end up sleeping in the car till morning, said Archer, because the filling station over there is shut down for the night, and this doesn't look like a two-gas-pump kind of town. There's a light on in that building over there. They stopped in front and climbed out. The air was cool and dry, and the wind had died down some. Archer slipped on his hat and locked up the Delahaye. The sign out front of the building read, Clancy's Saloon. Open at noon, close whenever. I like Kolinga better already, 
said Callahan as she saw this too. Archer held the door for her and they walked in. The 400 square feet inside consisted of a mahogany bar with ten backless stools, a jukebox with neon tubes blinking wearily, four tables with a pair of low-backed chairs designed in the form of a ship's wooden wheel around each, a small dance floor made of scratched herringbone parquet, on which not a soul was dancing, and a payphone on the wall. A pencil dangled from a string tacked to that wall, and lines of phone numbers had been scribbled across the paint like math equations. A small window behind the bar was where the food came through for the patrons seated there. A single swing door to the left of that was where the meals came through for the dining area. Two men sat at the bar, one young and lean, one old and spreading. They both held mugs of beer, and both looked to be listing to the right in alcoholic zeal. Behind the wooden counter was a beefy man with curly red hair, a stained white apron, and shirt sleeves rolled up to reveal twin anchor tattoos, one on each forearm. A cigar was clamped on one side of his wide, toothy mouth. He was staring down at the cloth in his hand like he was wondering how it had gotten there. Of the four tables, only one was occupied. On one side was a woman in her fifties with white hair and a long, horsey face. Her cherry-red purse sat on the table next to her plate of raw oysters on the half-shell, and a bourbon, neat, percolating in a short glass. Across from her was a gentleman, also in his fifties, suited in a three-piece worsted wool with a loosened dark tie. He was chubby and sweaty, and his napkin was pinned across his white shirt front like a bullseye. A plate of spaghetti and clams lay in front of him, and he methodically worked his fork and spoon in tandem as he ate. He had a glass of red wine as his meal's liquid companion. At first no one looked up when they walked in. Then Chubby with the clam saw Callahan, and made such a fuss that white hair turned to sea. Her long face became pinched and sour. She turned back to her table mate and said something low, snappy, and apparently pointed as a spear, because the clams once more became Chubby's sole focus. The bartender looked up, saw Callahan, grabbed a glass, and started polishing it to a fine sheen, a sloppy grin spreading across his face, as though he'd just won a prize that would take him away from here. The young drunk turned, eyed Callahan, and almost fell off his stool. The old drunk would probably have done likewise, but he had already fallen face first into the mahogany and was now snoring. The swinging door did its thing, and a woman in her twenties with sandy brown hair and short muscular legs, and attired in a light brown waitress uniform with faded red piping, came out carrying a platter of clean glasses. She saw them and pointed with her free hand to a table. Have a seat. Be with you folks in a sec. Archer and Callahan sat, and after the waitress deposited the glasses in a double-door wooden cabinet, she came over with menus and cloth napkins folded around cutlery. She handed it all out and said, Can I get you something to drink? If you want food, the kitchen closes in twenty minutes. Then we must be getting close to whenever, noted Archer. Yeah, you're the first person to come up with that line she said in a bored tone. I'll have coffee, Black, said Archer. You folks know how to make a gimlet? Yes, we've done those before. Great. Then a gimlet chaser for the coffee, and go easy on the roses, and let the gin make its mark for me. Or do I tell that to the friendly behind the bar? I'll give him the order, she said as she turned to Callahan. And you, ma'am? You got cranberry juice? asked Callahan. Yes. Is that all you want? Yeah, so long as it goes with the vodka. The woman grinned and gave Archer a condescending look. Now that's wit, buckaroo. I'll get your drinks. Archer took his hat off and set it on the table. He looked around the room. He'd been in bars better than this, and lousier than this. The same alcohol was served here that was dished out in the best bars in the world. L.A., New York, Paris, London, and Berlin, what was left of it. So in that respect, a bar in Colinga, California, was as good as any of those. But Archer was still in Colinga, and not Paris. Callahan slipped out a camel and tapped the lighting end on the hard surface to make the tobacco as good as it could be. You think that little goon headed back to Reno? She said. Archer shrugged. Maybe. He's out of guns and bigger goons. I don't see him following us alone. 
He might still come after us with some other muscle. Good luck finding us. California's a pretty big place. That's true, she replied, her spirits seeming to lift. They sat there in silence until his coffee and gimlet came along with her cocktail. The waitress pulled out her pad and pen. You folks had a chance to look over the menu? No more oysters and no more clams, by the way. What would you recommend? asked Archer. The steak. We got two pieces left. And baked potato. We got two of those left, too. Steak and potatoes. Why didn't I think of that? said Callahan. Sold. Make it a deuce, added Archer. The waitress went off. Archer drank down the rest of his coffee and turned his attention to the gimlet. Callahan shot him a nervous glance. You're looking pensive again, Archer. You still want to go on to Hollywood? She gave him a pointed look that seemed to peek right into his soul. She finished a long drag on her smoke before saying, That was the original plan. You see any reason why I should change it? Yeah, two of them. Same as the number of bodies we left up in the mountains. Do we have to go over that again? Hear me out. Okay. She sat back and crossed one long leg over the other, which rode her skirt way up, and commenced to jiggling her foot, letting her high heel dangle precariously off her toes. Chubby glanced over and saw this, and seemed to whimper before his companion kicked him under the table. It might be better if we stuck together, at least for a while. You mean, if he comes after us with more goons? Yeah. But you said he wouldn't be able to find us, Archer. I know I did, but I've been thinking about that. I'm not sure I didn't let it slip when I was in Reno about where I was headed. And the Delahaye sort of sticks out. And if you go to Hollywood and start making a name for yourself, he sure as hell knows what your name is. He would have gotten it from Howells. Mine, too. But then should we go to Baytown? If he knows that's where you'll be. I have to, Liberty. I want a shot at this job. And I told the guy I'd be coming. Archer now looked uncertain. But maybe you shouldn't go to Baytown. Maybe you should go to Hollywood. But change your name. All those folks do, right? But if I get in pictures, he'll recognize me. Even if I change my name. Hell, he might even try to blackmail me. Archer nodded slowly. That's true. So what do you want to do? I think we should stay together, she said, and go to Baytown. I can hang around long enough to see if the guy shows up. But you don't have to do that. You can go lie low somewhere else. And leave you all by your lonesome? What kind of a think do you think I am? They sat in silence until their meals came. Archer was lost in thought, and Callahan was lost in more camels. They ate and put down money for their bill. When the waitress came over to collect it, Archer asked if there was a place to stay the night. Yes, it's right down the street, called the Kalinga House. They do overnights, and they have vacancies right now. Not card. They might have gone to bed. Mildred Hawks is the owner's name. She's nice. Tell her Katie sent you. They walked out, got into the delay, and drove the short distance to the Kalinga House. It was a broad plank and brick building, with a porch down the front and a row of rocking chairs lined up like toy soldiers alongside little pots with fresh flowers. There was a concrete statue of a kitten playing cute on the first step up to the porch. Well, at least it doesn't look like a place where we can get into too much trouble, Archer. The door was painted red, and Archer had to pound on it for a full minute before they heard footsteps pecking on the floor toward them. The door opened, and there stood, presumably, Mildred. She was in her sixties with long braided gray hair flipped over one granny-robed shoulder. She looked sleepy and annoyed at the same time. Yes. We need a place to stay, said Archer. Just got in town. Katie at Clancy's recommended you. I'm assuming you're Mildred. Mildred nodded warily and then eyed Callahan with a severe eye. I've only got one room available. Callahan said. One is all we need. Then you're married, she said. We're driving in from Reno. Who goes to Reno except to get hitched? Mildred's gaze swept down to their hands. And where are your rings, then? Callahan's expression turned to one of despair. Can you believe it? We were robbed on the way. We've reported it, but the police don't hold out much hope. If you were just married, 
You must have your certificate. That was with the things that were stolen, said Callahan mournfully. Along with something borrowed and something blue. Crappy way to start a honeymoon, huh? I've had to work hard not to cry my eyes out. The stream of lies so confidently told seemed to soften Mildred up. She opened the door wider. I have a place at the top of the stairs. Bathroom down the hall. That sounds perfect, replied Callahan. She turned to Archer. Well, honey? Well, what? said Archer. Aren't you going to carry me over the threshold? She looked at Mildred. Men, right? They're like little boys who have to be constantly told to blow their noses and to lift the seat on the toilet. Mildred gave her a knowing look and stepped back out of the way. Okay, young man. Go ahead. Do your duty. He picked Callahan up effortlessly, swung her through, and set her down. There you go, honey, he said. Hope you're happy. Mildred said, Well, aren't you going to kiss, too? That's all part of it. Callahan and Archer exchanged nervous glances. Sure, said Callahan. She leaned over and planted a kiss on Archer. She was about to pull away, but then didn't. They wrapped their arms around each other and lingered. When they pulled apart, each looked as surprised as the other. A breathless and flushed Callahan smoothed down her dress while Archer adjusted his tie. Mildred said, Well, you two are definitely married. I know love when I see it. On that comment, neither Callahan nor Archer would look at the other. There's a pot of coffee on that table over there in the morning, said Mildred. Let's get you signed in. Later, after they were in their room, they took turns changing in the bathroom down the hall. Archer put on dark pajamas and Callahan a long white sleeping gown with a slit of interesting elevation, a few fluffy feathers, and nothing on underneath. They lay in the one narrow bed, and Callahan said, You really thought I'd just up and leave you to those killers? He turned to the side to look at her. She did likewise, perching her cheek on her palm as she studied him. It's not like you owe me anything, Liberty. We're friends, aren't we? We just met. So is there a rule that you have to know somebody a certain amount of time before they can be friends? No. And it seems to me that we've already shared a bunch of stuff that people who are friends their whole lives haven't. Well, being almost killed on three separate occasions over the span of 24 hours is unusual. I'll give you that. Do you consider yourself my friend? Yes, I do, he said. Okay, then it's all settled. She lay back down, but Archer didn't move. He just watched her. She seemed to sense this because she said, Under normal circumstances, Archer, I'd be having certain feelings for you lying here like we are, especially after that kiss. She shot him a glance full of curiosity. Just so you know. Nothing remotely normal about our circumstances, but I feel the same way. Just so you know. This made her smile. She reached out a hand, and he took it. Archer lay back down, and they both fell asleep, hand in hand. Chapter 15 Archer was up early, and he brought a sleepy Callahan a cup of coffee from the pot Mildred had mentioned. After that, he took the Delahaye for a gas fill-up. When he got back, Callahan was dressed and ready to go. That's some traveling outfit, noted Archer as he observed the hip-hugging white dress that fell to above her knee and showed enough cleavage to make a man temporarily forget his name. Her heels were high in the color of lavender, and the slim leather belt around her waist was black. Her hair fell to her shoulders, and her head was topped by a turban, the color of which matched her shoes. If I'm going to be a star, I have to look the part. So, you think I look okay? That would not be the adjective I would use. What would be the adjective? She asked, her eyes lifting to meet his gaze. I think I'll keep that to myself. And I have to compete with that damn car. I feel like such a second billing. Don't worry. Guys like cars, but they like beautiful women better. That's the nicest thing you've said to me all morning, Archer. Now let's blow this joint. He was loading the bags into the trunk of the Delahaye as a prowler drifted by. The two cops inside gave the Delahaye and then Archer long looks before floating onto the next street. 
By the time they were about to drive off, the prowler had drifted back downstream and docked next to them. The passenger side window was cranked down, revealing the meaty face of a guy in his forties with a clean-shaven slab of skin that was sunburned and windburned around the neck and forehead. His brown hair was cut close to the scalp. Archer thought he might be ex-military. His shoulders were wide enough to swallow the window on the prowler. His partner was tall and reedy, and seemed not nearly as interested in them as Meaty was. Nice car, said the cop. Yeah, isn't it? replied Archer with a friendly grin. He wanted this to go only one way, when it could so easily go the other. Where'd you get something like that? Meaty had apparently read the name located on the chrome front of the car, because he said, Uh, Della, hey? What the hell is that? French made, but it was built for an Englishman, which is why the steering wheel's on this side. Where'd you get it, pal? Archer had been expecting this, and said, From a collector over in Reno. He had some money setbacks and needed to sell. You look pretty young to have the dough to lay down for this piece of chrome. Yeah, it was a sweetheart deal, but I have to keep paying on it for a while. The cop pushed back his cap and thought about this, his eyes going back and forth, and then reaching to Archer's eyes and holding like the searchlight bolted to the side of the prowler. Archer didn't like that look. It was probing and distrustful, and seemed to be angling for any reason to bust his head open and put the cuffs on. Pretty much every cop he'd ever run into had, at some point, given him that very same look. You got papers to prove that? If you really need me to get them, yeah. The cop's features turned to stone at this slight pushback, and the glare he shot Archer was all official and aggressive, and the look of a dog who just found a dinosaur bone to crack open and then devour. Let me tell you something, buddy, he began sharply. Callahan stuck her head around Archer's. Are you from Kalinga, officer? She smacked him with an ear-to-ear -ear smile. He eyed her features and grinned. Born and bred, ma'am. I'm from back east, but I wouldn't have minded growing up here. Yes, ma'am. Then the cop's grin faded as he looked at the Delahaye's damaged windscreen post where the bullet had struck. Next, his gaze dropped to the door panel and held there. His expression grew even more serious. Felony serious, thought Archer who was noting every changing nuance of this little confrontation. What the hell is that? the cop asked, pointing. Archer dropped his gaze and saw it. His first instinct was to hit the gas. His second was to look up to see the cop watching him closely. Looks like blood to me, said the cop. What's it look like to you, mister? Archer knew that blood was exactly what it was. My car had been parked in the picnic area near the shootout. The blast from the shotgun had obviously driven some of the dead man's blood spatter onto the Delahaye's metal. Archer hadn't noticed it in the dark, and for some reason hadn't noticed it in the light of morning either. It was, unfortunately, clearly revealed to him now. We hit something on the road last night. A deer, a coyote, some animal. Bang the windscreen, and then I guess it brushed the side of the car. But no dent, said the cop, getting out to look closer. His buddy joined him, coming around the side of the prowler, his hand on the butt of his leather-holstered Colt forty-five. He looked like he wanted something to shoot. You'd expect a dent, right, Jimmy? Meaty said, looking at his partner, who had an Adam's apple so pronounced it looked like a tumor. Ain't no dent that I can see. You hit a deer or a big cat, you're gonna have a dent, or at least some paint scratches, yes, sir. Something weird going on here. I got me some questions, mister. He bent down to look closer, while Jimmy kept his distance, probably in case he had to draw and shoot Archer on the fly. Meaty looked up and said, Step out of the car, buddy. It was right then that Callahan got out of the car and came around to them. Both cops took a whiff of her nectary perfume and came to rigid attention, like a bailiff had just called the court to order. Archer was gratified that their full focus was on the lady in her tight dress, rather than the blood and absence of dents. I was driving at the time when we hit something. Scared the bejesus out of me, she said. Didn't it? She added, looking at Archer. The bejesus, repeated Archer. Bejesus, that's an Irish term, said Meaty. Hey, are you Irish, miss? 
She put out a gloved hand for him to shake. Name's Callahan. Liberty Callahan. So that would be a yes. I am most definitely Irish officer. His grin threatened to run off both sides of his face. He pointed to the name sewn onto his uniform. I'm Sean. Sean Regan. My parents came from the county of Offaly. My grandparents were from Cork. Talk about a small world. He turned and looked at his partner. Hell, Jimmy, this gal's family's from Cork. Jimmy couldn't take his gaze off Callahan's prominent bosom. Cork, was all he managed to say. Archer noted that Callahan stood so that she was entirely blocking the door panel. I'm heading to Hollywood. I want to be in the pictures. She put a hand on her hip and bumped it out and placed the other hand behind her long neck, turned into a profile shot, curved that long neck back like a swan's, and hit them with a dazzling smile. Think I have a shot? Tell me the truth now, fellas. Regan said, Hell, you're lots prettier than Rita Hayworth. He glanced down at her stockinged legs. Ain't that right, Jimmy? Jimmy looked like he had downed two bottles of Old Forester as a warm-up to really hitting the juice. Cork, he said throatily. Jimmy was down for the count, Archer concluded. He'd probably forgotten about his Colt forty-five, or the fact that he was even a cop. And Regan wasn't far behind. You are so sweet. She gave Regan a hug, and Archer watched the cop's hands slide down to her buttocks. He made his landing and dug into her soft flesh. She made no attempt to move his fingers back to a respectable spot. Archer had to appreciate the lady's self-control. When Callahan stepped back, she said, I was so nervous, but you've cheered me up to no end. So thank you, and now I'll let you go on your way. I know how important police work is. My uncle's a cop in Boston. Regan beamed. Now there's a big city, all right. They say on St. Paddy's Day, every bar in Boston gives free drinks to every Irishman. Is that true? Every Irishman and Irish woman, she added giving him another broad side of a smile, fired right from the biggest quarter-deck cannon she had. He chuckled and tipped his cap at her. Best of luck to you, Miss Callahan. She did a little curtsy. Thank you kindly, Officer Regan. They climbed into the prowler. Regan gave one more enthusiastic wave, and they were gone. Just like that. It was hard for Archer to believe everything that had just happened was not a byproduct of his imagination— or a drunken binge. Callahan watched them until they were out of sight, and then got back in, tugging her dress sharply so the hem wouldn't get caught in the door as she closed it. Okay, now I'm convinced, said Archer. She looked at him curiously. Of what? That you actually might make a go of it as an actress. That wasn't acting, Archer. That was just lying. Isn't that the same thing? I don't know. I've done a lot of one, but not necessarily the other. I was lucky about the Irish thing. What lucky? I saw Regan's name sewn into his uniform. And I am Irish. I thought I would give it a shot. What could we lose, right? Is your family from Cork? Hell, who knows? Now let's get out of here before that dumb Mick forgets the pleasure of grabbing my ass and remembers the blood and no dent. So hit it. And so Archer hit it. Chapter 16 Hours later, Callahan awoke with a start and looked over at Archer. Only he wasn't there. The car was empty except for her. The Delahaye was pulled off to the side of the road, next to a river. She looked out the window and saw Archer skimming rocks across the water. She slipped her heels back on and got out, walking carefully over to him across the uneven terrain. What are you doing? She asked. Just taking a break. You were asleep. Seemed like a good time to stop. He reached down and picked up an opened bottle of Coke. Got this back in Kolinga at the filling station. Just cooled it in the river for a few minutes. She took the bottle from him and took a couple of swallows before handing it back. So, where are we? Salinas Valley. He pointed at the water. That's the Salinas River. Its mouth is way up at Monterey Bay. It's beautiful around here. It's farmland and very fertile, nearly a hundred miles of it in the valley. Mountains on both sides. They raise a lot of crops here. Were you a farmer? Never plowed a field a day in my life, but I can read. You ever heard of the Grapes of Wrath? 
I saw the movie. Henry Fonda, right? Right. At first it was a novel by a fellow named John Steinbeck. The title comes from a line in the song, The Battle Hymn of the Republic. Read it when I was in college. He took a drink of the Coke. It's about the Jode family. The Depression and the Dust Bowl wiped out their farming prospects in Oklahoma, so they gathered all the possessions they had left, converted their sedan into a rattling truck, and set off for California for a better life. Now Callahan looked interested. Well, hell, that's what we're doing. She took the Coke from him and took another swallow before handing it back and settling her gaze in the rushing water and the picturesque land beyond. He continued. The trip didn't turn out too well. Some died on the way, and when they got to where they were going, the good-paying jobs turned out not to exist, at least for them. The Jodes fell on hard times. It got pretty bad. Well, then, I'm surprised you want to go anywhere near California. There's a line in the book I'm partial to. What is it? How can you frighten a man whose hunger is not only in his own cramped stomach, but in the wretched bellies of his children? You can't scare him. He has known a fear beyond every other. So, what fear beyond every other have you known, Archer? Archer handed her the coke and spun a beauty of a sick skipper over the face of the Salinas as the sun blazed down on them. He tipped his hat back. Life, really, Liberty. Just life. How about you? She gave him a look that was between a sob and a smirk. Hell, Archer, I'm a woman. So, yeah. I can say the same. Archer was about to skip another rock, but then let it drop. He put his hands in his pockets and stared out over the water. Don't leave me in suspense, Archer. How'd it really end for the Jodes? Were they all dead? Or did it turn into a fairy tale and they woke up rich? Some of them fought back, tried to do the right thing, organize labor, that sort of thing, fight the rich men. Sort of like trying to beat a Sherman tank with a pistol for all the good it'll do you. But if a man doesn't even try... Or a woman, Archer, she said firmly. Or a woman, he conceded. So was the trip worth it for them? I guess any trip is worth taking if standing still isn't an option. So why aren't we moving, then? They were walking back to the car when Callahan noticed it. The blood on the door is gone. Why do you think I stopped by the river? A rag and water equals no blood. Smart thinking, Archer. They got back on the road, and very soon they entered the Santa Lucia Mountains. As the land rose around them, Archer looked over at Callahan as she closed her eyes and gripped the seat again. You know, for a tough lady like you who knows her way around a gun, I'm surprised anything scares you. We could have used you in the Eighth Army. You're a better shot than a bunch of the guys I served with. Flattery will only get you so far with me. But she opened her eyes and smiled at him. And where I grew up, the land was pretty flat. I don't really care for this. How'd you get to Reno? Trains and buses, and hitching rides when my money ran out, which it did pretty regularly. That can be dangerous for a gal on her own. Yes, it can, Archer, she said, but did not elaborate. We're glad you made it. She gazed out the windscreen. I didn't really run into any mountains on the way. She looked at him. But I guess there's always something in the way of where you want to go. Well, once we clear these mountains, we'll be able to see the Pacific coast and the ocean. This perked Callahan up. Really? The mountains affect the weather coming west from the Pacific. A lot wetter on the coast side. Learned that while I was out here training. You'll see the plants and trees and things are a lot different on the western-facing slopes. The mountains bump the weather systems. They drop their rain and then head over the peaks. They call it the rain shadow effect. It's drier in the Salinas Valley because of that. They have to irrigate a lot from local water sources, although they do get some rain. They cleared the top of a peak on the winding road and started down. They passed coastal redwoods, ponderosa pine, fir trees, Pacific madronas, and cypress. Later, at a lower level, they rounded a curve, and Archer said, And there's the Pacific. Callahan actually sat on her haunches on the seat, one hand clutched on her turban as she surveyed the breadth of the largest body of water in the world. That whole thing is the Pacific? she exclaimed. Well, you can only see a little bit of it from here. Keep going straight west and you'll hit Japan. 
Same ocean, though. Her expression was one of unbridled wonder. Jesus, that's something, Archer. I thought that Lake Tahoe was big. A drop in the bucket. Gosh, it's just... swell. I mean, really swell. He eyed her sitting on her haunches, looking like a little girl who'd just been shown the most beautiful doll in the world and then been told it was all hers. He next eyed the glove box, where the thirty-eighth special that had killed a man sat. He wondered about the complexities of human beings in general, and this woman in particular. How much farther to Baytown? She asked, finally resettling in her seat. We head out of the mountains, and I think the rest of the drive is out along the coast. He slowed the car, and then stopped on the shoulder. He popped open the glove box and took out a map and unfolded it. He studied the route while she watched him. Yep, along the coast. It looks to be a few hours. If we could rev the Delahaye up, we'd be there in no time. But from the looks of the route, we won't be going that fast. And it'll be pretty flat? Pretty flat. She said, Well, hallelujah for small miracles. Are there any other kind? He said. Chapter 17 Coming down the steep Santa Inez Mountains, they entered the vibrant-looking town that was perched like a gargoyle right on the coast. Welcome to Baytown, said the sign, where a good life begins. Place seems to think a lot of itself, Callahan remarked. They reached a wide boulevard named Sawyer Avenue and admired the row of fine homes there. Nice places, but they don't look cheap, she said. Do you have somewhere lined up to stay? Rooming house on Porter Street. Think they got room for one more? We can always ask. Or do you want to play the husband and wife routine again? You could carry me over the threshold. Of course, we'd have to do the kissing thing. She added, giving him a sharp, hopeful glance. That might be a little awkward now that I'm making this place my home. Oh, you take all the fun out of everything, Callahan replied. But she smiled to show she wasn't serious. Archer stopped and asked a woman walking her dog where Porter Street might be. She told him and then said, what kind of car is that? Steering wheel's on the wrong side. French, said Archer. The woman looked at him funny. French? How'd it get to America? We drove it over, said Callahan. It turns into a boat when you press that button, she added, pointing to a knob on the dash. Well, isn't that something, said the woman. You sure are, said Callahan, as Archer pulled off with a grin. He hung a left and headed up a steeply ascending road. When do you meet with that private eye who's going to teach you all the dirty tricks you'll need to be a full-fledged Seamus? Asked Callahan. I was going to call him when I got in and arrange to meet him. What was the name again? Willie Dash. That Willie Dash? She was pointing at a large faded sign pasted on the side of a brick building. On it was the image of a short, broad-shouldered man in his late forties, with a pugnacious expression, dressed in an old-fashioned pinstripe suit and sporting a fedora worn at a sharp angle on his wide head. He was pointing a sausage finger, apparently, at the world in general. The words written below him read, Got a problem needs solving? Private Eye Willie Dash is your man. After that was a five-digit phone number, but no address. It was the same phone number as on Archer's letter from the man. Archer stopped the car and looked up at the sign, gaping. Yeah, that, Willie Dash. I thought he'd be older, but he came highly recommended. Yeah, and who recommended the guy who recommended him? Archer drove on without answering her. They pulled to a stop in front of the rooming house, a broad building with a narrow front porch, wood siding painted gray, red shutters, and a peaked metal roof the color of olive green. It looked old and seemed to be slightly leaning to one side. A sign out front said there were vacancies. My lucky day, remarked Callahan as she noted this. But we might have to spend half our time holding the sucker up. They took out their bags and walked up to the front porch. The screen door opened, revealing a woman standing there. She was seventy if she was a day. Her rimless specks made her small eyes enormous. One pupil hugged the inner wall of its socket. She had on a threadbare sweater over a homemade dress that dipped below her knee. 
She eyed with a certain disdain the turbaned Callahan in her tailor-made outfit. Can I help you? She said sharply. Name's Archer. I have a room reserved. Yes, I already have you on the books. She eyed Callahan. And who might this be? This might be Liberty Callahan. I need a room, too. For how long? I'll have to let you know. My plans are what you call fluid. The woman glanced past them to the Delahaye, and her already giant eyes became the size of a full moon. Is that your car? Yes, ma'am, said Archer. It's a Delahaye. Surprised, Archer said, Yes, it is. How'd you know? I'm French. I came over long before the war. I don't really sound French anymore, do I? No, ma'am, you don't. She looked upset by this. Well, that's my problem, isn't it? J'ai perdu la beauté de ma courtière. Je suis américain maintenant. If you say so, replied Archer. And you are? Asked Callahan. You may call me Madame Geneviève. You're married, then? said Archer. Not anymore, she said. I'm sorry. I'm not. Come in and sign the register, and I'll show you to your rooms. I take a week's rent in advance. No exceptions. Seems like a nice town. You like it here? asked Archer. I like it fine. If I didn't, I wouldn't stay. She turned and walked off down the hall. Archer and Callahan exchanged a glance, and then followed. Chapter 18 Archer took a moment to look around the small room that he would be calling home at least for a while. Everything in it was old, but the place was spotless and smelled of soap and furniture polish. He pocketed the large metal key, put his suitcase down, dropped his hat on the small bed, and went over to the rear window. His immediate view was the back of another building, but rising behind that and the rest of Baytown were the Santa Inez Mountains. The high rock dwarfed the town like Goliath had David. But then look who won that fight. He crossed the room and looked out the front window. They weren't on the ocean side of town, but the elevated position of the boarding house allowed an unobstructed view of the Pacific. To the right of that was a long wharf where ships were docked, and Archer could see large cranes either taking off or loading on cargo. Men swarmed around this operation like ants on a hunt. Archer knew that directly up the coast was the army's Camp Cook. Farther down he saw a couple of oil derricks bowing and straightening like ostriches pecking for food as they lifted black gold from the earth. He knew off the coast and farther to the south were the Channel Islands. Archer unknotted his tie, pulled his flask, and took a sip of his rye. It quenched his thirst just enough to persuade him to take another belt. From his suitcase he hung up the clothes that needed hanging— and put away the others in the chest of drawers stacked against one wall. They held the scent of Murphy's oil soap, a product he'd often used in prison to clean his own cell. He would have to find a board and an iron to press everything. He went back downstairs and out to the Delahaye after finding out from Madame Genevieve where he could park the car. He drove it into a two-bay garage behind the boarding house. After that he went back up to his room, took off his jacket and shirt and undershirt, but kept his pants and shoes on. He had just lighted a lucky when someone rapped on his door. Callahan had taken off her turban, but was otherwise dressed the same. She came in without invitation and looked at his space. Seems every room is the same. Nice views. She eyed his bare torso. Yeah, they are nice. Hey, where'd you get all those big muscles, Archer? Sears and Roebuck. They were having a sale. Got them cheap. She slid a hand along his right shoulder and down his arm. Archer breathed in her perfume, but remained unbowed by conjuring the image of her shooting a man dead. She said, Remind me to place an order with them sometime. The quality is really good. She slowly slid her fingers free, but scraped his bare skin with her nails as she did so. What's up? he asked. I put my things away, and now I'm bored. We just got here, Liberty. I've got a low tolerance for having nothing to do. I need to find a place to work. I can ask around. I already did that. When? he asked in a surprised voice. Madame Genevieve said there's a place outside of town, like a burlesque theater. It's called Midnight Moods, 
She said it sounded right up my alley. How would she know what was up your alley? She's already got her opinion of me, Archer. After one look and two minutes of conversation. Women tend to do that a lot faster than men. She sees me, I'm sure, as what she would call a loose lady. And maybe I am. And I don't really care what she thinks. But I do care about supporting myself. Maybe you can drive me over there at some point, and I can see if they need a new girl. Sounds like a plan. Hey, you want to take me to lunch? No, but I'll take you to dinner. Okay. See you around, Archer. She went back to her room. Archer put on his undershirt and grabbed a letter from Willie Dash. Then he walked down to the main floor and slipped into the phone box in the small foyer just outside the rectangular-shaped dining area. He closed the booth door, dropped in his coin, and dialed the number. A moment later, Willie Dash, very private investigations, said a female voice. Hello, this is Archer. I'm in town. I'd like to set up a time to meet with Mr. Dash today. Yes, Mr. Archer. This is Connie Morrison. I'm Mr. Dash's secretary. Nice talking to you, Miss Morrison. So when can I see him? He heard paper being shuffled. He has an opening now if you want to come by. Archer checked his timepiece. I'm staying over at a boarding house on Porter Street down by the wharf. How long do you reckon it would take me to get there? Depends. Do you have a car? I do. Then ten minutes should do it. Do you have our address? Yeah, it's on the letter. 1533 Encino Street. She gave him directions and added, It's a four-story brick office building with a green awning out front. We're on the top floor, Suite 401. Thanks. Um, I saw one of his billboards in town. I'm sure you did, but they're pretty old. I'll see you shortly. He rushed back to his room and put on a fresh shirt, wound a tie around his neck, lined his pocket square just so, and angled his hat the same. He was bouncing down the stairs when she called out. Good luck, Seamus to be. He looked back up to see Callahan standing at the top of the stairs. She had taken her dress off and was wearing a pale blue robe that hung only to mid-thigh and was clingy enough to get Archer's undivided attention. In her right hand, she held a lit cigarette, its burning muzzle pointed straight down. He made a show of checking his watch. You look like you're going to bed, he said. She played with the belt in the front of the robe. Then I'd have to take off all my clothes. That surely won't take you long. Her fingers undid the knot in the belt. The panels of the robe parted ever so slightly. Archer let that sink in and said, You trying to seduce me? Not trying, no. You told me good luck. How do you know where I'm going? She said, I don't need the world's greatest gumshoe to figure that one out. You have the look of a guy just itching to get going. Okay. Maybe you should go see Willie Dash about the job instead of me. Dressed as I am, you probably think I'm just a floozy with a bottle of hooch behind my back and pegging you as a sucker I briefly need for a good time. I don't think you're anything like a floozy unless you're pretending to be one. And I don't need to be the world's greatest gumshoe to deduce that the only thing behind your back is you. Well, aren't you a true gentleman to notice? You know, you should charge for all this. Oh, I do, handsome. You just haven't gotten the bill yet. She blew Archer a kiss, turned, and sauntered away. After her door closed, Archer slapped his face hard to stun himself out of everything he was feeling, and it was a lot. All he wanted to do was run upstairs to her. But instead he walked off to take care of business. Maybe you're finally growing up, Archer. It's about time. Chapter 19 Archer climbed into the Delahaye, turned the key, thumbed the starter button, and put the car in gear. Heads turned to stare at the car as he followed the precise directions Morrison had given him, and he made it to Encino Street in short order. The buildings down this way seemed a lot older than others he had passed, and they became dingier still the longer he was on it. The very last building was Dash's, and it was the dingiest of all. It looked like something erected at the end of the last century merely as an afterthought. Mortar splotches had permanently stained its brick surface. The green awning that covered its entrance was torn, with a sleeve of it flapping in the stiffening ocean breeze. The sidewalk in front was missing a few chunks, like teeth punched out of a mouth. He parked the car in front of the entrance and opened the single glass door. 
finding himself in a tiny lobby that smelled of stale tobacco, spilled gin, and a few odd odors that he couldn't readily place, but made his nose crinkle in displeasure. The space was badly lighted, and he had to blink a few times to transition his pupils from daylight to enforced dusk. There was an occupant register on the wall. Though he knew the suite number, Archer wanted to check out who his potential neighbors might be. It didn't take him long. There were only twelve suites in the building, three on each floor, and only four were currently occupied. The other eight had vacant next to them. There was a doctor on the first floor by the name of Myron O'Donnell. On the second floor was a chap named Bradley Wanamaker, attorney at law. Dash was on the top floor, along with a business called Gemology Incorporated. There was no girl at the tiny reception desk in the lobby. A dusty telephone switchboard sat in one corner. There were no cobwebs covering it, but there easily could have been. Archer saw the sign for the elevator and headed that way. He figured the stairs would be in the same direction. Ever since being in prison, he did not like small enclosed spaces where he could not open the door when he wanted to. He came to the single elevator, where a black man who looked to be about a hundred, wearing an ill-fitting gray bellhop's uniform with white piping down the legs and arms, sat on a small, ragged, pillow-topped, wooden drop-down seat just inside the car, reading a nickel copy of the Baytown Gazette. It was short and too thin, of hands that bent upward, apparently against their owner's will, because he held the paper in an awkward grip. The unlit, short, cheap stogie in his mouth was rolling from one side to the other with delicate flicks of his tongue. With an effort, he put the paper aside, sat on it, and said, What floor, young man? It's okay, I'll take the stairs. He scratched his nose and looked interested. Give me something to do if you let me take you. My first customer all day. Aren't Willie Dash and his secretary here? The man grinned. Hell, yeah, they don't count. They work here. I need me some fresh smiling faces like yours. Keeps me going. You going to see Willie? Archer nodded. Fourth floor. Suite 401. Let's get to it, young man. Archer hesitated for a moment, glancing at the wooden door with a wired pane of glass leading to the stairs for a few moments, until the man said, Time waits for no man, mister, and don't I know it. I'll be worm food before long. Archer stepped on. The man closed the cage door and then hit the button for the fourth floor, which automatically closed the car's outer solid metal door. Archer sucked in a breath, and felt his body stiffen and his pulse race. He shut his eyes and pretended he was outside, with all sorts of possibilities for escape. The man had swiveled around in his seat and stared at him as the car began its glacial ascent of thirty or so feet. "'When's you get out, friend?' asked the man with a knowing look. Archer opened his eyes. The old fellow smiled, showing off perfectly white teeth, and all of them real, as far as Archer could tell. "'Get out of where?' The fellow snorted. Come on, don't BS me. The joint, man. How do you figure that? How do I not figure it, you mean? Been inside myself, lots of times. Altogether, longer than you've been alive. And carried lots of men up to see Willie who got the elevator disease, same as you. Stair doors you can open all by yourself. He tapped the cage. Not like these. Remind you of bars, don't they? Does it go away? Look at me. I live in a goddamn elevator, son. How long did it take you? I won't say, because I don't want to discourage you. I got on, didn't I? Retorted Archer. Sure you did. Now stop sweating and looking like you're going to puke and we getting somewhere. Archer put a hand against the wall. What can you tell me about Willie Dash? The man picked up his paper, but his brown eyes stayed on Archer. What you want to know? What kind of a man is he? You looking to hire him? No, work for him. This surprised the man. He took a moment to light up his stokey, sticking the burned match in a metal cup that stuck out from the wall of the car. Work for him? What, you a baby Seamus or something? Something like that. Well, Willie is getting up there, all right. Can't be doing this forever. But he's good at what he does? The man puffed on the cigar to get it going as the car slowly moved past the second floor and began its assault on the third. 
You know, he was a G-man with Hoover's boys before he left to be a cop in Frisco. Now, I didn't know that. He was one of the best. Worked with that there Elliot Ness. Why'd he leave? The man shrugged. Who knows? Why'd he leave Frisco to come here and be a private dick? So he's really good, then? The man smiled slyly. Hell, he caught me. It was his second day on the job as a detective in Frisco, and he nailed my ass. For doing what? Held up a liquor store. Done my time at San Quentin. I don't recommend it, son. Death row there. Used to hang them. Now they gas them. Either way, you're dead, said Archer. Now Willie put in a real good word for me so I didn't get nearly as long a sentence as I might have, and then I got time off for good behavior, and I was getting up there age-wise, and they needed more room for younger bad guys needing prison beds. It was Willie got me a job here after I left prison. So he kept in touch after you went into the joint? Visited me at the prison a few times. Said I did what I did because I was down and out and the wrong color. All stuff I knew. Hell, I'm a Mississippi boy. Only thing the police do down south is march in parades on July 4th and shoot folks look like me. Why I got out of the south. But I ain't find it all that different no matter where I go. Figured robbing a place might get me three squares and a roof over my head. So I hit that liquor store. But Willie said I could make an honest living if I wanted to. So you came down here and climbed into this car? No. Willie got me a job at the docks, loading shit on and taking shit off the boats. Did that for years. He held up his gnarled hands. Where I got these. Then Willie got me this sitting job when I couldn't lift the shit no more. I can still poke a button and close a gate, see? Did that surprise you? I mean, what he did for you? Nothing surprises me, young man. Not no more. You live to be my age, and you colored to boot. Life ain't got no more surprises, except why no white man ain't shot me dead at some point along the way for no reason except he wanted to, see? A minute later, the slow-moving car passed the third floor and settled into the home stretch. What about his gal, Connie Morrison? The old man cackled. Connie? They used to be hitched. Archer shook out a lucky. The old man struck a match and lit it for him before depositing the spent match in the chromium cup. So they were married, but not anymore? That's right. Think Willie was married way back to some gal when he was a G-man. I guess that didn't work out. Pretty sure he's done walking down the aisle now. Not sure about Connie. She's forty-two, which is long in the tooth for getting hitched. But maybe some man will snatch her up. What's your name, by the way? Earl. You? Archer. So if I go to work for him, what's your advice? Go in with both eyes and ears open and pray that's enough. Think he can teach me stuff? He's forgot more about gumshoeing than you'll ever know, young man. No offense. With a jolt and a hiss, they reached the fourth floor, and Earl slid open the cage door. When the outer door disappeared into the wall, Archer quickly stepped through and gratefully sucked in even the stale air at his sudden freedom. Earl poked his head out. Down the hall and to the left, Archer. Good luck to you. At this point in my life, you'd think I wouldn't need so much damn luck, muttered Archer, as he headed on to meet ex-G-man and former copper Willie Dash. Chapter 20 The door was pebbled glass with painted letters on its surface that spelled out, Willie Dash, Very Private Investigations. The image of a lawman's five-point star was etched below this, as though to lend gravitas to the entry point, a certain officialness. Or maybe it had been thrown in for the price of the name above, mused Archer. The doorknob was brass and looked worn down, probably by the thousands of nervous, sweaty hands that had touched it, looking for some help of a very private nature. The door was locked. He noted the buzzer next to the door and pressed it. Yes, said the voice from the little intercom screen. It's Archer. Archer heard a lock click free. He turned the knob and swung the door open. Six feet directly across from him was, presumably, Connie Morrison. He could have laid flat on the floor, his hat against one wall, and the bottom of his shoes would have touched her desk. 
Morrison was a honey blonde with shoulder-length hair parted in the middle with the sides winging their way down. The lady was sitting behind a carved oak desk that looked like it had come over on the Mayflower and gotten wet along the way. Archer took in the small reception area. Four walls, one window, five dented metal file cabinets with alphabet letters on their fronts, and a square of faded carpet that was so worn it looked like the plank floor had reclaimed it. There was a fuzzy light overhead and a table lamp with a patterned shade on the desk. A royal typewriter about the size of a Sherman tank sat on the desk in front of her with a black blotter underneath that. A jar of finely sharpened pencils was near her elbow, along with a stapler and a roll of tape in its holder. A Boston sharpener bolted to the wall just behind her, and standing ready to take care of all those yellow number twos, completed this dream of an office setup. On the walls were diplomas and certificates from places Archer had never heard of, and framed photos of people he didn't know, except for President Harry S., the buck stops here, Truman, dressed in a cream suit and a dotted bow tie, who smiled all alone from one wall. A rubber tree that looked fake and still somehow dead leaned out of a blue-and-white ceramic planter with an elephant on it that sat next to the desk. When Morrison rose and came around to the front of the desk, Archer could see that she wore a blue tailor-made suit dress and that she was medium height and thin. She had fine lines all over her chiseled face, like the depth markings on a shipping channel map. Morrison slipped on a pair of rimless cheaters that she was holding in her hand. They accentuated the woman's eyes, which Archer decided were closer to periwinkle blue than any other blue he knew of. They were slightly washed out, as were the woman's features. Her heels were black and matched the color of her hosiery and added about two inches of height to her frame. A slender platinum watch graced her left wrist. A dark hat with a blue ribbon was on a wall hook. A tan raincoat hung next to it, though there wasn't a cloud in the sky. Next to that hung a dented crown fedora with a blood-red ribbon. He assumed that belonged to Willie Dash. He tipped his hat in greeting as she reached him. Mr. Archer, nice to meet you. Her long fingers managed a grip that was firm and reassuring, her expression less so. The periwinkles took him in as thoroughly as his gaze had done her. She seemed to come away impressed, although that could have simply been Archer's wishful thinking. Nice to meet you, Miss Morrison. I'm really hoping I can go to work for Mr. Dash. The periwinkles dulled a bit, and the firm jaw clenched even tighter, and the lines around her eyes and mouth deepened into ditches. Um, yes. Give me a minute. We've had a, uh, development since you called. She turned and left him there, opening and then quickly closing the door to the interior office, where, Archer was certain, Willie Dash bided his professional time. A development since I called ten minutes ago? He took off his hat, twirled it between his fingers, and took a long, slow loop around the room, arriving at the royal typewriter and the paper wound into its maw that had clickety-clack marks all over it. He bent over to read the typing better. It was addressed to the First National Bank of Baytown. Dear Mr. Weaver, due to my recent illness coupled with a sudden downturn in business, I will be unable to meet my payment obligations on the loan to your institution in the near term. I would like to discuss a different payment plan that might— The words ended here. Archer slid back around the desk as the inner office door opened, and Morrison appeared once more. She wouldn't meet his eye, but said, Mr. Dash will see you now, Mr. Archer. Great. Everything okay? She lifted her elegant chin and dead-eyed him with the periwinkles, that had instantly hardened to glowing bits of molten iron. Why shouldn't it be okay? She glanced sharply at her typewriter. Archer said, You mentioned developments. I took that as maybe there was a problem. My mistake. Sorry. The fire in the eyes dimmed, and the periwinkle sparkled back at him. No apology necessary. She held the door open for him. He passed by her and went in. He heard the door close firmly behind him, and listened to the efficient heels of Connie Morrison marching the short distance back to her desk to finish her boss's letter of developments. Next, Archer heard a belch, and swiveled his attention to a battleship-sized dark walnut desk that turned out to not have a single sailor on board. This office was three times the size of the outer room, but seemed far smaller because it was crammed with so much stuff Archer wasn't sure whether he was in a private eye's office or a fence's warehouse. 
Against one wall was a Murphy bed that was in the down position. It was neatly made up with two pillows plumped on its surface like white geese on a rectangular pond. Keep your eyes looking, Archer. You'll get there, son. Archer did as the voice suggested, and came to rest on the man lying shoeless on a pale blue Davenport. His cuffed pants were held up by white plastic suspenders rather than a belt or leather braces. His collar was undone, and his blue dotted bow tie hung off limply to one side of his neck like a broken arm dangling. His broad face was flushed, and his scalp was as bald as a cue ball and close to the same color, which provided an odd and unsettling juxtaposition. His white shirt was wrinkled beyond perhaps the remediation of an iron, and one of his dark socks needed darning where his little toe poked out like a hatching chick. His eyes were cloudy gray, like the color of a naval ship. They seemed to peer right through Archer. On the coffee table in front of the Davenport was a bottle of Jim Beam Kentucky bourbon and two glasses, one of which had been used. A newspaper lay next to them. Willie Dash, sir. Come on and take a seat and let me have a closer look at you. Archer crossed the room and noted the plank floor was worn smooth, perhaps from a man pacing in his socks for a number of years. He sat down, placed his hat next to the beam, and leaned forward, his elbows resting on his knees, waiting. Dash had a line of sweat on his broad forehead, each drop perfectly lined up with its neighbor, blackbirds on a phone line. When he opened his mouth wide, Archer saw twin porcelain crowns, one on either side and occupying the lower back forty. A grinder who has worn down his grinders. You live here? said Archer, eyeing the bed. I sleep here sometimes. Depends on the job. This ain't no nine-to-fiver, son. You want that life? Go apply at the bank to count other people's money and be bored to death for the next forty years. So how are developments? asked Archer. Things looking up or still down? To put it as squarely as I can, will you be able to hire me if I pass muster? With an effort, Dash sat up and swung his short, thick legs down to the floor. The toes touched, but not the heels. He was no more than five-seven, but his burly build looked strong. He wasn't much under two hundred pounds. His age was difficult to say. Archer thought over sixty rather than under. I like your directness, Archer. It's good, up until it's not so good. And you eyeballed the letter in Connie's typewriter because she sure wouldn't have told you. That shows initiative and a certain disregard for the rules. Both okay in my book, and may be essential to the task. He pulled a handkerchief from his pants pocket, hocked into it, and set it down next to him. The developments can come later, and maybe not the ones you're thinking of. Now Irving Shaw wrote very highly of you. He's a good man. Learned a lot from him. And you no doubt want to continue your education under me. I hoped my letter to you made that clear. You're coming in from this Poker City place? Irv told me that in his letter. Yes, I stopped over in Reno for a little bit and then headed west. Dash hawked once more into the cloth and sat back, lifting his feet fully off the floor. You got a ticket? Come again? A P.I.'s license. Nope. Do I need one? State of California says you do. Law enacted back in 1915. What do I have to do to get it? You have to apply to the State Board of Prison Directors. Archer felt like someone had just shivved him in the carotid. Prison directors? Yes, you have to provide background on yourself, where you were last employed, and where in the state you intend to work as a P.I., and you have to provide facts that you're of good moral character. You have to sign that application, and then you have to find five reputable people in Baytown who will approve of the application and also sign it before an officer duly authorized to take acknowledgment of deeds. I don't even know five people in town. And the state board will review the application and may do its own investigation to confirm that you are indeed a person of good moral character and integrity. If they do, they will issue a license good for five years, and the fee is ten dollars a year. Archer stared at him. And if they find out I've been in prison, will that knock out any chance of me getting my license? It might. But there's another way. 
What's that? There's a provision in the law that allows you to act under the auspices of the license I have for this firm. So I don't even have to apply? But you might want to anyway sometime down the road, Archer. I won't be around forever, and the license I have is not transferable to you. And I have to tell you that there's talk of changing the law, making it even more restrictive next year. It might well require several years of apprenticing as a P.I., and also require that the applicant not have been convicted of any serious crime. Archer nodded. Okay. So you might want to find five people and get yourself grandfathered in if you can. Me and Connie can be two of them, so you're nearly halfway home on that score. In the meantime, I can provide a ticket for you that allows you to operate under the license of this firm. I'll have Connie get going on that. Didn't know it was so involved. It's a profession, Archer, and it's getting all the riffraff out and making way for us professionals. I went to the CAPI conference last year, and it was quite informative. The what? California Association of Private Investigators had a woman named Mildred Gilmore speak. She's a licensed PI and an attorney, and good at both jobs. She argued for adopting a code of ethics for PIs. She also said that women make better operators because they're more ethical, and no one would suspect them of being PIs. What do you think? I've got my own ethics, and I don't want other folks telling me what they should be. Yeah, okay. What's your first name again? Aloysius. Then I'll just call you Archer. I, uh, I saw the billboards around town. Miss Morrison told me they were from a while ago. Dash cocked his head and the mouth flatlined. Don't play me for a fool, son. You put up billboards to get business. At least I did when I first got here. The fact is I soon had more than enough business, so no need for more billboards. Plus, I sort of like driving around and seeing what I used to look like. But you need business now, sounds like. Things have slowed. I won't debate that point with you. So you were with the FBI? Dash poured out small measures of beam in both glasses and nudged one toward Archer. How is Earl? In fine form? Man loves to talk. He thinks the world of you. I did him one act of kindness, and he did the rest. Nice of you after sending him to San Quentin. Dash said sharply, He sent himself to San Quentin. That liquor store didn't rob itself. Right, I guess not. And it was the Bureau of Investigation when I was there. Didn't become the FBI until 1935. He said you worked with Elliot Ness. Is that true? It is. But Ness worked with a lot of guys. I was just one of them. Didn't he take down Ma Barker, Dillinger, and Machine Gun Kelly, and folks like that? Were you in on that, too? Ancient history, Archer. Why'd you leave? I had my reasons. So then you went to Frisco to be a cop? A detective? Corrected Dash. I grew up on the West Coast and wanted to get back here. So why the Seamus route? I don't like following orders, particularly if they're lousy ones, and I like being my own boss. But enough about me, Archer. How'd you find the joint? I wasn't so different from being in the army, actually. And I was innocent, if that makes a difference to you. Dash sipped his beam and slowly shook his head. Were you tried and convicted? No, I did a deal. Otherwise they were going to throw the book at me. Then you were guilty? You think all men who do a deal are guilty? Of course I don't. Just as I know that all men who are tried and convicted aren't guilty. But it's the only system we have. Fact is, I'm not concerned with the past, Archer, yours or mine. I look toward the future. So where does that leave us? With a possibility. Nothing more and nothing less. He bent over and worried at the hole in his sock, tucking the little toe out of sight before straightening. What do you know about the detective business? What Lieutenant Shaw taught me. Which was? Listen, ask questions. Don't believe anything is true unless you can corroborate it, and don't trust anyone. He nodded approvingly. That's a good start. Irv knows his way around an investigation, that's for sure. He said in his letter that you saved his life. He did the same for me. And you have a good war record. I did my bit. Care to talk about it? No. He nodded approvingly again. 
I fought in the First World War, the one that was supposed to end any future ones, right? Basically living in holes and only climbing out of them when the army felt it had to show it was doing something, giving folks their money's worth, so to speak. He slapped his right leg. Got some metal here they never took out, but I was one of the lucky ones. Left a lot of good buddies back there. I can understand that, said Archer, sipping his drink and letting it go down as slow as possible. What else? asked Dash. That fingerprints can do a man in, and the police check for that. That honest people lie all the time when they're in a jam. That sometimes it's the last person you suspect who did the deed. Dash put his glass down, sat forward so his toes were touching the planks one more, and said, Now, this possibility I'm talking about. Archer hunched forward and settled in to listen. The buzzer on the desk phone sounded off like a warning shot across the bow. Dash moved across the space with surprising speed and snatched up the phone. He listened for a moment and said, Give me one minute, hun. He put the phone down, stepped into his brown wingtips, which were set next to his desk, and rapidly put his collar and bow tie in place before slipping on his jacket and pinching his cheeks. Next he opened a desk drawer, slipped out something hairy, squirted on its underside something wet from a bottle on his desk, and then plopped a black toupee on the top of his bald head. He fussed over it in the slanted shaving mirror on his desk until he came away satisfied with the look. To Archer the thing looked like a baby skunk without a stripe. Put the beam away in that cabinet over there, Archer, and hoist up the bed. Archer quickly did so and said, What's up, Mr. Dash? The possibility, Archer, the possibility has just walked in the door. Chapter 21 the door opened, and there appeared Morrison looking breathless from her three-foot walk from desk to door. She stepped to the side and said, Mr. Douglas Kemper and Mr. Wilson Sheen. Two men walked past her and into the room. She hastily closed the door, but Archer did not hear her trademark heel clatter going away. He glanced at Dash, who was staring at the door and apparently thinking the very same thing. Dash moved slowly across the room to greet the men. Where he had been frenetic seconds before, Archer could see the man was now all cool, calm, and was collected as a preacher about to dispense an easy dose of religion and then follow that up with an ask for money. Gentlemen, he said, shaking their hands. He motioned to the sitting area across from his desk. Please sit. Would you like something to drink? Coffee? Tea? Both men shook their heads, dutifully marched across the room, reached Archer, and stood there, each sizing him up. Dash said, This is my associate, Mr. Archer, just in town from working with the police in another state on a very important investigation. His former boss there is a good friend of mine and a fine police investigator. Archer will be truly helpful to me in this matter, and his discretion is legendary. Archer returned his attention to Kemper and Sheen, looking them over as he shook their hands. Kemper was in his late thirties, an inch shorter than Archer, trim, good-looking, and well-groomed. Elegant was the descriptive term that came to Archer. His shoulders were narrow and his hips narrower still. His grip was a dish-rag clench, whether that was for Archer's benefit or the man did that with everyone, Archer didn't know. He had a dark pencil mustache that matched his hair, which was slicked and parted and rode on his head like a flat crown. His eyes were green and his manner seemed bored, as though what he was here for held no particular interest. He was dressed immaculately in a dark blue double-breasted worsted wool suit, framing a starched gray shirt so sparkling it looked like liquid chrome. His muted red and blue striped tie was double-knotted and held against his throat by a gold-collar pin. He looked soft, but maybe wasn't, was Archer's conclusion. Wilson Sheen was a different sort altogether. He was around five-eight and overweight, with a bulging gut that preceded him everywhere. He had broad shoulders and hips to match. His suit was light brown, single-breasted, with a dim blue shirt and a dark brown tie that rode uncomfortably against his meeting neck like a tree leaning into a hurricane. His pants were cuffed and pleated, and his shoes were scoffed fore and aft. His manner was as intense as Kemper's was indifferent. His ice-blue eyes raked across Archer. He drew in his nostrils like a scent dog. Archer took an instant dislike to the man, 
and then reprimanded himself. What would Irving Shaw say? Let it play out. Don't judge on emotion. Let the facts rule. Both men dropped their fedoras on the table and sat down. Dash and Archer joined them. Dash said, Everyone in Baytown knows who you are, Mr. Kemper. But for the sake of my new associate understanding things, perhaps you could start from the very beginning. Kemper did not appear to like this suggestion, but he glanced at Sheen, who nodded in agreement. Kemper took out a gold cigarette case and pulled a gold-tipped cigarette from it. Sheen instantly lighted it with a gold-plated beauty of an igniter that was stamped with a name that to Archer looked French. Golden boy all around, maybe. Kemper primed his smoke, sucked in a long one, and let it gush out both nostrils like steam from a train coming right at Archer. In a smooth, bored voice, he said, It's like this, Archer. I'm running for mayor of Baytown. Wilson is my right-hand man in my business, and also my campaign manager. I was chairman of the town council for two years, and was content with that, but a number of very smart, important people asked me to consider running for mayor, and I decided to do just that. We're growing fast, and a steady hand is needed to manage that growth. Otherwise, it can get out of whack. And we don't need a dentist in charge, chimed in Sheen. While Kemper's voice was silk, Sheen's was like a bulldozer. It banged off all four walls of the office and fell on them like mustard gas. Yes, well, said Kemper, tapping ash into a blue ashtray set on the table. As far as personal history, I married into a very prominent family, the Armstrongs. My wife is Beth Armstrong Kemper. When Archer made no reply to this, Dash said, for generations, the Armstrong family dominated the cattle business around here, which made money hand over fist. They were astute enough to get out of it before the whole industry went down to nothing. And they used those funds to basically invest in and expand Baytown, a large part of which they still own. Sawyer Armstrong is Beth's father, and the richest man in town. I drove down Sawyer Avenue coming into town, noted Archer. Kemper blew smoke to the ceiling as he crossed his legs showing off canary-yellow socks, and swished his tasseled loafer like a leather metronome. Sawyer loves to make his presence felt wherever he can. Naming the best and most beautiful boulevard in the town after himself was one way to do that. Hell, I'm surprised we're not called Sawyerville or Armstrongburg. If I win the election, he might just insist I do it. Archer continued to watch, as Sheen touched Kemper's sleeve and shot his boss a look of caution. Kemper said, in a more controlled tone that would work well on the political stump, He's really made this place what it is. I have to give him that. We're not always on the same page about what direction the town should go in now, but that's to be expected. But I value his opinion. And the matter that has brought you here, said Dash. Kemper glanced at Sheen before lighting another cigarette, this time with his own lighter. He took so long doing it that Archer could have rolled two of his own and smoked them both down. Kemper was apparently a man used to taking his time, and used to people allowing him to do it, thought Archer. Yes, well, this must remain confidential, of course. Once the retainer is signed and money exchanged, privilege attaches, said Dash. I've already communicated my rates to you. Kemper gave him a once-over sneer. Look, Willie, you'll get your damn money, all right? Don't put the squeeze on me from the get-go. It affronts my sensibilities, to the extent that I have any left. It's a damn nuisance that I have to do this at all. It's ridiculous, in fact, but I have been persuaded that it's in my interest to do so. By the very important smart people, noted Archer. Camper turned his gaze to him and smiled. It's difficult to say no to such influence. Dash said, I'm sure I'll get the money, Mr. Kemper, as privilege attaches at that time. But that doesn't get us to the heart of the problem. You came here to ask us to help you get answers, solve your dilemma. The money obviously is secondary to that. Or am I being off base? Archer eyed Kemper and saw the hostility fade in the latter's eyes. Kemper said, No, you're doing okay. He impatiently stubbed out his newly lit smoke. Well, let me get to the point, then, gentlemen. I received this in the mail. 
He took an envelope from his jacket pocket and handed it to Dash. Archer slid closer so he could read it as well. There was no return address and no signature, of course, added Kemper. It wasn't a long letter, and after both men read it, Dash looked up and said, Okay, we're talking blackmail. If you don't drop out of the race for mayor, details of an affair between you and a Miss Ruby Fraser who works at Midnight Moods will be made public. He glanced at Archer. That's the burlesque place on the edge of town. Yeah, I heard of it. I have a friend who might try to get a job there. Dash gave him a puzzled look. You make friends fast, Archer. She actually drove out here with me. Right, said Dash, before turning to Kemper. Do you know this Miss Fraser? I know her. How well? Not nearly as well as they claim in the letter. So no affair? said Dash. No. If there's no truth to it, why worry? said Archer. Kemper snapped. Because the damage will be done. I'll get creamed in the election. Women can vote, Archer, and they won't vote for an alleged philanderer. Dash interjected. So our means of attacking this sucker are limited, but they're still there. Kemper sat back. And pray tell, what might those be? Sheen interjected. You're not going to suggest paying off the blackmailer. There's no such thing as paying off a blackmailer, replied Dash. They just keep coming back. You might as well open a bank account for them to access. So what then? asked Kemper. Any idea who's behind this? asked Dash. I might have some ideas. Then let us have them. What would you do with that information? asked Sheen quickly. Both sides can play the game, said Dash. Meaning? said Kemper sharply, his indifferent manner vanishing. Archer piped in. Meaning you fight fire with fire. If what they say about you isn't true, but is still potentially damaging, then the same holds for them. And if their reputation means nothing to them? inquired Kemper. Easy to say, another to endure, replied Dash. Kemper tap-tapped his ash. Okay, we can provide you with a list later this afternoon. Once we put it together, I'll have Wilson send it over. It will be a short one, probably, and there's no guarantee that the real culprit is on there. It's still a good place to start, said Dash. But you have to be prepared for them making this public if you don't pay, or if blackmail is not their intent. You mean they might just want to smear Douglas and make him lose the election? Suggested Sheen. Maybe, said Dash, keeping his gaze on Kemper. The man sat forward, his brow furrowed. Look, Willie, the last thing I want is for my wife to find out about this garbage in some cheap paper. She's just recovering from an illness. She doesn't need this on top of it. What illness I hadn't heard? Appendicitis. She had an operation. In fact, the doc in this building performed it. He handles the whole family. Right, O'Donnell. He's very good. It's always surprised me he stayed here. He makes enough money to rent on the other side of Sawyer Ave. I hope she's going to be okay. She will. Beth's strong, but this won't help. We'll do all we can to keep it under wraps. A moment later there was a knock at the door, and Morrison entered with a sheaf of papers. Mr. Kemper, said Dash, eyeing Morrison, you can sign off on the retainer, get your duplicate copy, and then leave the check with Miss Morrison, and we can get to work. The election is in four weeks, Sheen told him. Dash offered up a smile. Then by God, we haven't a moment to waste. Kemper rose and joined Morrison over at the desk where he signed the papers, as did Dash. Archer came over to stand next to the desk. Kemper took his duplicate copy and passed it over to Sheen, who had risen and joined him. It was Sheen who took out a checkbook and made out the retainer check in the amount of one thousand dollars, signing it with a flourish. He handed it to Dash. Archer saw that it was drawn on an account in the name of Kemper for Mayor. Dash said, Expenses are, of course, separate, and will be itemized and sent to you regularly. Kemper glanced at Dash, and then at Archer. Oh, joy. I wish you both luck in this endeavor. He and Sheen picked up their hats and left. Dash turned to Morrison, passed her the check, and said urgently, Okay, hon, carry that down to the bank and get it deposited ASAP. 
Then go over the list of outstanding bills, prioritize and whittle, stiff who you can, and negotiate the must-pays down as best you can. In the future I'll need credit, and this is where I build it back up. Morrison nodded, glanced anxiously at Archer, and hurriedly left. A few moments later Archer heard the office door open and close. Dash plucked a briarwood pipe from a stand on his desk, stuffed it with tobacco pulled from a pouch in his desk drawer, and took a moment to light it, puffing thoughtfully. He settled back on the Davenport and glanced at Archer. Well? asked Dash. Archer said, A dentist in charge? What did Sheen mean by that? Camper's running against a fellow named Alfred Drake, who's a dentist, but he's no dummy, and Drake's been on the town council for years. He knows the difference between floating a water bond and filling up a pool with water. Nice of Kemper to provide a list of possible suspects. Dash lit his pipe again and sucked on the end to prime it. The list, if we get it, will be worthless. He'll put on there anyone he has a grudge against, hoping we can find dirt on them, whether it has anything to do with the election or not. But if the truth won't set Kemper free, what will? I'll tell you what, Archer. For a thousand bucks plus expenses, we will. Dash stood and said, Now, follow me. Chapter 22 Dash led Archer out the door, past Morrison's empty desk, and over to another door on the other side of the reception area that Archer had missed seeing before. Dash opened the door and turned on the light. A long, naked tube hissed and popped overhead, before gaining purchase and staying on, feebly illuminating the small space so it looked like a partially exposed photograph. Archer looked around and took in the room that held a desk, a chair, another chair, a three-drawer metal file cabinet, and one window about as wide as his head. Dash swept a hand across the space. You're no office, Archer. So I have the job, then? Not if you continue to be that slow on the uptake— now, it's a little dusty, but I can get Connie to spruce it up a bit. Maybe get a fresh flower for that vase over there. No, that's okay. I can clean it up. You sure? Archer surveyed his office. Pretty sure, yeah. P.I.s don't spend a lot of time on their duff in their office, Archer, Dash said warningly. Give me a sec to breathe it all in, Mr. Dash. Then I'll be raring to go. Dash smiled. Well, first thing... Not even my old man was Mr. Dash. I'm Willie, capiche? Got it, Willie. So do we wait on the list from Kemper? I don't like depending on clients for answers. If they can do it themselves, I might as well put myself in a coffin and pay the digging fee up front. But if we find the blackmailer, what can we really do? Dirt, Archer. It sticks both ways, like you said. And I've never met anyone who didn't have something they'd prefer other people didn't know. So is Kemper the favorite in the race? By a wide margin, yes. He's young, handsome, wealthy, smart, smooth as silk. Pure class, as I'm sure you saw for yourself. For a minute there I thought I was talking to Errol Flynn. Alfred Drake looks like a day-old cadaver by comparison. And so Kemper married into a wealthy family. Talk about good fortune raining down. Well, Kemper looks like he was always rich. In fact, his father came from money. Then he blew it all, and Kemper went from being a rich kid to a poor adult. But he worked hard. Yeah, he married well, but the guy isn't afraid of work, I'll give him that. And Sawyer Armstrong? Armstrong is a son of a bitch. But he's a cunning son of a bitch. And his daughter? She's cut from the same wood, but she's more nuanced than her old man, and Armstrong can be subtle when the need arises. Do you believe, Kemper, about there being nothing between him and Fraser? Yeah, and I believe that Dewey beat Truman. Assume the worst of your clients, Archer, and you'll never be disappointed. They don't come to us because they're good little boys. They come because they screwed up and they want us to clean the mess. He pointed to the desk. And one of them drawers is a little notepad and a pen. Take them with you and write stuff down. Memory makes mistakes. What you write down is a lot better. Archer got the pad and pen, and he and Dash went back to the reception area. Dash plucked his fedora off the hook and said, Hey, you got a car? That's outside. Good, mine's in the shop. What's wrong with it? Nothing that paying the money owed won't fix. 
What model is it? A 1942 Lincoln Continental Cabriolet. The prettiest blue with a canvas top and fat white walls. Did you know 1942 was the last year Detroit made cars before the war intervened? No. Nope. After that, the big boys turned to the war effort, building trucks, tanks, planes. My ride was one of the last off the assembly line before Detroit turned to being the engine of the arsenal of democracy, as Roosevelt termed it. Car's nearly eight years old, then. You looking for a new ride? Dash frowned. You don't let a filly go when she's just starting to hit her stride. Miss Morrison seems efficient. Dash gave him a nuanced look. And I'm sure Earl told you we were married and are now divorced. He did mention that. Surprise you two can still work together. We always worked together just fine. It was marriage together that didn't work. Okay. You got a heater? Dash asked abruptly. Not on me, no. Archer followed Dash back to his office. Out of a desk drawer, Dash drew a Colt thirty-eight in a leather belt holster. Irv said you were in the army and know your way around a piece. I'm sure you do, too. I do, but at this point in my life I'd rather think than shoot. So clip it on and don't pull it unless you're going to use it. By the way, what's my salary, and how often do I get paid? Don't go too fast, Archer. Let's take it nice and slow. I need to see you in action first. They rode the elevator down. Earl gazed up at Dash, the grin stretching to both cheeks and maybe beyond. You going to work, Mr. Dash? Going to get yourself some criminal? That's the plan, Earl. Saw Miss Morrison run out of here with a check in hand. She going to the bank, I expect? You'd make a good Seamus. Can't lose you, Mr. Dash. You're the only one who takes the elevator. Except this young man here. I'd be out of a job. Uh-huh. Well, we don't want that to happen. Outside, Archer said, Is he always like that with you? Like what? I don't know. Gushing. Hell, Archer, the man hates my guts. How do you know that? No man ever went to prison who comes out liking the man who put him behind bars. So did you get him the job here because you keep your enemies close? I felt for the guy, but he'd stick a knife in my back in a New York minute. When Dash saw the Delahaye, he stopped and stared suspiciously at Archer. This your car? Yep. He read off the name. Delahaye? It's French. The hell you say? As he started to get in, he stopped. Steering wheel's on the wrong side. Don't worry, I'm getting the hang of it. By the way, where are we going, Willie? Straight to the source, Archer. To talk to Ruby Fraser. You think she'll cop to blackmailing Kemper? She's not blackmailing anybody. She's what you call a pawn. I don't expect her to be honest, don't get me wrong. Midnight Moods doesn't care about honest people. They just want gals with long legs and big tits. Miss Ruby isn't quarterbacking this one. So Kemper's enemies? Or his friends? Friends who are enemies, then? Do you know of any other kind, son? Because I sure as hell don't. Chapter 23 As they were heading out of town, Dash pointed to a large billboard. There's our man. Douglas Kemper's face was about ten feet tall. He was looking off into the distance, his expression intelligent, visionary even. Next to this profile was the slogan, Kemper for Mayor, a man for our times. Catchy, said Archer dryly as they passed by and drove north. A half hour later they arrived at their destination. Midnight moods looked to Archer like every shallow fantasy a man could reasonably expect to have in his life. Constructed like a faux castle, complete with turrets and towers, bastions and battlements, the high walls covered with enormous posters of the most beautiful women wearing the most alluring outfits that Archer had ever seen. The place had a vibrant view of the nearby salty ocean. Its large asphalt parking lot held about thirty cars, from junkers to lean rides to police prowlers to a couple of Bentleys, though it was still the afternoon. As they pulled to a stop, Archer ran his gaze over the front of the place once more and said, Who the hell built this thing? Who do you think? Sawyer Armstrong. 
He's the only man around with the sawbucks to put up a joint like this. When did he do it? During the war. Sawyer has X-ray vision when it comes to seeing opportunities and making money off poor saps who don't have a lot of it but don't mind spending what they do have. It's volume that matters. And where did that volume come from? This isn't exactly New York City. Trains full of soldiers came through here, Archer. Sawyer put this place up in six months and made a fortune and then some for about three years just off the G.I.s. And now? How's business? Popular as all get out. Lots of young guys and older gents coming through looking for something new. He paused. But in the long run, who knows? Meaning? Baytown is turning into something that tends to shun places like this. What's that? Baytown is doing its best to turn respectable. But there will always be an audience for this sort of thing, even if wives and girlfriends show up here from time to time to make their feelings known, sometimes with an iron skillet in hand and not caring who they hit with it. You ever been here? asked Archer. A few times. Some laughs, some drinks, nothing more. How many times did Connie Morrison crack you in the head with her skillet? I'm starting to like you, Archer, but don't make it personal. They climbed out and crossed over a short wooden bridge that spanned a fake moat that was filled with not water, but gravel. There were chains on either side of the bridge that ran to some wheels affixed to the outside wall of the place. They ever raise the drawbridge? asked Archer. Yeah, every night after the last penniless drunk falls out the door. Inside it was dark, quiet, and, at least to Archer, palpably ominous, until a woman in her late forties came to greet them. She was dressed in a long, dark gown and wearing red high heels that drove her height to a head above dashes. Her hair was platinum with darker roots, her skin white as cream. Her lipsticked mouth housed a smile as wide as her face, but it never once reached her baby blues. She smelled of talcum powder and ginger. Can I help you, gentlemen? We're not quite open yet. The sun's still up. The front door was wide open, pointed out Dash. They lowered the bridge to let the beer, wine, and liquor deliveries through. And all those cars in the parking lot are... Just visitors, she replied, keeping her tone and expression professional. The performers live here. You mean the female performers? Do I? And what business is that of yours, Mr... Dash pulled out his ID card and flashed it for her. Willie Dash, P.I., my associate Archer here. We'd like to talk to Ruby Frazier. The woman eyed the card. Gumshoes at midnight moods. My, my. And you are? asked Archer. I would be Mabel Dawson, sonny boy. I manage this place. At least the girl part of it. Dash said, Speaking of girls, is Ruby here? Why do you want to see Ruby? It's confidential. She should be expecting us, Dash lied. Is that a fact? She never mentioned it to me. That's because it's confidential, said Archer. While you're getting her, mind if we look around? Yes, I would mind. And who said I was getting Ruby, handsome? Any reason why you won't? asked Dash. I can think of about ten. And I can call the cops if this turns into harassment. Why bother the cops with something so trivial? We'll talk to Ruby, and then we'll leave. Nice and simple, no trouble to anyone, said Dash. I don't have to do nothing except ask you to leave. She tacked on a smile as though she were enjoying all this. So scram. But I do know things about this place, added Dash, looking around. Like, why have the bridge down at this hour? I told you, Buster, for deliveries. You want to see the booze for yourself? I happen to know that your deliveries come in the morning, and through the tradesman entrance on the side. Like I said, we have the bridge down for the visitors to our performers. They're entitled to have visitors, aren't they? Sure, but they're not entitled to get paid for it, if you know what I mean. I really have no idea what you're getting at. Would Ruby be engaged in the thing you have no idea what I'm getting at? She pursed her lips and said indignantly, Prostitution is illegal, Mr. Dash. Lots of things are illegal, and that just makes some people want to do them even more. And there are prowlers out there, 
so I guess I'll include the cops in that. Dawson bristled slightly. Ruby's a good girl. A chrome cigarette case appeared from down her bosom, and Archer lit up her smoke when she beckoned him with a generous glance to do so. She drew in the smoke deeply. You really just want to talk to her? We do. She slid a hand along Dash's face. You wouldn't lie to me, would you, mister? I don't like men who lie to me, and most of them do, so that's why I don't like most men. Not on your life would I lie to you, Miss Dawson. She lightly slapped his pudgy face. Right. She glanced upward. Is that rug on tight enough for you? It can get sort of rough sailing inside here. Dash tapped his toupee and said, I never get seasick. Hey, you boys packing? And if we were? Just asking. Good for you. Nice to be curious, ain't it, Archer? Follow me then, gents. Watch your footing. They haven't brought the fire hoses through yet to clean up from last night's rummies. Would it surprise you that I don't touch the stuff myself? She eyed Archer when she said these words, running her gaze from top to bottom in a way that made Archer feel like she had peeled off all his clothes. Apparently nothing could surprise me about you, Miss Dawson, replied Archer. Brawn and brains, and here I'd just about given up all hope. Chapter 24 They headed down a long hall and then walked up three flights of thickly carpeted stairs. They passed a sand bucket under a spooled fire hose. Archer noted it was filled with discarded cigarette butts. If the place caught fire, the sand probably would too. Is that reefer, or has my sense of smell gone to hell? said Dash. Marijuana is illegal, Mr. Dash, said Dawson. Yeah, just like prostitution. And make it willy. We're friends now. They reached the end of the hall and walked up one last set of stairs that carried them to the very top of Midnight Moods. Only the best room in the house for the kid, I see, said Dash. Nosebleed seats. Can't see home plate from here, no sir. In this setup, you work your way down, not up, Willie, retorted Dawson. She led them to a scarred door painted black. On a stiff card inserted in a brass holder was written, Ruby Fraser. Dawson knocked and called out, Ruby, you decent? Two gumshoes here to talk to you. One's old and chubby with a rug on top, and one's tall and could give Clark Gable a run for it. I'll leave it to you to decide which one to concentrate your efforts on. They heard footsteps approach, hesitant, maybe fearful, thought Archer. The door opened, and there she was, looking like a Conover model, all tall and long-limbed, and supple and fresh-faced and innocent and violet-eyed. She had on silk pajamas, a top and a bottom that was a good two inches too short for her, and revealed long, pale feet with nails painted a dull red. She was maybe all of twenty, and maybe not even that yet. She looked from Dawson to Dash to Archer, holding on him, and her lips curled ever so slightly upward as she did so. Yes? Her voice was surprisingly deep, thought Archer. These gents want to talk to you, Ruby. They're private eyes. Archer thought their appearance might knock this lady for a loop. However, her smile deepened. But when he looked at her eyes more closely, he saw an unnatural languidness there, a bullet jacket with no bullet in it. She opened the door further and stepped back, motioning them in. Dawson looked at them. I'll leave you to it, then. She walked off. I'm Ruby Fraser, she said, holding out her hand for them to shake. We know. That's why we're here, said Dash, shaking her hand. He looked at Archer. Pull out the notepad and pen, Archer. I'm sure Ruby has lots to tell us. Archer did as Dash had asked. He looked around and noted that the room was small, with a pale blue Davenport on one side and a dormant electric heater on the other. Against another wall was a built-in breakfast nook. A small black Emerson radio sat on a side table. It hummed low, like she might have just turned down the volume. Next to it was an ashtray stand with a burning stub resting in it. A small fan sat on the floor lazily pushing the air from one side to the other, like a cat leisurely flicking its tail. What do you do for food in this joint? asked Dash, taking a seat in a chintz chair, the only one in the room. 
Got another room over there with a little icebox and a hot plate, and a table and two chairs. Room next to it has a Murphy bed and a closet. But mostly I go downstairs for meals. Food's not bad. In fact, it's pretty good. Toilet? Down the hall. We take turns with the shower. Me and three other girls. Good to know, said Dash. Take a seat on the Davenport and let's have a little chat. She did so, and Archer leaned against the wall with his notepad and pen. The woman was calm, patient, and unmoved. All things she shouldn't have been with them. The room had a scent to it other than the cigarettes. He eyed her clothes. The pajamas were polka-dotted and looked like a man's outfit, wide in the shoulders, narrow in the hips. He wondered where she had gotten them. Not from Kemper, they were too short for him. What is it that you do here, Ruby? asked Dash. I sing and dance and do skits, and I work with Ralph Jeffries. He's good, showing me the ropes. He was in vaudeville before the war. You know him? Dash shook his head. Where are you from? Illinois. Chicago? Never been to Chicago. I usually tell people I'm from Peoria, because that was the closest big city to where I'm from. But I've never been there, neither. What are you doing out here? Looking for something besides Peoria. Archer noted that she put her hand to her mouth while speaking. When she removed it, he noted the line of yellowed, uneven teeth with scraggly points at either end. Archer said, You sticking around here long, Miss Fraser? Just call me Ruby. Long enough to learn my craft, that's what they call it. Then I'm off to Hollywood. I want to be in pictures. Soon as I get my teeth fixed, I'm saving up. She now opened her mouth wide to show them. Hollywood, huh? said Archer. That seems to be going around like the flu. Douglas Kemper, said Dash. What about him? So you know him? He comes here pretty regular. They have a card club here. He's a member. Card club, said Archer. Dash said, California doesn't allow casino gambling like they do in Nevada, Archer. They used to have gambling ships just past the three-mile mark, but before the war, a state attorney general by the name of Earl Warren, who is now our esteemed governor, got them outlawed. Now the card clubs are the only game in town, unless you're into horse racing, which is allowed as well. But isn't card playing still gambling? There's no house to play against. The players are pitted against one another. How does the house make money, then? Various fees. Players pay for their seats. They pay by the hand. Things like that. The house provides the space, the dealer, the cashier. They make good money. The clubs are real popular. The one here does very well. The more players, the more money you make. Fraser said, Mr. Kemper is married to some important lady, so I hear. He's very nice. How nice, meaning to you, said Dash. She picked up the lit stub and took a long drag on it, shooting both men probing looks. Who wants to know? For starters, I do, and maybe Mrs. Kemper, the very important lady. She looked relieved. She's got nothing to worry about. He's a perfect gentleman. Then you have no idea who might be claiming that Kemper and you are far more than friends? She presented him with a knife-sharp glare. What are you trying to pull here, mister? Who says that? Mr. Kemper has received a blackmail demand, and you figure prominently in it. Well, I don't know nothing about that. Sweet Jesus. Then if someone asked, you'd say that there was nothing there? That's what I'm telling you. That's what I'd tell anybody who asked. I need you to tell me that you're speaking the truth. I am. I never slept with Mr. Kemper, swear to God. Okay, Archer, you got that? Archer nodded. Got it. Swear to God. Okay, the next time we come back, it'll be with an affidavit for you to sign. Do you know what an affidavit is? She shook her head. Well, it's a document where you tell the truth and then sign it to make it official. Then if you change your story, it can be used against you. Well, why would anyone want to sign that? She asked. They can also help you, but only if you're telling the truth. And since you are, there's no problem, right? Said Archer. She didn't respond. 
She just looked at Archer like he was the last thing standing between her and death row. Dash rose. One more thing. How much do you make here? Hundred dollars a week, room and board included. Most dough I ever made. Why? Just setting a baseline, Ruby, that's all. I don't get it. I suppose not. You're not thinking of leaving town any time soon? She eyed him like a chicken did a fox. I don't know. Should I? Not till you hear from me, no. But if I do tell you to go, Ruby, you need to go like nobody's business. You're scaring me. Good. Then I'm getting my point across. He added, Maybe we'll be back to take in your show. What time does it start? Ten o'clock sharp. I'll have to take a nap. You be a good girl, Ruby, and we'll get through this. Downstairs, Dash made a call from the front office of Midnight Moods to Connie Morrison, and then waited for a few minutes for her to ring him back with an answer. After that, as they were leaving, Archer said, Do you believe her? I'm not sure. What I am sure about is that she's a drug user. Archer looked startled. How do you know? The eyes don't lie. From the looks of her, I'd say opium. Don't think she's taken heroin yet. Hope she never does. That's the difference between getting shot with a twenty-two and a bazooka. Where are we off to now? The next piece of the puzzle, Archer. Mrs. Kemper? Dash gave him an admiring look. You might just make a decent gumshoe after all. Chapter 25 Archer drove back toward town, and then up a road that zigzagged as they passed canyons with clefts that crept through the rock like capillaries inside the body. As they reached a plateau in the rise and the ground flattened out like a skillet, he was then directed by Dash to pass through a pair of impressive wrought iron gates embossed with the letter A in scrollwork that appeared when the gates were closed and the two halves came together. The gates were mounted on two enormous stone columns. With the ocean on the left and the foothills of the Saint Inez Mountains on the right, the Delahaye roared along on a curved pale cobblestone road. The trees up here were lush and covered the ground like a vast decamped army. Fifty-foot tall live oaks with their jumble of branches lined their way. Spanish moss hung off them like veils on blushing brides. This botanical spectacle held forth until they rounded a bend where the columns of trees retreated. There the greenest, widest patch of grassy lawn Archer had ever seen commenced. It led up to a peninsula of land on which sat a long two-story structure that was built of limestone block, round gray and brown stone, and other elements thrown in for interesting architectural measure. A sea of French doors ran along the front and were anchored by a pair of massive wrought iron doors with impressive scrollwork that served as the main entrance. On either side of them were lit gas lanterns about the size of Archer's torso, and still they seemed small next to the doors. Thick, plush, variegated ivy covered much of the home's lower front facade. Throughout the landscape were well-tended flower beds, creating patterns of color, green hedges, and lush topiary bushes set in either pots or the ground. It was an idyllic setting powered by money, and presumably a lot of it, along with a ton of sweat labor. As they turned and came up the long drive running along the face of the house, Archer got a glimpse of the rear grounds, which faced the ocean and held a stunning vista of the Pacific. There was a tennis court with a tented seating area on one side and an oval-shaped pool with deep, dark blue water on the other. A long stone wall ran along the rear perimeter of the property, which presumably ended in a cliff. The Pacific stretched out nearly a thousand feet below, like a private body of water. Next he looked at a large metal-roofed barn from which two men in denim work clothes were coming out, while another man pushed a wheelbarrow full of brush. A fourth man hosed down a dark blue Triumph Roadster with its canvas top up. A green John Deere tractor sat idle near the barn. A man had the engine cover open and was tinkering with the motor. Archer pulled to a stop in the paved motor court next to a red and black Bentley, with a topless front compartment for the chauffeur. Next to that was a silver and black Rolls-Royce Phantom. As Dash got out, he said, Hey, 
Now your ride's in good company. I'd say so, replied Archer. Nice place the Kempers have. Didn't you note the letter A on the gates? Sawyer Armstrong built this place for his daughter as a wedding present, but couldn't resist putting his name on it. Dash breathed in the sea air that rose up from below like it had taken an express elevator car to get there. Smell that, Archer? Yeah, fish. Bet you never seen a house this big before? I have. Get out of here. You're having one on me. The one I saw back in Polka City was bigger than this place, but not by much. But it was all so phony, and so were the people in it. The jury's still out on this one. It won't be much longer, but I wouldn't call Beth Kemper a phony. How do you know she'll see us? I phoned Connie from Midnight Moods and had her set up an appointment. She called back to confirm it. That's what I was waiting on. They walked up to the massive double front doors. They, too, were embossed with an A, but here each door held its own letter. Archer said, Boy, the guy likes to remind people of the origins of this place. Dash said, For me it's a sign of insecurity, but I could be wrong. He poked at a buzzer. From somewhere distant they heard the peal of a bell. Its sound dulled by distance. About twenty seconds later, footsteps approached. The opening door revealed a Chinese man, who wore a waist-long white tuxedo jacket, black pants with lighter black stripes down the sides of the trousers, and a bow tie the color of the pants. His skin was tanned, and he had three moles that marched across his forehead like a line of ants. His dark hair was trimmed with silver at the temples, like the best character actors in the movies, and was slicked back. He had a long, tapered mustache that dovetailed around his mouth and ended in a stringy goatee. He had the sort of face that made it hard to guess the correct age. Archer put the range at forty to sixty. Willie Dash and Archer to see Mrs. Kemper. We're expected. May I see identification, please? Oh, so you're one of those butlers. Okay, pal. Face your eyes. Dash held out his ID card, and the man examined it long enough to have copied out all the information it contained three times over. He handed it back and motioned them in. He closed the door, and they followed him down a marble hall that had a cushiony oriental rug running right down the middle of it for what seemed like miles. The walls were festooned with enough paintings that Archer could have been forgiven for believing he had mistakenly stepped into a museum. They passed large rooms that were all furnished with just the right amount of furniture and not a smidgen more. White, gray, and pale blue were the dominant colors. Archer could see how that scheme would play well off the California sun that was streaming in through all the windows and French doors that also lined the rear of the home. The interior was as quiet as a tomb, and nearly as joyful, Archer thought as he walked next to Dash. Even with all the beautiful things, he couldn't imagine living here. The man stopped at double-curved doors made of walnut, which shone with elbow-greased polish, and knocked on one of them. All right said the voice within. To Archer it sounded dulled and joyless, like a knife blade left outside to rust. He steeled himself to meet Beth Armstrong Kemper. Chapter 26 The man opened the door and stepped to the side for them to pass through. They did so, and he closed the door, and Archer heard his soft footsteps moving away. Archer glanced around the room. He didn't have to be a world-class Seamus to deduce that this was the library. Three walls of floor-to-ceiling shelves bursting with books would have been his first and only necessary clue. The carpet was white with subtle dashes of orange and muted teal, done up in a breaking wave pattern. It felt deep and springy, like he was standing on a trampoline. The furniture was large and tasteful and well laid out over the room's expanse. A fireplace at one end was mounted in stone, and topped by a mantle consisting of one enormous worm-eaten piece of blackened and distressed timber that someone could have built a boat out of with wood left over. Despite the warmth outside, it was deliciously cool in here, and a small fire flickered in the hearth. There were two camel-haired wing-back chairs set in front of the fireplace. One of them was occupied. When Beth Kemper rose and turned to them, Archer had to catch his breath, and almost dropped the notepad and pen he'd taken from his pocket. 
She was not the most beautiful woman, or the one with the finest figure he had ever seen. Yet he wasn't sure he had ever been in the presence of a lovelier woman, and right now he couldn't explain the distinction. It was just a feeling, an overpowering one. She was tall and slim, with blonde hair that had not come out of the bottle. It skimmed her shoulders like a shade tree does its underlings. Her skin wasn't pale in keeping with her hair. It had a healthy glow that radiated right up to her eyes, which were cornflower blue that seemed enhanced by something inside the woman that transformed soft cornflower into electrically charged sapphires. Her features were classical in the sense that there wasn't a flaw to be detected or criticized. The cheek bumps, the jawline, the slender, plum, line-straight nose, the shallow sockets the eyes rested in, the high forehead without trace of wrinkle or brow furrow, all seemed molded by the sure hand of a sculptor intent on perfection, or at least most people's view thereof. She was dressed simply in a lavender day dress that dropped straight down her tall frame with a strip of white around the neck and also at the ends of the elbow-length sleeves. The hemline just touched her knees. She wore a strand of small pearls, a platinum-engraved wrist cuff, and white unadorned heels of simple, elegant design. Her engagement and wedding rings were the stuff of royalty, thought Archer. He also observed that Beth Kemper had the weary expression of a woman who wished to tolerate others only on her terms, but had never yet been afforded that singular opportunity. He figured she couldn't be much older than he was, maybe thirty at the most. Gentlemen, she said, her voice bubbling like a brook, but he thought that might be just for a certain effect. Mrs. Kemper, I'm Willie Dash. You might remember me. Our paths have crossed at certain functions from time to time. This is my associate, Archer. Kemper barely looked at Dash. Is Archer your surname or given one? She asked. For a moment, Archer couldn't remember the answer. He twirled his hat in his hands, a trait of his when nervous, and said, Archer's my last name. And your Christian name? Aloysius. She nodded, satisfied and motioned to the two chairs while she stood with her back to the fire. Yes, Mr. Dash, I do remember you. You and my father go way back. After they sat, Dash said, We've known each other a long time, yes. To the extent that anyone really knows my father. Yes, ma'am, I understand what you mean. He and I have butted heads a few times, and I can't say I understand him any better now than I did then. Then you and I have something in common. Yes, ma'am. Would you like something to drink? A bit early in the day, but I'm having one if that influences your decision. It was then that Archer saw the bar set up a few paces from the fireplace and on the same wall. Bourbon straight is fine by me, said Dash, running his eye along the rows of bottles. She nodded and looked at Archer with hiked eyebrows that were as rigid as a pencil, even in the uplifted position, and far darker than her hair. The combination of the two colors for some reason had a deeply unsettling effect on him, as though he were looking at two women instead of merely one. And you, Mr. Archer? Whatever you're having, and you can just call me Archer. She nodded, turned to the bar table and fixed their drinks. Her motions were practiced and efficient, Archer thought, as she jiggered, measured, and mixed. That bar must see a lot of work, he figured. He glanced at another table that was bedecked with framed photographs. He rose and started looking over them. They were all signed either to Beth or Douglas, but none together. There was one of the vice president, and another signed, Best Wishes, Earl Warren. Then he glanced at another one. You know Jimmy Stewart? She turned to him from the bar table. My husband did. They flew together in the war. Your husband's a pilot? Yes, at least he was. She presented Dash with his bourbon and nothing else in a cut crystal glass. Then she handed Archer his drink. Dry Manhattan, Archer. You don't care for the sweet vermouth, then? She looked impressed. I like a man who knows his cocktails. For me, it's an essential skill. And no, I care for nothing sweet at all. Unsure of how to take this, Archer retook his seat and said nothing. She eyed the notepad and pen he had placed on the table. 
This must be serious if you're to chronicle all I have to say. Just standard procedure, interjected Dash. She took up residence in front of the flames once more and looked down at the two men, her drink held loosely at her side. She was apparently waiting for them to sample their libations. Dash took a sip of his and smiled. Good bourbon. From Kentucky. That's where they first distilled whiskey into what we call bourbon, in a county of the same name. Didn't know that, said Dash, giving the woman the once-over in a single glance. Archer drank from his Manhattan. Nice, he said. Thank you. Dash eyed her closely. Heard you were ill recently? Appendicitis. You're looking fine now. How did you know? Dash glanced at Archer before saying, Myron O'Donnell is in my building. He happened to mention that he performed the operation. He was my mother's doctor, too. And many years ago, he saved my father's life after a car accident. That's how I came to use him. He's a fine surgeon. As soon as she finished speaking, her look hardened like wet cement solidifying. Now, to business. Do you know why we're here? said Dash. In a general sense, yes. She sipped her drink and then placed it on a doily set on the timber mantel. But please, feel free to enlighten me as to particulars. She picked up a cigarette case from a side table, clicked it open, and extracted a cigarette. Then she placed it into an ivory holder, which she also took from the case, and ignited the end with a platinum lighter that had sat next to the case. She replaced both exactly where they were before. A careful, measured woman, Archer observed, who likes things just so, at least the things she can control. He wrote this impression down. She blew smoke out and picked up her drink, taking another sip. Dash said, Some of this may be troubling to hear. Much of what I have to deal with is troubling, Mr. Dash, and people like you and your associate do not get called in when things are... Not troubling, do you? I appreciate that you understand the situation. She took another puff of cigarette and a sip of her drink. I'll understand it even better when you tell me the particulars. Archer took another swallow of his drink and eyed the room once more, this time with a nuanced approach. Everything in this place is for show. He eyed Kemper, maybe including the woman. He didn't write this down. He didn't have to. Dash laid it all out for her, piece by piece, regurgitating everything that her husband had earlier told them, including his denials of a relationship with Ruby Fraser. Kemper took it all in and drained the rest of her drink, then turned and started toward the table as though to make another, but seemed to think better of it. It was the only moment of indecision Archer had seen in the woman, and from that glimpse he considered the possibility that she actually might be human— with real blood flowing through her thin veins. She returned to face them in front of the fire, which now seemed to Archer somewhat metaphorical. She perched on the leather-topped fender surrounding the fireplace opening. Have you talked to your husband about this matter? asked Dash. She took a moment to finish her cigarette and tossed it, minus the holder, into the fire. She dexterously rolled the ivory holder around and around between her thumb and index finger. Not really, no. Douglas is running for mayor, I'm sure you know. Which makes the matter even more delicate than the timing suspicious. The cornflower eyes focused on him with an astonishing degree of severity. Mr. Dash, you are not a fool, I take it. My worst enemies would accuse me of a lot, and they would be right. But being a fool is not one of them. I've seen too much of life and suffered through quite a bit of it. It strikes foolishness clean from you. At least it did for me. Then do not intimate that the timing of the election makes this accusation scurrilous. Now that's a fifty-dollar word, replied Dash. And the only one that comes to my mind to fit the situation. Then you believe that your husband did have an affair with Ruby Fraser? Her angry look quickly faded. I... I don't know about that. I would hope not, but... Did you ask him? No, I didn't. She paused and studied her shoes. Maybe I didn't want to know his answer. She added quietly. His political opponents would love to make hay out of this. 
Alfred Drake most assuredly knows of it, or at least his associates do, which in politics is a difference without meaning. I forgot your father was mayor here, and once took a run at the governor's mansion in Sacramento. Her lips pursed for a moment. Archer wasn't sure if she was holding back a smile or not. She said, He won the mayor's race by a landslide, and lost the governor's contest by the same margin. Is there a lesson in that? asked Archer. She turned to him, her look now one of amusement. Fame and influence are both fickle and localized. I'm sure it was a hard loss for your father, said Dash. It was, if only because it was the only time he did lose at anything. But Drake may be behind this blackmail attempt. He may, or he may not. I have no idea, really. I actually always thought Alfred Drake was a decent man, but I think that of many people, and I've been proven wrong before. If he is the blackmailer, we could use that against him, noted Dash. No one expects Drake to win, even with this allegation bubbling up. Archer spoke up. Then why would your husband hire us to investigate the matter if it will have no impact on the outcome of the election? She glanced at him with a look that hit Archer somewhere between his gut and his heart. Her slender tongue slid over the pale, glossy, and full lips. An excellent question, to which I have no viable answer. Did you ask him that? Dash said, I don't usually discourage clients from hiring me, and in our defense, we didn't know the lay of the land yet. But what you said does give me something to chew on. Archer said, So you know Alfred Drake, then? I used to go to him for my teeth. She smiled. He's actually an orthodontist, and an excellent one. I think he did a rather marvelous job, taking out some teeth and putting braces on, which straightened the ones that were left. I was hopeless as a child. My father was ready to give up on my having any sort of social life, simply because of the atrocious state of my teeth. But it was my mother who finally put her foot down and took me to Drake. I hardly think anyone would have agreed with your father's assessment, noted Archer. This did not earn him a second graceful smile. The eyes grew cold. In many ways, his observation was spot on, because people are invariably shallow, at least here. But you can know nothing of that, so don't bother rendering an opinion. Archer held up a hand in a motion of acquiescence and also apology. This also did him no favors with the woman. You surrender quite easily, Mr. Archer. I hope you're not as squeamish in your work. If so, my husband will certainly be overcharged. She turned her attention to Dash, as though now totally discounting the value of Archer's presence. Anything else? Or can you both leave me in relative peace now? Not unless you can think of anything that might help our investigation. If I did, I probably wouldn't tell you. So you don't want to help out your husband here? If Douglas got himself into this, he can get himself out of it. I apologize in advance for this question, but is he the sort of man who has the wandering eye? What man doesn't? was her reply. Well, I think that's it for now, ma'am. Thank you for your time. She leaned over and pushed a button on the wall. Five seconds later, the same man appeared to lead them out. As they were leaving, Archer put his notepad and pen away and glanced back at Kemper. She caught him looking and said imperiously, Something on your mind, Archer? Nothing wrong with having that second drink now. It might taste better at this point. And why is that? She asked in a disinterested tone. You got your piece off your chest and didn't stumble once over your lines. I'd clap an appreciation, except I'm holding my hat. Chapter 27 As Archer and Dash approached the Delahaye, the man who had been washing the Triumph out back came up to them rubbing his hands on a white towel. He was around thirty-five with a muscular build, good looks, a trim black mustache, and brooding eyes. A short-barreled stogie perched from one corner of his slash for a mouth. He was wearing a white T-shirt and dark brown jodhpurs tucked into leather lace-up boots and a chauffeur's black cap. General George Patton would have been proud of the man's wardrobe choices, thought Archer. Now all he needed were the twin pearl-handled Colt pistols. Nice ride, said the man, looking the Delahaye over. Right back at you, said Archer, 
pointing to the Phantom and the Bentley. And I saw you washing the Triumph. Rode in one of those over in England. The man pinched his stogie and nodded. I was over there, too. Hundred and first airborne. Name's Adam Stover. Meaning you jumped out of perfectly good airplanes, noted Dash with a grin. I was Eighth Army, said Archer. Name's Archer. That's Willie Dash. Stover eyed Archer. Eighth Army? And you got your share of killing and nearly being killed? I think we all did. You two here visiting Mrs. Kemper? Dash said yes, on some private business. Archer said, nice place. Stover laughed. One way to see it? They got more money than God. How'd you end up here? I'm from Baytown. Came back after the war. Know my way around cars. So there you go. He eyed the house and then Dash. Seen your billboards around town, Mr. Dash. You're a private dick. That I am. So is Archer here. Got trouble here, then? Again, we're private dicks, so that's as far as it can go, Mr. Stover. Stover touched the bill of his cap and walked off. As Archer climbed into the car, he glanced at one of the French doors to see Beth Kemper watching him. With his gaze still locked on her, Kemper turned and walked away. As they drove away from the mansion and out through the gates, a marine fog was coming in off the ocean and accumulating like fire smoke in the clefts and fingers of the foothills after already invading the lower canyons. The wind had picked up, and it looked like rain was coming as the temperatures dropped. I guess it can get pretty tricky driving up and down here when the mist rolls in, said Archer. It's tricky driving up and down here at any time, and I'm not necessarily referring to the weather. Where to now, Willie? Back to the office. I need to think some. Archer checked his timepiece. It's still early for me. How about I do some sleuthing on my own? And how exactly would you go about doing that, I'd like to know? I wouldn't mind having another go at Ruby Fraser. She's got more to say than she did. I can go back to see her show and talk to her after. I can bring my friend along with me. She's looking for work. Ruby might not talk to you again, Archer. She might with another woman there. Let me work it, Willie. You have to trust me at some point. Right, only I don't know if I've gotten to that point yet, Archer. We did just meet. I won't louse it up. I'll just be listening. Dash rubbed his stomach and grimaced in some pain. You got something going on down there? asked Archer. I got something going on lots of places. It doesn't concern you. If his wife maybe believes he's having an affair, what are we supposed to do about the blackmail angle? And Kemper might very well win the election, affair or not, like his wife said. The election isn't the thing, Archer. Somebody is committing a crime, and they need to be punished for it. Now you're sounding like Mr. Shaw. Dash looked down. I was a cop for a long time. Sticks to your bones and your brain. But since you're an ex-con... Maybe I'm speaking to a wall. I've got morals, Willie. Maybe more than you think. And I've got to always keep in mind that I work for the client, not the blindfolded lady holding the scales of justice. I can see how that might be hard. If it ever stops being hard, I need to see about another line of work. So drop you off at the office, then? Yeah, and keep your eyes on the road. The only place we'll be going is off the mountain the hard way. After leaving Dash at the office, Archer turned the Delahaye around and drove back to the boarding house. He passed Madame Genevieve in the hall. She spoke to him with only her eyebrows, which rose toward the ceiling. Is there a problem? he asked. Your lady friend is very demanding. Tell me something I don't know. He raced up the steps and knocked on Callahan's door. Who is it? Archer. Come on in. You decent? Well, if I were, I wouldn't have told you to come on in. Even Archer had to grin at that one. He opened the door and closed it behind him. Twirling his hat, he moved over to the bed where Callahan was lying and wearing the same pale, clingy robe she'd had on before. Had a busy day? He began, eyeing her closely. She stretched like a cat, yawned and wiggled a bit, lifting the robe to a fascinating height. Yeah, 
I'm worn out just being little old me. Archer looked at the floor and said, Madame Genevieve says you're a tough customer. If asking for hot water and a towel is a tough customer, then I plead guilty. She sat up against the pillow, pulled out a cigarette from her case and lit it. Archer did the same and perched on her bed. I did run out for smokes. Do you know what they're charging for a pack of camels? A quarter. It's 18 cents back in Reno. What's so special about this place? Maybe it's the ocean premium. Yeah, right. Oh, did you get the job? Archer nodded. Already working a case. Why are you here, then? You still thinking about trying for a job at Midnight Moods? Yeah, I am. Seems to be the only game in town. How do you know that? I haven't been lying here all day waiting for you, Archer. She swung her legs over the side of the bed so they were sitting shoulder to shoulder. He breathed in her perfume and watched as she crossed one bare leg over the other. He closed his eyes and thought of every sad thing that had ever happened to him. It was almost enough. It gave him a fighting chance. I was there earlier today because the case I'm working has to do with one of the gals who performs out there. I'm planning to go back there tonight. So I came back here to ask if you want to come along with me tonight and see about getting a job out there. Like you said, it's the only game in town. And then maybe you could be there while I talk to the lady again. She might feel more comfortable with another woman there. She rubbed her toes against his pants leg. You promised you'd take me to dinner. Her show doesn't start until ten, so we can go there after dinner. And my treat, I'm gainfully employed, and now I have some leads to follow up on. So how about it? Will you come? Sure, Archer. I'll come. Great. He rose. Hey, do you have to rush off? She eyed her bed. I'm kind of lonely. No can do, Liberty. I'm a working man now. She looked resignedly up at him. <sighs> You're sure taking this shameless thing to heart, Archer. Only way to do it. He tipped his hat and walked out the door, wondering how he'd found the fortitude to do that. Chapter 28 Archer went back to the Dash agency. Morrison told him that Dash had left almost immediately after Archer had dropped him off. Where does he live? asked Archer. Nearby? If he hasn't told you, I don't think it right that I should. Okay. Did a message arrive from Kemper? It was supposed to be a list of people for us to check out. No, nothing like that. Do you have Kemper's address, then? I could run over and get the list. Morrison looked at him. Willie knows I'm going to do some investigating on my own. I know. He told me. He said he was coming to trust you. She paused, wrote something down on a piece of paper, and handed it to him. Kemper's address. Is he going to be okay? Archer asked, taking the paper. He seems to be in pain. Ulcers. He just needs to rest from time to time and watch his diet. Morrison opened her desk drawer and took out a black leather card case. Here. What is it? Your ticket. It just came in twenty minutes ago. Archer looked surprised. But didn't I have to sign something? I did all the paperwork for you. Archer opened the case and saw the printed card with his name and other information on it. Aloysius Archer, licensed private investigator in the city of Baytown under the auspices of Willie Dash, Very Private Investigations Incorporated, licensed under California law, bonded and insured. The cost of getting it will be deducted from your earnings. How much are my earnings? Willie didn't discuss that with you? No, and I asked him. Well, I'll have to leave that to him. He said I should apply for my own ticket because the law might change, and this might not be enough. If he said so, I would believe it. He said I need five people to vouch for me. He said you would be one of them. Sure, Archer. Whatever you need. Just like that? If Willie said it was okay for me to sign, then that's good enough for me. Archer left her and looked at the address as he walked down the hall. Kemper's office was on Idaho Avenue. He rode back down in the elevator with Earl, who was not nearly as talkative as before, but just sat on his little chair and read his newspaper. Archer drove to a Rexall drugstore and bought a map of Baytown and the surrounding area. As he sat at the counter drinking a cup of coffee and studying it, the pink-frocked soda-jerk girl with a matching cap said, You looking for some place in particular, mister? Idaho Avenue? On the rich side of town, said the girl. Is that right? 
She had curly red hair, a skinny frame, and a freckled face with a button nose barely large enough to support both nostrils. She placed her long index finger on a spot on the open map. We're here, okay? Right. And Sawyer Avenue cuts right through the middle of town. Anything to the mountainside is the working class side, at least for the most part. Anything to the ocean side is the rich side, except for obviously where Sawyer's Wharf is. And Idaho Ave is right here, she added, stabbing the paper with her finger once more. So I guess folks want the water view? I guess rich folks get whatever it is they want, she replied gamely. How about up in the foothills? That's not Oceanside. Now that's where the really rich live. See, you don't just get the ocean views up there. You get to look down on the rest of us. She laughed at her own little joke. You mean like the Kempers? Her freckles seemed to bulge at the mention of the name. You know them? I met them today, husband and wife. She gave him an appraising look and adjusted her pink cap. Old man Armstrong and his family really built up this town. His son-in-law, Douglas Kemper, is running for mayor. She shrugged. Don't know nothing about that. I'm more into flicks than politics. Archer noted the movie pulp magazine stashed under the counter behind her. Do you know anything about Kemper? He's got a bunch of businesses. My mom and dad work for him, and my two brothers work for him, too. This got Archer's attention. What sort of businesses? He builds houses and apartment buildings, for one. My dad's a carpenter with that company. Lots of people moving to this area, and they need some place to live. And he has a vineyard, too, a little north of here. My older brother works there building the casks and working in the grape fields. Ann Kemper owns a members-only country club, the Windward. It's a mile north of here and right on the water. They have a marina, and folks keep their boats there. My middle brother works there as a valet. He says it's really nice. Ann Kemper owns the Mayport Hotel. That's near Idaho Ave. My mom's a maid there. It's probably the nicest hotel in town. Sounds like the Kempers only deal in the nicest of everything. He handed her a buck tip. Her fingers closed around it, and she flashed him a smile. Thanks, mister. Archer left, fired up the Delahaye, and started off in the direction of Idaho Avenue. He glanced at the passenger seat where he'd placed the map. The traffic was light, and he figured he could make it in under twenty minutes. Baytown was bustling. Archer could see that easily enough. Folks were driving and walking and biking and riding the trolleys that were gold in color and promoted Baytown as the place of paradise. Folks seemed to have taken this to heart and were dressed up and shopping and working and hauling stuff and generally moving both commerce and contentment from here to there with smiles on their faces. Archer passed several dance halls, two buildings advertising card clubs and a filling station where helpful uniformed attendants pumped gas, cleaned windshields, and gave out shiny toy metal cars to little boys jumping up and down in the rear seats. There was an open-air food market on a patch of green town square, where farmers in bib overalls were offering their wares from the beds of ancient pickup trucks to discerning shoppers. There was a new-looking movie theater playing The Fountainhead with Gary Cooper and Patricia Neal. The fog had burned off down here, and the sun was warm, but the air was still damp and thus chilly. He looked toward the foothills where the Kempers resided and saw a higher-level wind swirling up the west-facing slopes and ruffling the canopies of the sea of trees. And up there, silver strands of marine fog still crept into the clefts of the rock like a thief's hand slipping into a pocket. To his left, the ocean shimmered broad and fine, the seagulls dipping for their meals and boats puttering along as they made their way to port or away from it. About a hundred boats of all sizes were moored in the bay, bobbing up and down to the beat of the Pacific. An airplane, a Western Airlines DC-4, glided along about a thousand feet above the water, its four propellers whirling in precise synchronization. Archer had flown on the military version of the DC-4 during the war. That brought back memories of a harrowing flight in dense fog that resulted in a crash landing in which not everyone had survived. But since it was World War II, the grunts who did survive got off and took up the fight once more, as though nothing remotely unnerving had happened. He had never really cared for riding in planes after that. He crossed Sawyer Avenue going toward the ocean, and he could see what the soda-jerk girl had meant. 
Even the dogs looked healthier over here, as did the flowers, trees, and bushes, and the sidewalks held not a scrap of paper or other trash. People were clothed in nicer duds. The price tags of the cars cruising along became elevated. Pickup trucks and old dented Fords were replaced with Coupe de Villes, Eldorados, and chromed Buick Roadmasters that looked big enough to live in. The shop fronts were classier and catered to a clientele that obviously had money. Archer had passed one beauty parlor on the other side of Sawyer. It was dingy, with two cracked vinyl chairs, a dirty window, and two old women in their housecoats getting their hair dyed a color he didn't recognize offhand. He'd already passed four beauty parlors on the ritzier side of Sawyer, and each one was nicer than the one before, for each well-heeled patron was greeted at the door with a smile, a handshake, and a symbolic kiss on the behind. Archer slowed down for traffic, and then stopped in front of a shop selling furs. He peered through the front glass and saw a hostess in a long, pale green gown and silver shoes catering to an old woman and what looked to be her twenty-something granddaughter, while a tall young woman modeled an ankle-length mink coat. Both granny and granddaughter looked enthralled at the prospect of draping the remnants of dead things over themselves. He next passed the Mayport Hotel, which Kemper owned. It was six stories high and had twin columns out front, along with a top-hatted doorman in full faux military regalia. A long, pristine burgundy awning was stenciled with the hotel's name and fancy swirls and loops of calligraphy. A cab stand out front was doing a brisk business. Tall windows were on the street side, and an oak revolving door near the end of the left side of the hotel invited folks into the Mayport Bar and Lounge for libations live music and good times, or so the sign said. Through one window Archer could see women in stylish hats and dress gloves having what looked to be a refined tea in the main dining area. He kept driving, and turned left, and then right, before reaching Idaho Avenue. It was a trim street, shadowed and cooled by a canopy of overhanging trees. The road here transformed from asphalt to cobblestones, and the Delahaye bumped uncomfortably over them. A policeman was on the corner telling traffic where and when to go, and Archer waited his turn until the uniformed gent sent him on his way with a sharp wave of a white-gloved hand. He'd seen six prowl cars on the other side of Sawyer Avenue, and not one on this side. As though the rich didn't commit crimes, thought Archer. Yet he also knew that those with lots of money didn't do it in the open, with a gun or knife or a fist— like a working man might employ. They did it in the shadows, four layers removed from the actual dirty deed, and nobody came after them, because they could afford the best lawyers, knew all the judges, gave to charity, and had good teeth. He parked in front of a ten-story limestone building that was as neat and refined as the street. The Kemper Building, the gold wall plaque outside read. Archer thought Kemper might operate all his myriad businesses out of this place, and then he probably rented the rest of it to other tenants. The receptionist took his name and request and got on her sleek telephone switchboard to call up to Douglas Kemper's office. With that done, she sent him on his way with a suite number on the very top floor. He eyed the marquee in the lobby, and it showed that the place was fully leased to businesses with impressive-sounding names. Overcoming his fear of enclosed spaces, Archer rode an automatic elevator car up to the top floor. It had been a bit easier to beat his phobia this time, because the elevator was mostly all glass wrapped in chrome. He thought Earl from Dash's building might go crazy riding up and down all day in the thing, and he assumed at night that one might get some unsettling reflections. He, for one, didn't want delusions occurring at a hundred feet in the air. But then again, they probably exist at street level, too. Chapter 29 A pair of reflective glass doors with platinum wrappers greeted Archer at the entrance to Kemper Enterprises. Two large rubber plants and thousand-pound cast stone pots with lions in raised relief on their sides guarded this portal. Since there was no sunlight in the hall, Archer wondered how these beauties could manage. But when he touched them and then smelled them, he realized they were fake. He opened one of the doors and stepped through. It was then that he realized the revealed anteroom was just a tease. 
There was no one and nothing here. Just four walls painted black and a hat and coat rack stuck in one corner that was bereft of both hats and coats. The door set directly across from him was thick oak, and he found out it was locked. He saw the buzzer in the voice box, so he buzzed and prepared to use his voice. A woman answered. Yes? Aloysius Archer here to see either Mr. Kemper or Mr. Wilson Sheen. Do you have an appointment? No, but they should be expecting me. We met this morning at Willie Dash's office. Oh, said the voice, and Archer heard what he expected to hear. The door being buzzed open. He gripped the knob, pulled, and stepped into La La Land, at least at first blush. His opinion didn't change much on the second blush. The room was cavernous, awash in light, indeed so much light that stepping from a dark hall into a darker anteroom and then into this burst of illumination made Archer's eyes squint, his pupils contract, and his head momentarily pound. The windows were floor to ceilings, and let in as much of the descending California sun as was humanly possible. There was not a drape to be had in the whole space, apparently. There were six uniformed desks, each lined up with the other. And on a raised dais behind them was one desk twice as large as the others. Six women sat in the lower section. They all looked to be in their twenties, well-scrubbed, professionally dressed, efficient, earnest, smart, ambitious, and platinum blonde right down to the part in the middle of the scalp. They could be sextuplets, down to their bone marrow. Carriage typewriters clicked and clacked, phones rang, and a stock market tape rattled along on one walnut-carved credenza spelling doom or fortune, depending on one's Wall Street position. There was a frenetic energy here that was hard for Archer to wrap his head around. These ladies seemed to be living life at a different speed from the rest of humanity. Since the hat rack outside was empty, he figured they must keep theirs in their desk drawers. The walls were upholstered in what looked to be brown leather two-by-two -two tiles. On these walls hung paintings of seascapes and landscapes and mountainscapes, as well as other scapes Archer had never contemplated before. A marble statue of a naked woman and baby stood in one corner. Real plants whiled away their time in cast stone pots that dwarfed the ones in the hall. The overhead light fixtures were grand chandeliers, with about a thousand pieces of cut crystal each, and they looked like a bitch to clean, and even more of a bitch to raise to the ceiling. And that ceiling! It was flat metal copper plates acid-washed with blue, black, brown, and teal slashes. It looked like something he'd seen Europe before the war took its pound of flesh and everything else. The rug underneath his feet sank in two inches under his weight, and Archer didn't think he'd hit rock bottom yet. To Archer's mind, there was too much woodwork everywhere, like an overabundance of makeup on an aging film star. In trying to hide every perceived flaw, it succeeded in wiping out all that was authentic. Yet the whole outfit made Willie Dash's operation look like a plot in a desperate Depression-era Hooverville with cardboard homes and not an ounce of hope in sight. Despite that, Archer found himself preferring Dash's humble space over this over-the-top setup. The large desk on the raised dais was occupied by a very different sort. She was in her thirties, tall and well-shaped, and so brunette that in the sea of platinum she looked like the puppy that had gone lost. Her face held starkly intelligent features, and her eyebrows, as dark as the hair, acted like antennae, sniffing out everything before it became an issue. She was dressed all in black, except for a high white collar and slips of white around the ends of her long dress sleeves. Her hair was thick and wavy and graced her head like a tiara. She had stacks of files on both sides of her desk, a phone in the middle next to an open ledger book, and no typewriter in sight which told Archer that in addition to her heightened position behind the half-dozen ladies, she was the boss of this little dynasty. And unlike the frenetic activity going on around her, this lady exhibited an aura of languid calm, like the eye of a hurricane. She suddenly harumphed, and one of the platinums obediently rose like a pet on voice command and came over to greet Archer. She was dressed in a tailored brown pantsuit with dark heels, a white blouse, a yellow carnation in her buttonhole, and a splash of yellow in her breast pocket. 
An earthy colored cravat was around her throat. She looked like she was just about to step onto a magazine cover for smartly dressed professional women who wanted to take over the world by 1950. Mr. Archer, she said. The one and only. The efficient face sparked for a moment, and the lips looked like they might uplift to a smile, but then the moment was gone, and the mask went back on. Miss Darling will see you now. But I didn't ask to see Miss Darling. Yes, please step this way. Archer stepped that way, and was led up onto the dais, and deposited next to the brunette, a.k.a. Miss Darling, as the platinum returned to her glorified niche and commenced to attack her typewriter once more. Darling looked him up and down, perhaps gaining insights into him that Archer lacked himself. He twirled his hat and said, I'm here to see either Kemper or Sheen. Yes, I heard. Take a seat. It might be a while for either Mr. Kemper or Mr. Sheen. I only need to see them for a minute. That's what they all say. You see that chair over there? Take it, and we'll see what happens. And if you just buzz them? You're currently twelfth on the buzz list. And where are the other eleven? Asked Archer. They gave up. Let's see how much stamina you have. Can you put in a good word for me? Do you have a reason why I should? She said. I'll go smoke a cigarette like a good boy and think of one. This line seemed to please her, even as she deftly waved him off. He sat in the prescribed chair, a leather monster of a baseball mitt that looked like it might reach around and hug him to death, but ended up minding its own business. He slid a chrome ashtray stand over, lit up a lucky, and tapped ash into it as he gave the place the once-over once more. He came away even more impressed with its organization and blazing efficiency. The Platinums worked away like ants on a hill, occasionally venturing to Darling for some reason or another, showing a piece of paper, whispering something, or in one instance writing something down for her while casting worried glances at Archer. Darling took everything in, her eyebrows flicking and clicking like knitting needles. She made firm decisions and sent the girls on their productive way. He finally stood and wandered over to a large map of the area that sat on a wooden stand and had red stick pins inserted all over. By reading the accompanying information section, he was able to discern that these were ongoing Kemper projects, and there were an enviable number. He caught the Platinums eyeing him from time to time, and Darling once. Each time he smiled, which sent them scurrying back, goggle-eyed to their work, all except for Darling. She nodded and leisurely returned to what she was doing. Finally the door opened, and there was Wilson Sheen, dressed just as frumpily as before, with the front part of his shirt coming dangerously close to pulling free of the pants. Compared to the sea of efficient femininity spread out before him, he looked as out of place as a eunuch in a brothel. He eyed Darling, who nodded in Archer's direction. By Archer's timepiece, two hours had passed and it was getting close to dinner time, but none of the ladies had reached for their purses or hats. They continued to work like obedient bees before the queen. This way, Archer, said Sheen brusquely. Archer got up, stubbed out his smoke, and headed up to the dais where Darling said, So, you couldn't find a good enough reason, I take it. You're just very intimidating, Miss Darling. It set me off my mark. This line seemed to please her more than the first one. She actually smiled, so he could see even white teeth that he thought were as real as the rubber plants outside. The next room Archer stepped into was not much of a letdown from the previous. It was large and comfortably furnished, and its enormous windows had drapes, which were now all the way open to let in the dwindling light. How'd your guardian grizzly bear signal that I was here? asked Archer. She never left her desk or lifted the phone. She and I can read minds. If that's so, I might be in real trouble with her. Something makes me think you're always in trouble, Archer. Quite the operation you have out there, noted Archer. Those ladies seem to move at the speed of light. That's what we pay them to do, said Sheen, glancing at a file on his desk, a Victorian-era piece that would have looked at home in Buckingham Palace. You might want to issue them sunglasses. It's pretty tough on the eyes out there. Well, at least they won't be catching a nap. An enhanced sunlight is good for productivity. Unless you go blind in the process. And I don't think you need the sun so long as you have Miss Darling. 
Sheen sat down and said abruptly, And what can I do for you? Archer eyed one door set against the wall, on the other side of which was the outside hall. Sheen obviously used this to come and go without going through the working stiffs. The door set in the far wall, no doubt, led to Mr. Kemper's inner sanctum. He doubted he would get in there. He had run his share of the gauntlet, and it appeared to be ending one room shy of the finish line. He imagined Kemper, as the boss, had at least two escape hatches to get out of here without engaging the minions, platinum or not. Archer said, The list? The one with the people's names who might be behind the blackmail? It was supposed to be dropped off at our office, but it wasn't. Right, the list. He opened a drawer and rummaged through it while his gaze lifted to Archer's. Hard to see what you're looking for that way, noted Archer. What I'd like to know is what you've done so far. And where's Dash? Thinking. And you're out what, running his errands? Yeah, my next stop is for the sardines, crackers, and a bottle of Old Forester. You might want to come and join the party. Sheen slammed shut the drawer without taking anything from it. We're paying your bill, Archer, so don't play it cute with me. I have neither the time nor the interest. Well, I'd like to have back the last two hours of my life, but that's apparently wishful thinking. We are busy here. Yeah, I saw the map out there. So, the list? What have you done since we met earlier? Give me a report. Shouldn't I be talking to your boss? This comment made one of Sheen's eyes commence to twitch. I am Mr. Kemper's authorized representative for all things. All things? That's pretty heady stuff. If I were you, I'm not sure I'd want all that responsibility. But to answer your question, we went to see Ruby Fraser. Sheen sat up straight and gripped the front of his desk. You did what? She denies any affair happened, and also denies blackmailing Mr. Kemper. She could be lying, of course, and probably is. But if she denies it, that's good for us. Sure, why not? You don't sound convinced. Neither did she, if you get my drift. What else? asked Sheen, as he drummed his fingers on the desktop. We took a ride up into the foothills and saw Mrs. Kemper. Do you think she's intense, or was it just me? Are you insane? Douglas will be furious. For the record, I'm not certain Mrs. Kemper shares Ruby Fraser's opinion that Ruby Fraser is not being diddled by her hubby. You are a crude man, he snapped. But? But nothing. You're a crude and vulgar man. What else did Beth say? She knows nothing about nothing and really wasn't interested. She nodded. Well, that's good, then. So that list? Sheen reached into his pocket, pulled out a piece of folded paper, and handed it across to Archer. He unfolded it and looked at the list of names. And there it was all the time in your pocket. Is there anything else? Sheen said gruffly. Yeah, when do the girls out there knock off for the day? It's getting late. Why in the world do you care about that? I don't. But it looks like they don't know either. And they keep up that pace, they'll be dead by morning. Sheen pointed to the other door. You can leave this way. No, thanks. I opt for public entrances and exits at all times. I find it safer. Archer put the paper in his pocket and left. He passed by Darling, who looked at him. Good meeting? The best. I might make it a habit. When do you all call it a day here? When I say we do. Right. Okay, look me up sometime. I'm over on Porter Street. We'll have a drink. Name's Archer, in case you forgot. Porter Street? She said with a hiked brow. Yeah, it's on the other side of Sawyer Avenue. Do a border crossing sometime. We don't bite. At least I don't. I doubt we will ever have a drink together, but I will have no trouble remembering your name. Oh, yeah? Why's that? She smirked. You look to be a pretty decent shot. Then maybe we will have that drink together. What's your first name? Aloysius. What's yours? Well, Aloysius, mine is Wilma. Wilma, darling. Has a ring to it. Archer, quit while your head's still above water. He graced the woman with a smile and a tip of his fedora before winking at the row of platinums. He got smiles back from half. He considered that his best odds since Reno. Chapter 30
This looks like a nice place. Are you sure you can afford it? Callahan glanced around the interior of the restaurant called Burbank's. It was all brick with a drive through portico, white jacketed and gloved valets, gas lanterns providing flickering light, and a parking lot full of high-dollar cars. It was after seven, and the place was packed with the well-heeled of Baytown in all their glory. Not to worry. Remember, I'm a working man now. He took out his P.I. license and held it out to her. Wow, Archer. This looks official and everything. Hey, if I needed you to vouch for me, sign a document saying I was okay in your book, would you do that? She handed the license back to him. Why do you need me to do that? Apparently it's part of being an honest-to-God P.I. in California. But I thought you were already licensed. Isn't that what the card said? He slipped it back into his jacket. It's sort of complicated, Liberty. Everything with you is sort of complicated. Look who's talking. Yeah, sure, I'll do it. Then maybe you can put in a good word for me with Warner Brothers. She quipped. Now let's go eat. I'm starving. They walked arm in arm into the dining area where they were met by the hostess, who was draped in a silky white number that fell off one shoulder and was barely clinging to the other. Her cleavage was so prominently revealed that even Callahan looked taken aback. The shimmery hostess glided through the sea of tables like a siren to a floundering ship as she led them to a private corner alcove with a built-in banquette seat. She positioned them side by side and looking out at their fellow diners. She bent down and placed the menus in front of them, giving Archer another peek at her bosom. She whispered in a working-class British accent, You look to me like a gent that doesn't like having his back exposed. Am I right, Gov? Archer thanked her with a nod, and she sashayed off for her next victims. Archer eyed the drinks section of the menu and glanced at Callahan. She was dressed in a pale blue polyester skirt and jacket with black trimmings, with a white blouse underneath, and dress gloves a hat with a short veil tacked up to the rim and black four-inch heels over sheer stockings completed her outfit. Every man in the room had given her the eye, even those there with other women seated across from them. What's your poison? asked Archer. Champagne cocktail, for starters. Remember, we have to work tonight. You think a champagne cocktail is going to put me under the table, Archer? Where have you been since we met? The waitress came over and Archer ordered the champagne cocktail for Callahan and a martini for himself. Bring the onions and hold the olives, he tacked on. They pulled out their cigarettes and lit up, dropping ash into the bowl provided on their table. How'd you find this place? she asked. Just looked west of Sawyer Avenue, and there it was, like shooting fish in a barrel. You talking code or something? Or something. Their drinks came, and they toasted Archer's new job. So, how did this afternoon go? Have you solved the case yet? Not exactly. When I do, you'll be the second to know, right after Willie Dash, unless he gets there first. So how's it going with him? You think you're going to learn a lot? The guy's good. Knows the town and the people in it, for the most part. What does that mean? It means for the most part. He picked up the menu. What looks good? You order for me, Archer. He shot a glance. Really? Why's that? I'm not used to nice places like this. In Reno, we just had crap, really. And you think I'm used to them? No, I mean, I don't know. But you can tell the people in here are somebody. They have class. The men probably all went to college for an education, and the women probably all went to college to find a husband. Archer eyed the woman closely because this was the first real hint of insecurity he had seen in her. He tapped her hand. You're as good as all of these people, Liberty, and don't think you're not. Sure, sure, Archer. And I'm the Queen of England, too. Where's this coming from? he asked. Until we walked in here, I never would have thought you had an ounce of self-doubt or gave a damn what anybody thought about you. Shows how good an observer you are. I guess, he said. They both ended up with the trout which was moist and tender, and rice pilaf and a green vegetable that was not readily identifiable to either of them. But it was good if over-salted. Their cocktails were followed by a bottle of wine, recommended by a short man wearing a bow tie and holding a cork opener on a chain. It cost three dollars, 
which almost gave Callahan a fit and amused Archer. Archer examined the bottle's label. It had the silhouette of a woman on it that looked familiar to Archer. The wine was called the BK. On the back, he read off the name of the vineyard that had produced it, Kemper Enterprises. BK must stand for Beth Kemper. Archer explained who she was and what they were investigating. Her hubby is a vineyard, and he named the wine after her. Well, wasn't that sweet? I guess the louse figures he owes her after cheating on her. Could be, yeah. Although I probably shouldn't have told you that. So keep it to yourself. She gave him the eye. Gee, what's it worth to you, Archer? See, you keep charging and I keep retreating. Thing is, I don't want you to be disappointed. You have such a high opinion of me and everything. You're actually getting funnier, and I mean that. They finished their meal, retrieved the Delahaye, and drove out of town toward midnight moods. It was well dark now, and cool enough to ride with the top up. No mountains, right? said Callahan. Scout's honor. You were no Boy Scout. What do you have in that thing? She had earlier placed a small, hard-sided piece of luggage in the seat between them. Things for the job interview, Archer. Okay. They reached midnight moods forty minutes later. It was very different from earlier in the day. The parking lot was packed, the facade of the building was ablaze in neon and spotlights, and the sounds inside reached all the way to the parking lot as they pulled in. Gee, this place is dead, said Callahan sarcastically. He found a space in the back of the parking lot, and Callahan grabbed her back. They walked in and looked around. Mabel Dawson, now bedecked in a black sequined number with shoes that matched, greeted them at the door. Oh, the puppy dog came back, she said to Archer before giving Callahan the long eye. And who is your friend? Liberty Callahan, said Callahan, putting out her gloved hand. Archer said you might be looking for some new girls. Is that right, Archer? New blood, said Archer. Can't hurt to take a look. She turned to Callahan and gave her an even longer scrutiny. So, what's your shtick? Singing, dancing, acting, skits. You name it, I can slot it. And that includes the fast hands and lousy stage timing from the guys. Dawson pursed her lips and inched up her nose like a smell had come along she didn't care for. You strike me as being overly confident. Callahan put a hand on her hip and stuck it out wide like a door opening. And you strike me as the sort that, if I can't cut it here, you'll gladly throw me out on my very cute derriere. Dawson lit a cigarette and blew a lungful of smoke at Archer. She eyed Callahan through the mist. Sure, I'll see what you got. But if you get the gig, there's no drinking or drugging on company time. You're here, you serve the house, you get paid a salary. Tips are your business. Whatever else you can earn on your own time, that's your business too. I've heard the song before. Dawson eyed the bag. Your working clothes in there? We got some of our own. But these show me off the way I like. Dawson again blew a lungful of smoke at Archer. You can really find them, Archer. And where's your gumshoe twin? Thinking. Right. She looked at Callahan. Okay, let's go back to the dressing room, and I can put you through your paces. Sound good? You sure you can spare the time now? You look busy. I can teach a monkey to greet people at the door. And I'm not just saying that. I have. Shirley! She called out. A little minx with bushy red hair flew out of some hidey hole like a mouse stirred by a cat's charge and stood cringing in front of her boss. Yes, Miss Dawson? Take Archer here, get him a drink on the house, and find him a seat at the next show. I'll wait here until you get back, and then you got greeter duty for the next half hour. She glanced at Callahan and said in a syrupy tone, That enough time for you, honey, or are you a slow starter? That'll do, said Callahan. Where are you coming in from? Reno. Casinos? Sort of. Well, don't sort of perform for me, or you will get tossed out on that very cute ass, and I'll be the one doing the tossing just so long as we know where we stand, retorted Callahan. Dawson said, Don't worry, Archer. I'll have her back to you in half an hour, one way or another. 
Before Shirley led him away, Archer said anxiously to Callahan, Hey, you okay with this? She smiled. Not only am I okay with it, Archer, I'm really looking forward to it. Chapter 31 Shirley got Archer a gin and tonic and settled him in the back row of a large theater where the dancing girls were in high gear. Parading to music played on a baby grand set off to one side of the stage. The pianist was a man in a black tux with a pompadour hairdo, a waxed and curly-tipped mustache, and hands whizzing over the keys like skates over ice. He watched the girls high-kicking it across the stage in unison and seemed to be changing the music to fit the dancing instead of the other way around. All the girls were tall and long-limbed, which, to Archer, made them look a lot like Callahan. He wondered if maybe the competition here was stiffer than in Reno, and he also wondered how her audition was going. The theme was a patriotic one, as the skimpy outfits were embedded with red, white, and blue sparkles, and the top hats were of the Uncle Sam vintage. The legs were encased in fishnets. The shoes were silver and sparkled like diamonds, and every man in the front row was getting an enhanced view with each kick of the long legs and the accompanying lift of the dancer's skirts, all included in the price of admission. Twenty-eight minutes went by. Archer checked his timepiece and began to grow a bit anxious, as there was no sign of Callahan. Had she gotten thrown out? And then around ten or so the curtains parted, and Archer stiffened and sat up straight, as Callahan walked out onto the stage at the same time the sea of chorus girls scampered off. She was dressed in the outfit Archer had first seen her in at the Dancing Birds Café, minus the six-foot feather. Every eye in the house was on her, including Archer's. She walked over to the pianist, said something to him, quickly skimmed through his music, and tapped her finger against a piece. Then she backed up to the piano, gripped the sides with both hands, and nimbly launched herself on top of it, sitting on her bottom. She crossed her legs and gave a nod to the pianist, and he started tickling the ivories with enthusiasm, perhaps as intrigued as the rest of them with this recent development. When Callahan began to sing, Archer felt chills run up and down his arms. The song was one he knew well. That old black magic— Archer had heard Glenn Miller and his band play that song when he was in London in 1944, after Archer had killed enough Germans to make any humans sick of war. At the end of that year, Miller would die in a plane crash in the English Channel. But that night the man could do no wrong. The song had sent chills up him that night, too, but not like Callahan's rendition was doing to him. In mid-song, she slunk off the piano and marched across the stage in full command of both it and the audience. As she reached the end of the song, she tipped her head back, showcasing that long, elegantly curved neck, and held the final note for a remarkable period. She then let it die elegantly in her throat, like a thunderstorm dwindling to a gentle rain shower. There was silence for what seemed the longest moment, and then the cheers rained down. The crowd lurched as one to its feet, and thunderous applause filled the room. Hats and flowers and cash were tossed on the stage, along with probably a few business cards and maybe a stray engagement ring or two. Callahan picked up one long-stemmed rose, cuddled it to her bosom, and blew kisses at the audience as she walked off stage, looking like she owned the place. And right then, Archer knew. She did. He felt the tug on his arm. It was Shirley. This way, she whispered. Shirley led him backstage, where Callahan was sipping a glass of champagne, and Dawson was staring at her like she was a bundle of cash with Dawson's name on it. She looked at Archer as he walked up. Okay, she says you're her agent. How much is she going to cost me? Archer shot Callahan a glance as she finished her drink and set it down next to the long-stemmed rose. She hiked her plucked eyebrows and said, How about it, Archer? What am I worth to a joint like this? He didn't hesitate. Two hundred and fifty a week, and she gets Monday and Tuesday off. After six months, we look at your books and see what bump and pay she deserves for bringing in new business. You're nuts, barked Dawson. That's what some Hollywood actors make. Did you see the audience out there? said Archer. Because I did. 
You'll need to get a bigger room, or squeeze in more seats if you bring her on full time. And if the pie gets larger, it's good for everybody. Callahan looked impressed by this, but said nothing. Dawson glared at Archer, grabbed the bottle of champagne that was chilling in a bucket of ice, and swilled right from it. She pointed at Callahan. I'll need you to start this Friday. Get here around five. We have big crowds on Fridays, and then through the weekend, of course. And it'll still give us time to get some posters and billboards up. You're a real pro, so we don't need to prep that much. Hell, you could do what you did tonight, and it'll bring the house down again. You can do a quick rehearsal with the full band, and we can select a rack of songs for you to move through. We might want to throw in some dance moves, too. Nothing too complicated. But I saw how natural you were on stage, so you'll make it look easy. Then you can do your big debut. And what will the billboards say? Asked Archer. I don't think they need to say much. They'll just have her picture. I had Barry, our staff photographer, take some stills of Liberty. We'll blow them up and use them on the billboards. How about something like, if you liked Liberty Bonds, you're going to love this Liberty, suggested Archer. I like that, Archer. It's catchy, said Dawson, who then turned to Callahan. So, how about it? I don't have a car to get here. That's not a problem because all of our performers live here. We'll have a nice room for you. I can go for that, said Callahan. Archer said, but nicer than what I saw in Ruby Fraser's place, and not in the nosebleed seats. Okay, okay. And her own bathroom, added Archer. I don't even have that. Archer said nothing. Okay, okay, said Dawson again. She glared at Callahan. If only you weren't so damn talented, I'd throw the pair of you out. Archer looked at Callahan. Well, your call, boss. Get the contract printed up, and we're good to go, said Callahan. Dawson put out a hand for Callahan to shake, which she did. With the dough we'll be paying you, this is a full-time gig. Starting Saturday, you come in at four sharp every day. She glanced at Archer. Except Mondays and Tuesdays. You'll start with rehearsal, then eat your meals and do your acts, which will also include some freelancing and playing to the crowd, pictures and handshakes and the like. You'll do four to five official sets a night, but you work until we say stop, which is usually two-ish. Understood? Sure. Dawson gazed admiringly at her. I have to admit, I thought you were going to fall flat on your face with your audition. She looked at Archer. She sang Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy for me. I think Patty Andrews would have been jealous. It's a crowd pleaser, Archer, and that's the business I'm in, said Callahan. Her face was flushed with her triumph, and Archer had to admit it was a good look on the woman. Well, well, what's all the fuss here? Good tidings, I hope. The tall man had appeared in the doorway. Archer saw that Dawson's smile faded and her confident look eroded. She took a step back and stared at the floor. Hello, Mr. Armstrong. I didn't know you'd be here tonight. Sawyer Armstrong stood an impressive six feet five. He was lanky and loose-jointed, with long white hair and a beard of the same color that dipped slightly off his lean face. His nose ran a long, crooked line down to nearly his top lip. He wore a brown slouch leather hat, dark denim pants, a white vest with a blue-collared shirt under that, and a brown corduroy jacket with green elbow patches. His skin was weathered and tanned, and the man's features seemed carved with the most precise of instruments wielded by talented hands. The eyes were flints of blue, surrounded by a sea of shimmering white. He sort of looked like Walt Whitman, thought Archer. That is, if Whitman had been a throat slitter instead of a poet. Armstrong put out a hand to Archer. I'm Sawyer Armstrong. I believe you've talked to my son-in-law, Mr. Archer. Archer shook hands while casting a look behind Armstrong, where two bulky figures lurked in pinstripes with bulges at their chests where large weapons presumably perched. Nice to meet you, Mr. Armstrong. I've heard a lot about you. I'm sure you have, Archer. You saw my daughter as well, I heard. Your hearing is real good, then, said Callahan drawing Armstrong's attention to her. And you are? Liberty Callahan. I'm Archer's best friend. We came to town together. Miss Dawson just hired me to work here. Did she now? 
said Armstrong. Dawson glanced up, her face full of trepidation, as Archer watched this exchange warily. He had never seen a person change so much as the woman had, and there must be good reason for it. In a timid voice, she said, I did, Mr. Armstrong. She's quite good. I think she'll really bring in the crowds. Armstrong studied Callahan for a moment before turning to Archer. And how is Willie Dash doing? He's fine. Armstrong put out a thin, long-fingered hand and gripped Archer by the arm. Let's have a chat, Archer. I have a private room here. You want some company, Archer? said Callahan quickly and looking uneasily at him. Armstrong answered, I'm sorry, Liberty. Maybe another time. Archer said, I'll meet you back at the bar. We'll toast your new career. Callahan gave him a half-smile that sank off her face as quickly as a cement block dropped over the gunwale of a boat. Sure. Okay. She glanced behind Armstrong as the two men stepped forward. Both were as tall as Armstrong, but far bulkier and their faces held nothing approaching human. I'll come looking for you if you're not there soon, she added. Armstrong said, Let's go, Archer. The two sides of beef immediately stepped forward and marshaled Archer out. Armstrong eyed the two women. Mabel, we'll talk later. Yes, sir. They glanced at Callahan, who stared resolutely back at him. Then without a word, he followed the others out. Chapter 32 The room was small, dark, and located in the bowels of the place where, Archer presumed, only the rats typically lurked. He was feeling like a trapped one right now. The single bulb illumination overhead gave him no comfort. One of the men, on a sign from Armstrong, searched him, found the thirty-eight, pulled it out, and placed it on a table out of Archer's reach, before the other man pushed Archer into a chair. Armstrong sat down in the only other chair in the room which faced Archer. He glanced at the gun. Going around armed already? Do you feel that necessary? Are we that dangerous in Baytown? Archer glanced at the men. And what do they have under their jackets? Lollipops? Armstrong lifted out paper and tobacco from a pouch taken from his jacket pocket, dexterously rolled a small cigarette, and lighted it with a match struck against the table. The best tobacco in Mississippi, he said in a soothing tone as he sucked in a throatful and then let it ease out into the small space. Have it shipped in monthly. You should try it. Is there something you wanted to talk to me about? said Archer. Or am I supposed to just watch you smoke? This statement earned him a staggering blow on the side of the head from one of Armstrong's men, that knocked him from his seat. The other man lifted him up and slammed Archer back into the chair. Armstrong made a clucking sound. Tony is overzealous sometimes in his loyalty to me, Archer, though I can hardly fault him. You understand loyalty, do you not? When it's explained to me, said Archer, rubbing at his face. A searing pain went from his head to his toes, and the ringing in his ears made it impossible for him to hear the accelerated beats of his own heart. Well, I can provide that explanation, then, said Armstrong, scooching forward a bit on his chair. First of all, loyalty starts at home. I have a daughter whom I cherish, and a son-in-law whom I respect. Loyalty, okay, that's good to know, thanks. Are we done here? The second blow caught Archer on the other side of the head, and he slumped out of his chair, groaning. When Tony went to pick him up, Archer caught him in the gut with a pinpoint uppercut, doubling the man over and causing him to stagger back and retch up whatever was in his stomach. It came out as a pink slop that hit the floor. The other man grabbed Archer around the neck, lifted him off the floor, and slammed him into the chair. Tony recovered and gave Archer punches in the neck and oblique, while the other man held him in place. Enough! barked Armstrong, and the breathless men released Archer and stepped back. Archer, if you wish to be beaten to death, then by all means carry on as you are. But I see no future in it for you. 
Archer fought back the urge to vomit. As the pains continued to radiate from his head and now to his gut and back, with an effort he managed to sit up straight. He reached into his pocket and took a few moments to pull out a handkerchief, which he used to dab at his mouth. He bent down and picked up his hat from the floor and put it on. So where do I come into all this? You are investigating the allegations against Douglas? On his behalf, which makes me wonder what I'm doing here getting my ass kicked by these two gorillas. What will make me happy, Archer, is that you do not ever question my daughter again. You should not have questioned her in the first place. She is not party to anything that her husband may be involved in. Do you understand that? Okay, yeah. And this Ruby Fraser woman? What about her? Is she having an affair with Douglas? He says not, and she says the same. And what do you say? I don't know. But if I tell you my opinion, am I going to get slugged again? If so, I'd just prefer to lie. Tony started to swing a fist at Archer, but he ducked out of the way, pivoted on the balls of his feet, came out of the chair, and struck the man flush on the chin with a thunderous blow. Tony staggered back and slammed into the wall. His eyes rolled back into his head, and he slid down the wall unconscious. His legs splayed out, and his pants were edged up enough to reveal the tops of pale, hairy ankles. The other man pulled a black, square-muzzled forty-five automatic from his shoulder holster and took aim at Archer's right eye. Armstrong said, Put that away, Hank, and give Tony a nip from your flask to revive him, unless you want to carry him out of here. While Hank did this, Armstrong eyed Archer. You pack a pretty big wallop. Good to know. Archer held up the set of aluminum knuckles he had pulled from his pocket under the guise of getting his handkerchief. Yeah, pretty big. But getting back to the issue, your opinion? I haven't looked into it enough to have an opinion. We only started the investigation today. But if you want a half-assed opinion, I'd say there's some truth to it. But that truth does not have to come out. We were hired by your son-in-law. I would imagine he gets our report and no one else, so I don't see that as a problem for him and his campaign for mayor. I don't know about that, but I do know this, Archer. Baytown is a deceitful place with secrets. You'll find that out soon enough. He paused. If you make it that long. I survived the war. I think I can get through this. Armstrong shook his head. Wars are straightforward. It's you against the men in the other uniform. There is no nuance. There is no need to think about what you need to do. Here it is quite a different scenario. It's a chess match with no room for error. Yeah, when you say it that way, I can see how that might be. Thanks. What do you intend to do now? Continue the investigation. And what course will it take? I got a list of people to talk to from Wilson Sheen. May I see the list? And if I refuse? I can assure you that all of our myriad interests are aligned here, Archer. He glanced at Tony, who had come around with the two pulls in the flask Hank had poured down his throat. But I can't guarantee that Tony over there will not be so upset at being sucker-punched by you with a pair of aluminum knuckles that he won't resort to drastic actions. I could be wrong but I wouldn't bet your life on it. Would you? Archer took out the list and handed it across. Armstrong put on a pair of delicate rimless glasses and read down the names. Interesting. He handed the paper back and removed the specs. Now let me be clear, Archer. We are at a crossroads here. Baytown has unlimited potential, but so do lots of other places. If we do not seize the moment, others will. And what will we be left with? Not much. What do you want me to do, Mr. Armstrong? I imagine you brought me down here to provide some instruction. Follow your instincts, Archer. Do your job. Finish your investigation. And if it comes back against your son-in-law? I care enough about this town 
that it takes precedence over family. After all your talk of loyalty, the ultimate loyalty is to put the interests of many above your own, and that includes family. If you take away any lesson from this painful episode, let it be that. The guy may be cheating on your beloved daughter. How do you respect that? I have no reason to answer that, and I won't. He sat back, took off his hat, revealing unruly, thick white hair, and ran his hand through it. I know you have a client already, but I will pay you as well to follow the trail to the truth, wherever it might lie. He put his hat on, took out his wallet, and lifted from it a wad of cash. How much? You can take that up with Willie, but I'm not sure we can have two clients for the same case. Armstrong put his wallet away, but held out a fifty-dollar bill. I will take it up with Willie, but take this in payment for your assorted injuries. I apologize if you are in real pain. Archer made no move to take the money. I'll wait to hear from Willie. He glanced at Tony. And that guy doesn't hit hard enough to be worth fifty bucks. This comment earned a murderous look from Tony. Armstrong stuck the bill in his pocket. I like you, Archer. I'm not sure exactly why, but I do. But then my opinion is not set in stone. His face went dark, and he stood and walked out. Tony and Hank glared at Archer for a moment, as though they were contemplating killing him and wondering what to do with the body. Finally, they followed their boss out. Archer picked up his gun and put it back in the clip holster. He stood up slowly and stretched out his torso, gritting his teeth with the cascading pain. He gingerly readjusted his hat, as though the weight of the fedora was too much for his injured head to bear. He wondered if his skull was fractured, and when he went to bed tonight whether he would wake up in the morning. He slowly walked out of the room and headed back up to the light of the real world and away from the rats. But instead... Maybe he was heading right toward them. Chapter 33 Jesus, Archer! Did they do that to you? Callahan was looking at the purplish bruises on Archer's neck and face as he slowly drained a whiskey sour and ran his tongue over his teeth to make certain they were all still there. He came away unsure. He set the glass down on the bar. Now I just fell off the roof of this place and landed on somebody's fist, and then I did it three more times. But why did they work you over? I'm not sure I have a good answer for that. I'm not sure he did either. Armstrong, you mean? Archer nodded and waved to the waitress for a second round. She obliged, and he sipped this one slowly. Does it hurt much? Only when I blink. He rubbed his side where he could feel the swelling. Tony was good. He knew just where to hit to hurt a man. He called the waitress and asked for some ice wrapped in a cloth. The waitress said, You don't look so good, mister. Were you in an accident? There was nothing accidental about it. When she brought the ice in the cloth, he took turns holding it against his face and his neck and his side. Is that helping? Asked Callahan. I'll let you know next week. Callahan said, I'm not sure I want to work for a man who beats up my friend. Thanks for elevating me to the status of a friend. What's the next level after that? Archer, you know what I mean. Yeah, sure. We're pals. Always have been, always will be. You want me to massage where it hurts? Don't get carried away with all this friendship talk, Liberty. You might start getting ideas, and then I might start getting ideas, and we might end up killing each other over all those ideas. She pulled her stool closer and said, I can't believe I actually got the job. He gave her an incredulous glance. That's not how you were acting. You seemed really sure of yourself, like you were a shoe-in once Dawson saw your stuff. Yeah, well, that was just talk. I do that to boost myself up. Inside, I was a wreck. Good to know that about you. Maybe I do the same. So do you want to head on back to town? Not yet. You forgot the other reason we came here. What was that? To talk to Ruby Fraser. He looked at his timepiece. We missed her show. She might be up in her room. I know where it is. Come on. He stood and then staggered a bit. 
She grabbed hold of him. You sure you're up for this? No, but I'm going to do it anyway because according to Sawyer Armstrong, I might not get another chance. Hey, why isn't that jerk Willie Dash out here helping you? What a bum. He's not a bum. He's also not a well man. He laid the ice and cloth on the table. Now come on. They headed up the stairs and reached the top floor, which was empty at this hour. How come she has to live all the way up here? Asked Callahan. This is the hired help section. According to Mabel Dawson, girls here work their way down. Hey, do you think they expect me to live up here too? No, you'll get a place with your own bathroom at sea level, remember? Oh, right. Hey, how come you know so much about negotiating contracts? I knew what Ruby Fraser was making here. I doubled that amount and added fifty on top for good measure, and nicer lodgings. Well, aren't you a smart one? But then you are a college boy. I studied pre-law in college, even worked for a lawyer during the summer. Got to see the law up close and personal. So you wanted to be a lawyer? He lit up a lucky and blew out smoke. I was a lawyer, of sorts, back in Polka City. What'd you do there? Kept myself from being hanged. <laughs> That's funny, Archer. It wasn't funny at the time. Archer led the way down the hall to Fraser's door. He knocked, but no one answered. She doesn't seem to be here, said Callahan, staring at the door. Maybe she's off doing another show. Like Dawson said, they keep performing until around two-ish. Archer knocked harder. Ruby, it's Archer. We need to talk. There was still no answer. He said, We can look for her downstairs and then ask around. Maybe she's doing another number, like you said. But I'd like to leave a note inside her room. He tried the door. It was unlocked. He pushed it open and walked in. Callahan nervously followed. Archer, I'm not sure we should be doing this. It'll be fine. Archer turned on a table lamp and took out his notepad and pen, only he found that in the skirmish with Hank and Tony, the point had been broken off his pen. Check in the kitchen for something to write with. I'll look in the bedroom. Archer walked into the tiny bedroom and noted that the bed was made, but the room was messy, with clothes and shoes everywhere. He found a pen in the nightstand next to the Gideon Bible and had turned to leave when Callahan filled the doorway like a tsunami coming right for him. Her face was drained of all color, and she looked like she might be sick. What is it? he asked sharply. She stepped aside and pointed to her left with one hand while holding her stomach with the other. In there, she said, her voice brimming with dread. Archer raced past her and into the kitchen. The room was illuminated by a single overhead bulb, but Archer could see enough. Ruby Fraser was all dressed up, probably for her big number tonight. She was sitting in a chair that was pushed back against the wall. Her head was slightly tilted back, her long legs splayed out in front of her, and the woman's wide eyes were full upon Archer. Still, she could not see him. Ruby Fraser could no longer see anything. He gingerly stepped forward and bent down so he could ascertain more closely what had killed her. It wasn't difficult. Her throat had been cut so brutally that he could glimpse white bone through the fresh opening. The cut disappeared around both sides of her neck and ran along the back to nearly her spine. Another six inches, and she would have lost her head entirely. The woman had not been killed here. There was no blood on the floor, table, or walls, though the front of her dress was coated with it, transforming white to crimson. He felt her wrist. It was ice cold. He checked his watch. It was ten to twelve. If she had done her show at ten, and it had taken a half hour or so, how could she be killed, moved, and cold as ice barely an hour or so later? He lifted her arm. It moved freely. He replaced it exactly where it was. Don't do that, Archer. Don't touch her. It's not right. He turned to see Callahan staring dully at the dead woman from the doorway. She was really pretty said Callahan in a hushed voice. And really young. Yeah, she was, said Archer, taking a few steps back. Poor kid. Who could have done this? What I want to know is how could somebody move a dead body in here and nobody see it? 
The lack of blood shows she was killed somewhere else. Callahan still looked like she might be sick. What do we do now? Call the cops? There's a phone booth right off the front entrance. I'll make the call from there. Will you tell the police who you are? My morals say yes. My survival instinct says no. I always go with survival. Let's blow this joint before somebody sees us. As they turned to leave, Archer looked back at Fraser and said quietly, I'm sorry, Ruby. Nobody deserves to go out like that. Before they left, Archer took out a handkerchief and rubbed at all the places they had touched, including the doorknobs. What are you doing? asked Callahan. Getting rid of our fingerprints. What for? Because in the state of California, they can send you to the gas chamber. That's what for. Chapter 34 Archer stepped into the phone booth, dropped in a coin, covered the receiver with his handkerchief, and dialed in the number for the police he'd found in the phone book dangling from a chain on the booth's inner wall. When the voice came on the line, Archer told the person about the body at midnight moods, giving the room location. He hung up, put his handkerchief away, and stepped out, pale and aching from his earlier beating. Callahan was standing next to the booth and watching him carefully. Well? A radio patrol car should be here shortly. And where will we be? Long gone from here, I hope. Give me a minute. I want to check something. What? Something that's bugging me timing-wise. They found Mabel Dawson in her office. She looked up from her desk where she was writing something on a piece of paper. I don't have the contract ready yet, Archer. I'm talking to the lawyer tomorrow, so just hold your horses. And we don't advance money on any contract, if that's what you're thinking. No, it wasn't that. I wanted to speak with Ruby Fraser. Do you know where she might be? I've been looking around, but no one's seen her. She put her pen down and frowned. Now I'm really starting to get worried. She didn't turn up for her show tonight. She didn't? You know she didn't. He shot Callahan a glance. How would I know that? said Archer. Dawson rubbed her forehead. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess you wouldn't know. Well, it was because Liberty took Ruby's slot. That's why I had her go out on stage tonight. I mean, why'd you think I'd do something like that? Wait a minute. You mean to tell me that Liberty sang in place of Ruby? Yes, it was the only thing I could think of. I didn't have anybody else worth anything to stand in for her. Ruby has good pipes, but nothing like Liberty. So I told Liberty to go out on stage to Michael. He's the pianist, and find a song she knew. And that's what she did. I thought you were just putting me on the spot to test me, said Callahan. Well, maybe there was a little bit of that. But the main thing was I needed a singer to cover for Ruby. Did anyone check her room? Asked Archer slowly, as he inwardly cringed at the mention of Fraser's pipes. Yeah, I did, before I made the decision to use Liberty. What time? I got a message from the stage manager right after Liberty finished her audition that Ruby hadn't turned up for her warm-up. So I went looking for her, starting with her room. The door was locked, but I have a key. I thought maybe she was sick or had overslept or something. I went in, but there was no one there. Archer glanced at Callahan once more. And no one had seen her? No. I thought she might have gone off somewhere with someone and left me in the lurch. Why would you think that? asked Archer in a sharp tone. Dawson looked at him warily. No reason, Archer. Come on, Mabel. We're all friends here. Ruby liked men. Any men in particular? Rich men, said Dawson. Okay, I guess that narrows it down. Any rich men in particular? You're the gumshoe. I'll let you figure that out. She sat back, a look of clarity spreading over her features. So that's why you were out earlier talking to her. It was about some man she might be seeing. It might have been. So what's the deal with Sawyer Armstrong? She eyed his damaged face and then ran her gaze over his stiffened posture. Maybe I should be asking you the same thing. I understand he built this place. Before the war started. Is Armstrong married? What do you care? I'm just trying to get some information. That's what private detectives do. His wife, Eleanor, died in a plane crash a couple years ago. Do you know Beth Kemper or her husband? She laughed. I don't move in those sorts of exalted circles. I understand that Douglas Kemper comes here to play cards, and maybe for other things. 
Maybe you understand that. I don't. Meaning? Meaning I'm not getting involved. If you have any other questions, ask somebody else. Okay. Well, if Ruby turns up, let her know that I want to talk to her. Dawson looked at Callahan. Don't be late on Friday, Liberty. We need to sign your deal and get things sorted out. They left, got into the Delahaye, and were driving out when the first patrol car came flying up the road and passed them heading to the entrance. As they made their way down the road, two more prowlers sailed past them, their lights flinging away the gloomy darkness and the sirens cutting through the sounds of the breakers off in the distance. What now, Archer? said Callahan. Now we go back to the boarding house. You want to go get a drink? No, I've had enough. Okay, I guess I can understand that. I just feel bad leaving her there like that. He gripped her shoulder. Get that out of your mind, and don't slip up if anybody asks you, Liberty. We didn't go up there, and we didn't see anything. You got that square? Sure, Archer, sure. Because if the police start asking questions and you mess up, we're both in trouble. Big trouble. They rode the rest of the way back in silence. Chapter 35 A distraught Callahan had gone to her room, and Archer to his. He got undressed and climbed into bed, but he couldn't sleep. He felt that if he closed his eyes, they wouldn't reopen, and his whole body ached even more. It was nearly two in the morning now, but he rose, padded down to the bath, and splashed cold water on his face and neck. He went back to his room, slipped on the same clothes, and laced up his shoes. He opened the window and looked out. Even from the other side of Sawyer Avenue, he could hear the beat of the ocean, smell its pungent scent, and feel the mist from the marine fog that chilled into the bone and made his injuries more painful still. He pulled his P.I. license from his jacket pocket and looked at it. Though it looked official and important, it represented nothing to him, really, because he'd done nothing to earn it. This could have been handed out to any Tom, Dick, or Harry or Aloysius. He was a Seamus solely under the auspices of Willie Dash. Anyone could be under the auspices. It was like hitching a ride in someone's car and then claiming you owned it. He pulled his pocket flask, and despite telling Callahan he'd had his fill, he took several swallows of rye whiskey, which flamed his already inflamed body. It felt good, as though it was fire of his own making, and not a byproduct of another man's angry attack. He closed the window and went downstairs as quietly as he could. He had no desire to run into Callahan or anyone else. But that desire was to be defeated. In the front room, Madame Genevieve sat in an upholstered chair wearing a thick woolen robe and frayed white slippers. She was nursing what looked like a hot toddy in a clear glass mug with a handle. Her hair was mostly hidden under an old-fashioned cloth sleeping bonnet. Her ankles protruded from the robe and were bony and the color of the dead. She looked up at him. You cannot sleep, Mr. Archer? He leaned against the stair post and shook his head. Might just be the new place. Your friend does not appear to have that difficulty. I passed her door earlier and heard the snores. Soft, but still audible. Well, she had a big night. We both did. Archer sat down in a chair across from her. So what are you doing up? Can't sleep either? I like this time of night. There is no one around, and it is quiet. I can think. But I can also open the window, and I can hear the water speaking to me. I can smell it. I can let it embrace me like a shroud. How many of those drinks have you had? Archer said with a grin. It is not alcohol that speaks, Mr. Archer. What, then? Perhaps it is the wisdom of an old woman who has seen much. Perhaps too much. She cradled her drink. What are you really doing in Baytown? Got a job. I'm a private eye, working for Willie Dash. You know him? I've seen the billboards. And do you like being a private investigator? He shrugged. I haven't been doing it long enough to really know. But it has its good points and bad points. He rubbed his neck. I saw the bad points a few hours ago. He looked down at his shoes. Look, you know anything about Sawyer Armstrong or Beth and Douglas Kemper? Everyone in Baytown knows of them. But you don't know them? I don't know them. Not really. 
She said these words as though they were distasteful, lingering in her mouth for even a moment. You trying to tell me something? If so, I'd prefer if you just say it. I will not say anything of the sort. I live here. I have a business here that I need to operate in order to survive. We have the right to speak our minds in this country. She glanced dourly at him. Free speech is not really free if it costs you all that you have. Care to elaborate? She shook her head and held the glass against her withered cheek. Douglas Kemper is running for mayor, said Archer. I know. Thinking of voting for him or for the dentist he's running against, Alfred Drake? I haven't thought much about it, quite frankly. I liked our last mayor. Archer perked up. And who was that? Benjamin Smalls. He was honest. He did right by the people. Why isn't he running again, then? He died while in office, just a month ago. The upcoming election is a special election. The winner will finish out Smalls' term, which is three more years. Archer squinted at her. How'd he die? They say he drowned in his bathtub. They say? You don't know for sure? I don't know for sure, because the police don't know for sure. No one apparently knows for sure. The only thing they know for sure is that Benjamin Smalls is dead. People do drown in their bathtubs. Yes, I suppose they do. I guess maybe he was old or drunk. She rose, went over to a bureau, opened the drawer and took out a framed photo. This is Benjamin Smalls. He was thirty-five and a teetotaler. Archer looked at the photo that was signed to her and studied Smalls. He was tall, with slicked back dark hair parted on the side. He had a dimple under his chin that must have been annoying to shave. He also had nice comely features and wore a white linen suit with a Panama hat held in one hand. This was actually the second time he had seen a picture of the man. That photo was taken last year, when he won re-election. Maybe he died of a seizure then, or a heart attack. The police could find no evidence of that. Archer pulled out a lucky and lit up, catching the ash in his hand. You seem to think there was more to it. You're a private eye. Maybe you should turn your eye to that. I think I have enough on my plate. She shrugged. Why do you want to know about Armstrong and the Kempers? Something to do with my investigation. Then I would be careful if I were you. Very careful. I'm starting to figure that out. He didn't think she could see the bruises on his face and neck in the dim light, but maybe she had better vision than he was giving her credit for. I might go for a stroll. Is it safe out there at night? Is anywhere safe at night, Mr. Archer? He tipped his hat and left her there with her toddy and her moody introspection. Outside, he headed towards Sawyer Avenue, lighting another cigarette on the way and feeling for the gun in the belt holster. Its presence lifted his spirits considerably. And if he ran into Tony or Hank again, he planned to shoot first and ask not a single question later. There was no one out and about that he could see. All shops were closed at this hour, even the ones that, when open, catered solely to the baser pleasures of its patrons. A sliver of moon crept out from behind the clouds and cast a delicate glow over Baytown. A prowler slowly pulled up to him. He tipped his hat to the officer, who stared suspiciously at him from the passenger seat. Archer tried to remain calm, but his aching body was stiffening all over with anxiety, and for an obvious reason. Could this be about Ruby Fraser? Could they be here to arrest me? Everything okay, Bob? asked the cop, giving Archer a once-over. Yes, sir, officer. Just got into town and couldn't sleep. Thought I'd walk around and get the lay of the land. The cop at the wheel leaned forward so as to be in Archer's line of vision. That wouldn't include casing any joints, would it? But he smiled to show he was kidding. Only the best liquor joints, but that can wait until the sun comes up, he said, grinning back, but his heart beat even harder. They drove off and picked up his pace. He wondered how many cops were up at midnight moods right now. Maybe every one of them besides these two yokels. Crossing Sawyer Avenue, he turned away from the fancy areas of Furs and Tees and Bentleys and headed to the working-class wharf. He wanted to hear the breakers better and smell the salt air with more vigor. He had no idea why. It just did. Maybe it would help him not to think of dead Ruby. 
he reached the wharf after a brisk walk of fifteen minutes, during which he saw not another soul or another car, prowler or not. Baytown was clearly bedded down for the night. He walked along the pier and finally settled on a bench built into the wooden wall there, and which looked directly out to sea. The territory of Hawaii was out there, he knew, thousands of miles away, and beyond that, and more thousands of ocean miles, was Japan, which was still no doubt licking its war wounds after having two atom bombs dropped on it four years ago. Archer was just glad he hadn't had to fight his way to mainland Japan. He'd had enough of war to last him forever. Any man who had seen and done what he had would feel the same way. And if they didn't, there was something wrong with them that nothing could fix except copious amounts of booze. He figured if Prohibition were still in place after the war, America would be no more. They would have rolled up the carpet and headed for Europe, where a man could get a decent shot of booze and a kind word from a woman at any time of the day or night. The breakwater built out parallel to the land was made of enormous boulders, which, like an iceberg, was just the tip of the rock out there. He started staring at the jetty and the moored boats bobbing slightly, and worked through two more cigarettes and half his flask while he listened to the waves leisurely hitting the rocks and let the salt air carve his inside smooth. The moon cast finger shadows over the water. The Pacific was basically flat and calm, the air not moving much, no storm clouds overhead to cause trouble. He might just sit here until sunrise and surprise the longshoremen and fishermen on their way to work. He closed his eyes and let his thoughts wander. A few minutes later he opened them, and his thoughts focused on one thing. It was constant and perfectly replicated, meaning it was mechanical. As he continued to listen and watch, the motorboat came into view. There was a spotlight deployed on its bow, and the light gashed over the water as it tried to discern solids from fluids. As it came more fully into view and passed the breakwater, and started navigating through the minefield of moored boats, he could see that it was about twenty-five feet long, and there were a number of people on board. It veered southward as it approached the pier and ran parallel to it for about two hundred yards until it was well away from the port operations. A minute before this, Archer had taken to his heels and was jogging along in that direction. He reached a spot where he took up position behind a waist-high wall and eyed the boat as it docked at a pier. Two men got off and secured the boat's lines to the dock cleats. Then the bow light was extinguished and more people got off. Archer continued to watch as they walked toward the lot adjacent to where Archer was hidden. He sank lower, turned his head, and saw two vehicles parked there. As the men drew closer to the cars, another automobile came down the wharf road, turned and pulled into the parking lot. Due to the thrust and reach of its headlights, the group from the boat was fully revealed to him. The tall figure of Sawyer Armstrong was prominent among them, as were his two goons, Tony and Hank. And there were three other men that Archer didn't recognize. The car pulled to a stop, but kept on its headlights. Stepping out of the car was another person that Archer did know. Beth Kemper, hurried over to her father, and they held a quick and apparently heated conversation, at least by their body language, because Archer could hear none of it. The brief meeting ended with Armstrong and his group climbing into the two cars and driving off, leaving Kemper alone. Archer saw the dot of flame emerge as the woman lit a cigarette and leaned against her car, which he now recognized as the little Triumph Roadster convertible he'd seen back at the Kemper estate. The woman stared out at the ocean and smoked her cigarette, while Archer continued to watch and contemplated what to do. Part of him wanted to approach her, see what was going on. But his professional instincts, such that he had, told him that would be the wrong move for any number of reasons. If he did that and she told her father that Archer had seen them come in on the boat from God knew where in the middle of the night, Archer figured he would get another visit from Tony and Hank, and it would be his last visit with anyone ever. His final resting place might be the very same ocean Beth Kemper was staring at, with cement shoes encasing his feet as he sank to the bottom to realize his new destiny as plankton. She dropped her finished cigarette and scrunched it flat with the heel of her shoe, then got into her car and drove slowly off. Archer swiftly moved after the convertible. He knew full well there was no way he could really follow her on foot if she sped up and vanished from sight. Fortunately, she didn't go far. 
As Archer trotted along behind, she drove only three blocks before she parked the car at the curb and got out. Two motorcycles, one with a sidecar, were pulled up on the pavement in front. Archer eyed the twenty-four-hour sign of the restaurant as she walked in. He waited for a few minutes and followed. Chapter 36 Archer stood in the doorway of the hole-in-the-wall diner. Its yellow pebbled floors were sticky linoleum, its booths shiny red vinyl, its tabletops slapdash laminate of no memorable design, and its walls painted a seafoam green with the overhead whirly fans moving at the pace of a man with nowhere to go. There was a jukebox, but it was as dark and silent as the night. There were three other customers in the place besides Beth Kemper. All three were around nineteen or twenty, and all were clustered around her booth, apparently giving the lady trouble, while a flustered waitress in her forties hovered nearby, looking uncertain as to what to do. Archer heard one of the young men, tall and pudgy with a crew cut and muscled arms and shoulders showing under his T-shirt, say, Hey, baby, we got some gin back at our place. You need to join us. Good times, sugar doll, good times. His skinny, acneed friend laughed and parroted, Good times, sugar doll. Sure like to see your games without anything on them, said Crewcut. Bet they're a knockout like you. The third man was lean and lanky, had dark greased hair, and wore denim jeans stiff as a two-by-four, scuffed black motorcycle boots, and a brown leather bomber jacket. The fanned-out top half of a switchblade stuck out of his rear pants pocket like a cobra's head. Kemper, for her part, was smoking another cigarette and looking extremely bored. She seemed to perk up when she saw Archer coming. Mrs. Kemper, said Archer, walking over. All of the men turned to eye him, and there wasn't a friendly look in the bunch, which was no surprise, thought Archer. What guy liked his crude lovemaking interrupted? Crewcut said, Hey, bud, we're having a talk with the lady here, so take a powder. Archer drew closer. That's funny. I have a scheduled meeting with the lady. Scram! said Switchblade, transferring an unlit cigarette from between his lips to behind his right ear, as though that movement constituted a plain threat. Archer moved closer while Kemper continued to eye him with interest. Don't make this difficult, boys, he said. Crewcut seemed to take this reference personally, because he shoved Acne aside and said, Who are you calling a boy, Mac? Archer looked around and shrugged. We seem to be the only males here, so I'll leave it to you to figure out. Kemper snorted at that one, which only made Crewcut angrier. You know him? he demanded, wheeling around on Kemper. She smiled benignly and waved her cigarette smoke away from her. Not as much as I'd like to. Confused by this, Crewcut turned and shot Switchblade a glance along with a jerk of the head in Archer's direction that could not have been clearer. Archer sighed. If he had a sawbuck for every time he'd seen that same look communicated in that same clumsy fashion. Switchblade went for his knife, but before he could open the blade, Archer laid him out with a punch so hard it knocked him into the next booth. He lay there, his nose bloody, a tooth wobbly, and his mind crushed into unconsciousness. Crook had screamed profanities and drew a fist back. Archer swept aside the front of his jacket, where the thirty-eight sat prominently. Crook had froze. Archer said, you want to see my credentials now, or wait until after you get booked for harassing this lady and trying to have your buddy knife me? Acne said fearfully, y You're a cop, mister? Archer didn't even bother to look at him. He kept his gaze on Crewcut, with his fist still cocked. In the meantime, unless you want your parents to have to spend their hard-earned money bailing you boys out, grab your friend, throw some cold water on his face, get on your tricycles out there, and beat it. Now! Crewcut and Acne grabbed their knocked-out chum and slid him out the door. About thirty seconds later, Archer heard the bikes fire up. He went to the door and watched them ride off. Switchblade was slumped in the sidecar, as both bikes disappeared into the night with their owner's egos tucked between their legs. The waitress said, Gee, thanks, mister. They've been nothing but trouble all night. No problem. Can I get a cup of joe? Rumbling punks is thirsty work. Coming right up. And it's on the house. She went off to get the coffee, while Archer walked back over to the booth, shaking out his achy hand. Mrs. Kemper, 
he said again. She looked up at him, her expression one of intrigue. Mr. Archer, why don't you join me for our scheduled meeting? He slid into the booth, took off his hat, and set it next to him. That was impressive, and I so like to see a man enjoy his work. He ran his eye over her. She was dressed far more casually than last time. Flared white pants with black buttons on the side, a checkered cotton shirt in blue and gold, a kerchief at her neck, and a fitted dark blue jacket over both. And a pair of gold hoops graced her delicately lovely ears. Surprised to see you here. As I am seeing you. She tapped Ash into the ashtray. I hope you haven't been following me. She said with enough behind it to put Archer on his guard. Following you, he said with feigned incredulity that he hoped was genuine enough to carry away her suspicions. That's your car outside. I recognized it from my visit to your house. If I'd been following you, you would have either seen my headlights, since there are no other cars out there, or heard my car. Did you hear a car behind you? No, I didn't. I walked here from my place over on Porter, asked my landlady for a place to eat. I woke up in the middle of the night all hungry. Turns out she's a night owl. She recommended here. Porter Street. Why didn't you drive? Because I wanted to walk and smoke, and it's not that far. Your trip here was a lot farther. Must be tough navigating those switchbacks in the dark and the fog. He pulled the ashtray closer, lit up, and tapped ash into it as his coffee arrived. It was hot and good. What? No notepad to write down my answers? She said mockingly as the waitress departed. I'm off duty. I didn't come from my home, said Kemper. Really? Where, then? That's no concern of yours. You're right, it's not. I spoke to my father. Have you heard the news? He exhaled smoke and shook his head. What news? There was a murder. Archer furrowed his brow and said sharply, A murder? Where? At Midnight Moods. Hell, I was there last night, meaning about five hours ago. Went there with a friend who was auditioning for a job. Who got killed? Ruby Fraser. Archer let his jaw go slack, and he laid his smoke on the lip of the ashtray before clasping his hands on the table and assuming what he hoped was a judicious look. The Ruby Fraser? Yes, the same one you were asking me about yesterday. How did she die? My father didn't say. When was she killed? She spread her hands and shook her head. Who killed her? He persisted. Apparently no one knows. Where exactly was she found? Archer was asking all the questions he would have asked of someone else if he hadn't known what had happened. I think in her room. How come your father knows all those details? She gazed at his injuries. Come on, Mr. Archer. Don't play me for a dope. You ran into my father there, and your face ran into the fists of two of his thugs. Archer rubbed his bruises. And did he tell you why that happened? He told you to stop bothering me. Let's hope he doesn't walk in the door here, then. I might not get out alive. Don't make jokes like that. Why? Does your old man have a habit of knocking people off? I'm not going to dignify that with an answer. I was surprised to learn he owned Midnight Moods. She gave him a hard look. He owns most of the town, so stop being surprised. Your husband is giving him a run for his money, though. A winery, the fancy-schmancy Mayport Hotel, a country club on the water. He runs a very efficient office. I met Wilma Darling. She could have been a ship's captain two hundred years ago. There never would have been even a hint of mutiny with her at the helm. I don't know why he needs Sheen around with that gal on the job. You know, I've wondered that myself. She took a sip of her coffee and took out a fresh cigarette. Archer pulled out a match, struck it against the side of the table, and leaned over to light her smoke. She lightly cupped his hand while he did so. They moved apart, their gazes averted after the intimacy of the subtle embrace. Archer dropped the spent match into the ashtray and waited. Where is Mr. Dash, by the way? I hope asleep in bed. Why does your husband even want to be mayor? Did you ask him? I'm asking you. Afraid I can't help you there. I haven't asked him either. Could it be your father's doing? In what way? Get your husband into the mayor's office, help out his business interests. I'm not sure my father needs help in that regard. Did you know Benjamin Smalls? Archer asked abruptly. Why do you ask? She said warily. I saw his picture on the table in your library. 
It was signed, To Beth, All My Best Wishes, Ben. It was right next to Jimmy Stewart's mug. I knew Ben, yes. He died about a month ago? That's right. He drowned in his tub. So everyone keeps saying. <laughs> what does that mean? It means that's what everyone keeps saying. You don't believe it? Well, I wasn't there to see it for myself. You don't accept things as facts unless you see them? <laughs> You've got a long road ahead of you. How'd you know him? Ben's father, Andrew, was partners with my father. He's dead now. I thought the Armstrong family had plenty of dough to do what they wanted. Andrew was a state senator and thus very well connected in Sacramento. But he's dead? He killed himself. How? asked the startled archer. They found him hanging in his barn. She dipped her head and wouldn't look at him. She drew down thoughtfully on her cigarette. With Ruby Fraser dead, things get complicated for you, don't they? Archer said, I think they get complicated for a lot of people, you included. Me? What makes you say that? Your hubby was maybe having an affair with her, and maybe you knew about it. That's what they call a prime motive. Have the cops been by to see you? Maybe I have an alibi, or didn't I tell you? How can you have an alibi when no one knows when she was killed? Apparently the police have a time window. I was at a dinner party from five in the evening until after midnight. In fact, I left for it right after you and your colleague finished interrogating me. Not right after, because you changed clothes. You had on a dress before, not pants. I went to the party in my dress. You don't wear an outfit like this to a dinner party. I changed into these clothes afterward. Did your father tell you about the time window? I don't remember who did. And if your father did know, how would he know? He has a direct line to the chief of police. They're old friends. And what's his name? Carl Pickett. If the dinner party ended at midnight, what did you do between leaving there and coming here? I went to a place with the thought of going to bed, and then decided I wanted to get out. I like the coffee here. What place did you go to with the thought of going to bed? It's here in town. I've owned it since before I was married. It's my little hidey hole. Over 99% of all dirty laundry gets lost in them. She puffed on her cigarette. <laughs> what a wonderfully lurid imagination you have. When you were deciding to go to bed, were you alone? Don't get cute. It's not a good look for you. Yeah, I've heard that line before. She stubbed out her smoke in the ashtray. It really was quite masterful how you handled those men. Three against one. I probably could have huffed and puffed and blew them all into the Pacific from here. He tapped out his smoke, too. Does your husband have an alibi for tonight? I don't know. I haven't seen him. Does he have a hidey hole in town, too? I wouldn't know. He cocked his head as he peered at her. Why do you put up with it? They have divorce in California, I take it. It's not as easy as you might imagine. If you can prove he two-timed you, Mrs. Kemper, you can get a divorce. Maybe I like my life how it is. He goes his way, and I go mine. How would divorce change that? If you're okay with it, who am I to judge? But you will anyway. Nah, I'm too busy. Besides, he must have some feelings for you. What makes you say that? She said quickly. Her features tightened, and the look on her face was, at least to Archer's mind, caught between hopeful and hopeless. I saw a bottle of his wine, the BK. Stands for Beth Kemper, right? Her features relaxed, and all the light went out of her eyes. Wrong. It stands for Best Kemper. He studied her closely before saying, Sorry, my mistake. Yes, it is. She rose and looked down at him. Do you need a lift back to where you're staying on dear old Porter Street? Your triumph's not very big, Mrs. Kemper. Things might get pretty tight in there. Make it, Beth. And don't you know? Wonderful things come in small packages.